Hello. I'm Roger and print out for
हेलो हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग सर हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग हाय यस सर ओके My background is missing, but that is okay. No team, no. Just uh, move on. <laughs> Chairs and all. Make it a little. Let that uh, mission open. It's fine. <laughs> and uh, check the chair also. Good. हेलो हेलो एम आई आडिबल हेलो हेलो
Om Sri Manjunath Dainama. Good everyone on behalf of S. Good morning, sir. Of this webinar. Good, good morning, sir. Start. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Just Good morning, sir. Can we begin? Om Sri Manjanada and Amang. A very good morning to everyone on behalf of SBM College of Nashropathy, Yogi, Sci Yogi Sciences Vigere, in association with National Institute of Nashropathy Pune, Ministry of Irish, Government of India. I take this opportunity to welcome all our distinguished guests and participants to this national webinar on yoga for immunity, which is extremely relevant topic of this time in connection with 7th International Day of Yoga. And today we have the privilege to have with us some experts from the field who shall be reflecting on the theme of this webinar. To begin with, keeping with the tradition of our culture, let us virtually invoke the blessings of Almighty. Shambho Girisha. Sura Pujita Kama Bairin Gaurisha Shankara Maheshwara Vishwahe Shambho Girisha Sura Pujita Kama Bairin Gaurisha Shankara Maheshwara Vishwahe Principal of Sweden College of Nashropathy and Yogi Sciences, Ujire, Chief Medical Officer of Shandivana Nachukya Hospital, Dharmastala, Dr. Prashant Shetty, to do the welcome speech. Om Sri Manjunata and Good morning to all of you. Today I am very happy to see you all in this August function. So we have planned for a webinar. Webinar, the topic was yoga for immunity. So why we made this program is, so now 
there are two problems the india is facing because one is covid 19 and covid 19 second wave and third wave somewhere third wave also started so in this condition we want to educate the people of the country about this covid not only covid how yoga is useful in preventing and curing the covid so in that connection we have organized this for our students as well as students of all the naturopathy colleges of the country so in this connection we are very happy today our joint secretary joint secretary our joint secretary ranjit kumar is with us because ranjit kumar you all know he is very important person in the ayush ministry being a joint secretary he has taken lot of step to improve this naturopathy and yoga our students are here more than 600 students are observing this you all know he has visited dharmasthala and our hospital and our all the departments of the college he appreciated all the activities of the college and he has in, um, he has exchanged his knowledge with all of you about two years back at the same time here this time last time also he has enrolled our college for the uh, yoga day in a very good manner so this time also he has given lot of responsibility not only to our college all the colleges of the country more than 52 colleges of naturopathy colleges are participating in international day of yoga so in this connection so he has taken lot of step to improve this and he is going to improve our system to a larger extent i am very happy to see him he has come in time because i don't want to take much of his time because he has only half an hour time now by 10 o'clock he has to leave the this one because you know the international day of yoga organizing he is one of the very important person i don't know don't want to say how much workload he has because we say doctors and yoga therapists are working day and night i have seen ayush ministry officials including our joint secretary they are working totally day and night like 24 hours sometimes they do so in that in this connection i appreciate him and i appreciate his work and uh, i uh, on behalf of all of you and i i am be of our dharmasthala and hdm education society welcome you for this function sir so again our one more guest is there he is not only guest he is our alumni also dr raghavendra rao he has done lot of changes lot of work in the i and this uh, our central council of uh, research in naturopathy and yoga so he is with us always he is helping us in all the research and other matters i am be of all of you i welcome you dr raghavendra and i also welcome our dr shiv prasad dean of our college he has organized this program literally i want to say he has organized this program he has made all the arrangement and all the speakers and i welcome him on behalf of all of you and i welcome all the students of the college because the students of the college i have not seen from last two months because of the covid we have given them holiday examination is also not finished so we are conducting the online classes they are all with us they are and some of the parents also i know they have attended the program so i on behalf of all of you and faculty members and i on behalf of the college management i welcome you and as well as your parents i also welcome all the people who are uh, in directly or indirectly organize this function including the technical support and all that and our faculty members deans i want to welcome them on behalf of all of you thank you one and all thank you sir to make this program a blessed one we have with us today online our distinguished guest pn ranjit kumar ips joint secretary in ministry of ayush vikas who oversees activity verticals like yoga naturopathy information education and communication and information technology in the ayush sector and coordination of international yoga day sri p n ranjit kumar has masters in communication and journalism and btech in electrical engineering and in ministry he handles all the matters relating to yoga including coordination of international yoga day yoga and naturopathy national institutes and research council information education and communication center of excellence and cluster schemes it's a great honor to listen from you sir over to you 
Thank you so much. Um, at the outset, uh, regards and respects to Honorable uh, Hegde, sir. Uh, though he is not part of this function, I'm sure his presence is uh, uh, there in all the activities of SDM College. My good friend uh, Prashantji, the dynamic uh, leader of CCR YN, Dr. Rao, Dr. Shiv Prasad, all other faculty members, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege to be part of uh, any SDM function, more so today because the subject of the day's discussion is something which is very, very relevant in uh, today's uh, context. The way we see it uh, from uh, the health administrator's uh, perspective, or from a public uh, health perspective. Uh, yoga is uh, relevant in uh, today's context as we uh, fight the pandemic and as we are seeing signs of optimism in the second surge receding. Uh, in this context, uh, I, I see uh, the relevance of uh, uh, yoga, uh, the extreme relevance of yoga uh, in, in four uh, uh, in four ways. Uh, firstly, uh, the general uh, health uh, and well being aspect. Uh, I mean, uh, most of us here are from yoga naturopathy background. This does not uh, need any explanation. Uh, nothing can be of uh, more use to the common people uh, for uh, improving general health and well being in today's context than yoga. Uh, the second one is uh, immunity enhancement. Uh, the, the topic of today's discussion itself is that, yoga and immunity. The third one uh, is uh, uh, critical, uh, is more uh, of critical importance today. That is uh, the treatment and recovery of those among us, our near and dear ones and others who were uh, uh, unlucky and uh, were uh, afflicted with COVID. So uh, both uh, in their uh, treatment and in post-treatment recovery, uh, we all know uh, that uh, yoga can play an important uh, role, particularly the, um, the breathing uh, exercises, pranayama, etc. And the fourth, of course, that concerns the vast majority of people who have been uh, leading uh, constricted lives uh, in the last uh, one and a half years uh, uh, with the consequent uh, impact of stress and anxiety affecting them in so many ways. When I look at my own family members, uh, I have two boys, more or less uh, the age of all the youngsters who have joined here. Um, the last uh, one and a half years, they are uh, confined at home uh, attending online classes, uh, missing their friends, uh, uh, you know, missing interactions, missing their evening uh, soccer games. Uh, and I can see how they have become uh, quiet over a period of time. And I feel that uh, this uh, is uh, the trend all over the country. Um, and uh, uh, fortunately, uh, despite their age being uh, what it is, they have taken some interest in yoga and uh, uh, it is uh, kind of uh, helping them through. So these four areas of relevance of yoga in today's context, uh, that is something uh, which uh, uh, we need to place before the public. Because unless we tell them as uh, people of yoga, as uh, people from uh, yoga uh, context, uh, yoga profession, unless we tell the public about these, uh, they may miss an opportunity. So uh, that is very critical. It is, uh, I consider it part of uh, the, uh, some uh, divine responsibility vested with all of us from the yoga sector. Uh, that, way, uh, uh, that way also uh, I compliment uh, the organizers for thinking up uh, uh, about uh, this uh, possibility and uh, further uh, for the way in which it has been uh, organized with such an excellent uh, participation. Uh, the second point I wanted to touch upon is the importance of uh, the digital uh, and virtual media in our lives. Uh, 
over the last one year or so, uh, the digital media has virtually taken over uh, our lives. Uh, it has come as a boon uh, in many ways in, in, in these uh, difficult times. Uh, and uh, it's not very difficult to uh, realize that they are not going to go away. The role of the digital media, uh, it, is, uh, it will remain uh, even after the COVID uh, uh, threat recedes. So uh, it has become part of our life and uh, those who master it, uh, particularly uh, the, uh, the younger generation, those who master the use uh, and the advantages of the digital media, they stand to gain. Uh, so this uh, uh, opting for such a big uh, gathering on the digital medium uh, is uh, timely uh, and uh, it, it will be um, a good uh, um, example and a good way forward for the students uh, who have joined here. Um, sitting in the ministry uh, in these times, uh, the information, uh, ironically, uh, we are getting uh, more information faster than before, uh, thanks to the digital and virtual medium. And uh, we have been watching uh, with uh, uh, a lot of satisfaction uh, and appreciation, uh, the effort uh, which is uh, happening uh, in STM College uh, and uh, the other STM group institutions and uh, other uh, affiliate organizations uh, in the COVID times, particularly after the second uh, surge, uh, under the vision uh, of uh, Honorable Hegede, sir, uh, a massive campaign has been launched, which is kind of uh, taking off for maybe midway. Um, there are many striking things about this campaign and one among them is the large number of volunteers. So this is, uh, uh, in many ways, it is a federated kind of campaign uh, where uh, volunteers, students and uh, young doctors, uh, they are uh, taking the lead and each one of them uh, is uh, going out with the message of yoga to the public. So this is uh, excellent. Uh, this will be uh, like a um, hands-on learning experience for uh, all these uh, budding uh, uh, yoga and naturopathy practitioners. Um, and uh, the, the pandemic, uh, all of us are suffering directly or indirectly through this. But rightly, these young doctors, uh, are, uh, they will be richer in experience uh, once they go through all these efforts. Um, all the yoga uh, mobilization activities which are now taking place, like uh, this one, uh, it is ideal and appropriate they are happening on the eve of uh, the International Day of Yoga. Uh, globally, there is a sense of uh, participation at this time, participation in yoga. So please uh, keep uh, that also in mind while addressing uh, the pandemic related issues and uh, bringing relief to the people. Also do keep uh, the occasion of uh, IDY in mind because it adds momentum. Uh, the IDY, the International Day of Yoga over the last six years, uh, it, is a, uh, it is a time of uh, fraternity. It is a time of coming together. Uh, there is a spirit uh, which comes uh, uh, all by itself around this time. So please use that spirit, uh, that spirit of uh, camaraderie and uh, coming together. Uh, rope that also in, into your uh, service efforts uh, so that uh, along with the push, there is a pull also and uh, the momentum increases. Uh, and it's also important uh, that in these uh, times of gloom, we have positive activities to fill our space. Uh, otherwise, we will all slip into activity crisis. And uh, what better activity can be there uh, other than uh, the International Day of Yoga? So please take this message around. On 7th, uh, on 21st of June at 7 a.m., like in the previous years, this is the Yoga Day drill. Uh, all of us, our families, our friends, their families, and their friends and their families. How can we motivate all of them to come together in this huge global uh, togetherness of 21st June 
and at 7 am how can we do yoga in harmony and how do we do yoga in harmony there is a drill for that that is called common yoga protocol i'm sure all of you are uh, familiar and uh, some of you are even uh, imparting training in that common yoga protocol so uh, let this also be our goal as many people as possible doing yoga in their respective homes in the safety of their homes on 21st june 2021 at 7 a.m based on common yoga thank you so much the central messaging we are sending out is be with yoga be at home Thank you so much, sir, for your presence and message. Certainly a motivation for all of us. On behalf of all gathered here, a heartfelt thanks to you, sir. To give us insight to this extremely promising program, we have with us Chief Coordinator, Dr. Shiva Shetty, Dean Division of Yoga. Over to you, sir. Om Shri Manjunath Dharma, respected uh, and Secretary Minister of Ayush, uh, Shri P. and Ranjit Kumar, Director of CCRYM, Dr. Raghavan Rao, esteemed institution principal, eminent person Dr. Prashant Shetty, and all the faculty members, invitees, and all the students, UG and PG students who joined this uh, national webinar. I'm very happy to introduce this program and following uh, programs immediately after this keynote address 10.45 a.m. to 11.45 Dr. Manjunath N.K. is going to deliver his, his lecture on evidence-based studies on immunity through yoga. Dr. Manjunath N.K. is a pro vice chancellor, post -vice chancellor of SUSI University, Bangalore. 12 a.m. to 12.40 p.m. Dr. Chaya she is consultant microbiologist and infection control officer, Narayana Multi Special Hospital, Mysore. She is going to prepare a lecture on infectious diseases. After the lunch, 2 p.m. to 50 p.m., another lecture by Dr. Chandrasekhar, medical director and consultant, Chandra Rheumatology and Immunology Center, and research Bangalore. His topic is infectious disease and immunity. Followed by 3 p.m. 3 p.m. to 3.50 p.m. Presentation by Dr. Apar Sawaji, School of Yoga and Naturopathy Medicine, Esvasa, Bangalore. The topic is immunity according to yoga philosophy. The last session of today, from 4.15 to 5 p.m., presented by Dr. going to present by Dr. Sapna Bayari, Consultant Yoga Therapist, SCG Cancer Hospital, Bangalore. Topic, role of yoga therapy for immunity. Tomorrow, our session starts at 10.30 a.m. 10.30 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. 11.30 a.m. Dr. Noira Ahmad is a medical scientist and biostatistician, UG Davis Medical Center, California. On topic, yoga is a tool to improve immunity, a Western approach. 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 a.m. tomorrow, Dr. K.S. Kannan, SRJM Chair Professor, IIT Madras, Senior Fellow, ICSSR, New Delhi. The topic is basis of Hatha Yoga and Immunity. From 2 p.m. to 2.40 p.m. tomorrow, a presentation by Dr. Reem Rutharaj. He is a medical director, Sri Shivalaya Holistic Natural Healing Hospital, King A.M. Tamil Nadu. The topic, role of yoga, yogic approach through modern medicine for immunity. The last session, presentation by Dr. Pravin Jokab from 3 p.m. to 3.50 p.m. on the he is adjunct professor, research department case, Academy Medical College, Academy Mangalore. Role of diet for immunity. Followed by elderly section session, chaired by our honorable principal and Dr. the guest of honor, Dr. K. Satyalakshmi, director, National Institute of Naturopathy Pune, Minister of Ayush, Government of India. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Over to you, sir. My dear friends, my dear Dr. Raghavendra Rao, and all the students who have joined here for the webinar today, I am very happy to say that some of the important uh, theme of this webinar. First of all, about the theme, this uh, webinar itself is Yoga for Immunity. So in that naturopathy also included, but we are doing the webinar for uh, mainly Yoga for Immunity. Along with this, speakers, if you see, there are three types of speakers you can see here, right? So why I am saying this is, students should be very, attend, uh, they should be very silent, very committed to hear this webinar. Because three types of speakers you can see. One is purely of this, who are trained in immunology and all the infectious diseases. Two speakers are there, especially meant for the, to teach you how this viral disease is coming, how it is developing, what is the pathophysiology, all that they'll teach. That's very important part. So we kept two speakers on that. So two speakers of our naturopathy background or yoga background. One is our director who is going to speak now. He is the Dr. Raghavendra. So he says specially about the immunology, yoga, naturopathy, all that things. So what is the effect of yoga and naturopathy on the immunology? So second speaker is our Dr. Sapna Bhairi. She is MD in yoga. She will teach yoga how, in what way it is useful on immunity. So that is two things. And other two speakers are speaking about this microbiology. And third group of speakers are speaking about yoga therapy from the traditional background. That is also very important. So in this, and Dr. Rapar is there, he is also speaking about immunity and yoga. So in that, you should find out the answer for infectious diseases through yoga properly. Because that is very important. It's a, um, that is a required thing for the day, right? So everybody will ask about COVID. Everybody ask about the corona disease. How and what way it's acting, nobody knows. So in that case, I am telling all of you, even though you are the students of naturopathy and yoga, you must learn the, the way of way uh, pathogenesis, structure of virus, everything you should know so that you can explain, you can discuss, you can have a conversation with the other systems of medicine. So that's why it's a right thing, right time. You have organized this program and another thing is you are seeing the application also morning you are going for yoga that time how yoga is applicable to all these diseases you are seeing so all together it's a combination of practice theory and the like research i always say the medical education clinical practice and the research all the three kinds of people all the three kinds of people are giving lecture to you so that you should be very fortunate to have this webinar. Take it seriously. I know you are at home. Home means you have more freedom. I say less freedom. Because home, next group of people are sitting is your parents. They will measure you. How seriously principal word is taken. How seriously faculty members word is taken. How serious about you. How serious you are. All these things will be... They are saying, even though they may not say anything, but they will observe you so that they are the best examiner to your life. Because before the BNOS also, they were there with your parents. During the BNOS also, they are here. And after the BNOS also, they are they will be with you. So they, they are the best judges. Even though they may not reveal everything, they will understand the dedication and commitment of you people. So don't miss this. We are accurately recording your presence in the uh, webinar. So all the lecture, this one you should attend. And we are planning to keep on exam also on this because this 
eminent speakers. Just now, Joint Secretary has inaugurated the webinar. He's a great man. I, Dr. Raghavendra knows he will not be available for five minutes also now, because these days, during the yoga day time, so he has come and inaugurated. And Hedeji has sent the message to all of you. Yesterday itself, I met him and I told everything about this. And he has sent a message and blessings to all of you. He is also a little bit worried that you are at the home and your exams is delayed. All of us are worried for the, your exam is delayed. All faculty members are also worried. At least you be with the stream, learn all these things, and it will be useful to you so that whatever the loss has happened by this corona can be compensated in a better manner. I wish you all the best, all the success. And morning yoga also, you should be very thorough because you know, our Joint Secretary also knows how many yoga classes we are taking. So that all the students are in this seminar. I'm telling you sincerely, we should do the work properly so that ministry also observing our work and they may give the more importance to yoga and naturopaths in the country so that yoga prevails, yoga will go to the heights, naturopathy will also go to the heights. So all the best, all the success and over to Dr. Raghavendra. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. We are today we are proud to announce that a keynote address is by Dr. Raghavendra Rao, Director of Central Council for Research in Yoga and Naturopathy, Ministry of Irish Government of India. He is proud alumni of our college and joined SVSA as a research fellow in 1998. He has completed several research projects in rheumatoid arthritis, pre-diabetes, diabetes, CVD risk prevention using yoga and naturopathy intervention at Swami Vivekananda Yoga University, MS Ramayya Hospital, and SCG Bangalore Institute of Oncology. He was a collaborator and OSHA PICRC NIH Fellow at UCSF School of Medicine, San Francisco. He completed his PhD and has 89 international research publications and one international book chapter. He is a member of Irish Research Portal and has several awards such as Sushila Thakur Pragati Mandir Prize in 2001 by APPICON, Manmoni Dreya Award from Yasvyasa for Best Thesis and ASCO Conquer Cancer Foundation Merit Award in 2012. He has conducted workshops in Melbourne and Malaysia in UICC Congress. He has set up a department of CAM at Healthcare Global Enterprises, which is associated by European Society for Integrative Oncology. Dr. Raghavendra Rao is a qualified NABH assessor and has experience in conducting global clinical trials. And today, we are privileged to have Dr. Raghavendra Rao for keynote address. Over to you, sir. Um, I'm privileged to be in this August gathering. And I thank Dr. Prashant Shetty for having me here as a keynote speaker in this function. Respected Sri P. N. Ranjit Kumar Ji, Namaskar. And Dr. P. Prashant Shetty Ji, who is the Dean of SDM College, my BNMS faculty, and as well as my BNMS students and fellow colleagues. I take the privilege to share my views on the role of yoga in COVID-19. So as you are aware, TCRN has been working on doing randomized control trials as well as doing several surveys which when SDM College is also a part of to look at what is the perceptions of people on COVID and how using yoga approaches or can help in changing their behavior, changing the perception against COVID as well as how does it can, how does it improve the quality of life, reduce their anxiety and distress. So here I just share my presentation with all of you today uh, regarding this uh, COVID. Uh, I hope my presentation is visible, right? Yes, sir. Thank you. So uh, today we just want to talk and share my views about the studies going on uh, at major hospitals in Delhi. Uh, this is a multi-centric randomized control trial on role of yoga and COVID. 
happening in Rajiv Gandhi Super Speciality Hospital, Sharjah in New Delhi, Ames Jajjar NCI in Jajjar, Lady Hardinge Medical College in Delhi, Ames Delhi, as well as in Ames Rishikesh. So uh, before I go into this randomized control trial, I need to tell you a brief of COVID, and all of you know what COVID is all about. 80% of the patients with COVID-19 uh, COVID are have very, very mild symptoms or they are asymptomatic and they have to be in home isolation when they are diagnosed to be COVID-19 positive. Okay, only about 20% of these patients go into developing a severe kind of COVID, a moderate disease of COVID where the oxygen, oxygen saturation slightly dips below 93% and these people require hospitalization. Among these also, there are very few of them what 15% um, of them, 10 to 15% of them who need to go to a ICU, receive oxygen support, as well as to be on ventilator as well. Okay, and a few 1.5 to 2% of them have mortality rates in case of COVID. This is called as the iceberg concept of infection. In the sense, what is known in the surface is very little. What is deep down, we don't know. Because we really don't know how many of them are asymptomatic, how many of them are positive with COVID, and uh, they are, so because they are asymptomatic, they probably may not have been tested also. So they are under the so under this iceberg. And this this is a very important aspect of uh, COVID-19 because these are the people who can really spread the infections far and wide. It's difficult to trace, difficult to track, and difficult to treat as well. Okay? So this has been the biggest problem. That's the reason why the pandemic is just going way, wave after wave and causing havoc. So we know what are the symptoms of COVID. We have fever, we have loss of appetite, we have fatigue, loss of smell, loss of taste, shortness of breath, cough, coughing sputum, aches and pains, body, etc. Apart from this, there are other uh, severe forms of COVID where you have persistent chest pain, decrease in blood cell count, liver, liver failure, kidney failure, high fever, coughing of blood, hemoptysis, and cyanotic uh, conditions, and uh, dementia, difficulty, uh, in concentration and uh, confusion, a state of delirium, etc., can also set in severe forms of COVID. Now, all these are caused due to hypoxia, due to low oxygen saturation, cause of the lung involvement, wherein major part of the lung is affected because of the pneumonic condition. Now, very important to understand is when this pandemic was surfacing in last March, April 2020, a lot of myths regarding COVID. People did not know exactly how this COVID was spreading. There were very, a lot of myths regarding how the is caused, how the COVID virus is transmitted, and how the COVID virus needs to be managed. There are a lot of theories, a lot of hypotheses, a lot of advertisements on COVID, a lot of harp on word immunity as well. So this is what you see about myths about COVID, which was listed in the WHO website in April 2020. About 15 myths of COVID. Uh, this, these are, this is a survey which we did along with the SDM College of National and New Geek Sciences and uh, several other organizations. And I'll, I'll be happy to present the results of this particular survey, which is going to be communicated in a journal very, very shortly. So one of the things is breath holding for 10 seconds or more frees you from getting coronavirus. So you must have seen some of the Godman also advocating this. You hold the breath for longer time, do not get COVID. And coronavirus affects people of all ages. So many of them believe that it only affects the elderly and not the people of all ages. Coronavirus is transmitted during all climates. People believe it is transmitted in the cold conditions and not in temperate conditions like summer vacation, summer, summer times. Drinking alcohol prevents COVID. Exposure to warm temperature greater than 21 degrees kills coronavirus. That's the reason why people used to dry all the rations, dry the groceries in the sunlight for about half an hour to one hour so that it's intention that it's going to kill the coronavirus. Eating garlic prevents corona infection. Improving immunity prevents corona infection. Saline rinse prevents corona infection. Spraying alcohol and chlorine all over the body prevents corona infection. Taking a hot bath prevents coronavirus. Vaccines against, so these people used to come back from outside. Whenever they used to venture outside and come back to the home, they used to steadily go to the bathroom, take the hot bath and shower with the intention that water corona is sticking on the body would go away. Okay. Vaccines against pneumonia protect against coronavirus. You can recover from coronavirus. Hand dryers are effective in killing coronavirus. You can get coronavirus from mosquito bites. Antibiotics prevent and cure corona infection. These are some of the myths that are there in the community. It was listed in April 2020. There were 15 of them in April 2020. Today, there are 44 of them 
including that people say that 5G can also cause uh, the boom of coronavirus infections or the pandemic of coronavirus infections across the country. Okay, so let us just look at the data which we collected. We collected the data by using uh, a, a, a small questionnaire, a dashboard, which was sent to all the respondents using WhatsApp, and about 4,002 respondents were uh, uh, analyzed right from April 2020 to April 2021. So about one year of the data was collected here during this period. Uh, in the first half of the six months, we analyzed the data. Second half, six, second six months also, we analyzed the data. What we saw here was most of them are educated here. We also had Ayush doctors. We also had allopathy doctors complained in the forms. We had professionals. We have self-employed people. We had people who in the service. Okay, we had a lot of students who also filled this uh, forms. We had yoga teachers who filled these forms. And majority of these were from the rural areas, and 35% uh, of them were from the urban areas. This is the total distribution of the population which was studied for this particular survey. And what we saw here was among all the questions for there, okay, 6.84 was the mid score, mean mid score in the first half, in April 2020 to September 2020, and 7.37 was the mid score after. October 2020 to April 2021, and this was very significant in the sense the myths uh, increase over time between April 2020 to April 2021. Okay, along with the pandemic, pandemic you can also see the myths also increasing over time. So what are the percentage of the myths? Starting with 93.60 percentage initially, it started hovering around 199, 99 percentage, and it's up, up to 97 percent in April 2021. Okay, so you can see that. 90% of the population, more than 95% of the population have myths about COVID. So most of these, most of them got these answers wrong, or there were many of them could not get 15 out of 15 correct. About only 35, 35 of those people got 15 out of 15 correct among 4,002 respondents. So it shows the amount of myths prevalent in the community across all strata. What we also saw was also during the same time, we did a lot of work with Google Analytics. So we looked at these are the keywords for use COVID cures, coronavirus cure, cure for COVID, cure for coronavirus, boosting immunity, immunity enhancers, improving immunity, myths about COVID, and myths about coronavirus. These keywords were done, uh, Google Analytics, Google Analytics were done, and month on month, new articles appearing in Google search engine were taken note of. And what we saw was interesting in the last one year, we saw a steady increase in the number of uh, these articles with these particular keywords. And we use these particular keywords right from April 2020 to April 2021. It was almost increased by almost threefold in April 2021. So this was very, very interesting for us to see that trend for the article or these searches at Google also was increasing. Shows that people are also getting influenced by the digital media, the digital platforms, because we are now living in a digital world. And people are looking for these kind of items in the Google search engine. So this is what we also wanted to see. And we did a correlation of these Google search engine results with average number of uh, articles which are, uh, which are seen per day versus the percent of myths seen for the months, each month, uh, till April 2021. And what we saw was more number of articles, the more amount of myths were also being seen. So this is a direct correlation between the articles or search engine articles appearing on Google search engine, as well as the amount of myths you see month on month in the community as well. This is a very, very interesting observation we saw, and it was a correlation coefficient was 0.7 and a very, very significant as well. Okay. So these were the collaborators, and we are now uh, submitting this particular findings to a very uh, important journal. So SDM College also was involved in the study, Ames Delhi, MSR Arogyalem, Riven Park, and Enigma. So a lot of people were involved in this particular uh, successful completion of this particular survey, and it's a very, very interesting survey, and interesting observations came out of this. And uh, we are going to be continuing this survey for next one year with more number of items because we also want to find out what other myths are prevalent in the Indian community. Okay, there are now myths like clapping hands is going to ward off the coronavirus. Okay, so a lot of other things are there. 5G is going to ward off coronavirus, and uh, uh, applying cow dung on your body or drinking cow urine is going to ward off coronavirus. So the what not? So a lot of cures are there, proph prophecies are there on what can be used for taking care of coronavirus. So we need to understand them very clearly and understand why people are taking resort to these kind of cures or these kind of prophecies. Okay. So very important before I go into study on yoga for COVID, we need to understand 
how does why you why do you, why yoga can play a very, very important role in COVID-19 infections? So this is because we know very, very clearly that stress can exacerbate flu or influenza. This is a very, very important statement, which is there. It's based on a very important study done by uh, Cohen Septum. It was published in New England Journal of Medicine, very controlled study wherein they inoculated, they gave a nasal spray of respiratory syncytial virus and coronavirus, not the SARS-CoV-2, a different strain of coronavirus to cause an influenza-like symptom or an acute respiratory illness, okay? And they observed in people with life events, stressful life events, as well as perceived stress, of course, and they saw that those who had high amount of stress, their infection rates increased from 74 to 94%, okay? And those clinical colds also increased from 24 to 47 percent and there was a definitive dose response relationship with the kind of stressor they had with the rate of severity of infection and they also saw how it was uh, happening was they saw that there was a decrease in salivary secretory iga levels which is very, very important for mucosal immunity or mucosal defenses increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines and increase in inflammatory mediators so this is a very important study which is done in a controlled environment okay wherein they really inoculated the patients which Inoculated normal population with viruses and saw the role of stress in causing cold symptoms or exacerbation of cold symptoms. Okay, and this is very very important. So this is a very good platform for us to say that stress can also augment or increase infection rates in normal healthy individuals. Now we look at disease demography. So we are living in this area era of non-communicable diseases to have obesity. You have PCOS, you have cancer, autoimmune arthritis, musculoskeletal problems, you have rest imbalance, cardiovascular diseases, and behavioral diseases. All these are all supposed to be caused by physical inactivity, hypernutrition, and stress. Okay. And all this, in all this, mind has got a very, very important role to play. But what about infections? Here, too, they say very, very important thing is if people are physically inactive, people have poor nutrition, people are stressful they can succumb to infections as well. So this can also, gives, this, this also gives us an opportunity for us to use yoga intervention in infections, especially in respiratory infections. Now, if you look at the role, the role of yoga in infections, there's a very, very landmark study which was, uh, produced, which was uh, published in 2018 by Wisconsin University, where it was done by Barrett uh, colleagues, Barrett et al. Uh, and where they showed eight uh, weeks of meditation versus exercise, and they looked at how it, uh, exercise versus meditation helped in controlling Okay, so this is uh, basically during endemic endemic flu season in uh, North America, especially in US, especially in New York, uh, near Wisconsin area. And what they did was they uh, gave one group exercise, one group meditation, other group just left without giving any of them. And they wanted to look at uh, global severity of infection scores, due respiratory illness. They want to look at duration of the infection in this population if they received any acute respiratory illness during the endemic season and they saw that the global severity came down the duration of infections also came down significantly in both exercise as well as the meditation groups compared to controls this is one of the first observational study prospective observational study where they showed that exercise or meditation can both help in reducing the severity of infection or reducing duration of infection now there is a cochrane review for yoga especially in asthma why i'm looking at asthma is we know always that asthma is a reversible airway obstruction and respiratory syncytial virus, influenza-like viruses play a very, very important role in asthma exacerbation. And what we saw here was, you can see here, uh, yoga breathing alone versus control. How it is known to improve, you have a very important impact on quality of life. So there was improvement in quality of life in especially in asthmatic patients using yoga intuition. This is a Cochrane review published uh, in uh, 2013. So what we need to do in COVID-19. So what is very, very important? One is improving mucosal defenses or mucosal immunity. Okay. There are studies which say that yoga helps in improving salivary beta defensing molecule. And this is a very, very important complement which binds against the virus and neutralizes the virus. It also, the second one part is to improve viral clearance. As soon as you have viral infection, the virus starts proliferating intracellular inside the body, inside the cells and they start uh, infecting uh, the local tissues and cells. And as they start doing it, the only way the virus can be removed from the body once it goes intracellular is production of immunoglobulins. And these are very, very important. 
third thing is along with immunoglobulins, you need to also reduce the area reactivity because IgE is also there, eosinophils are also there, and these things can cause histamine like uh, can cause local inflammatory local reactions, reactions or, or increase uh, cellular immunity, we can say, and this can cause local tissue damage as well, is also responsible for pneumonia. And we need to improve the immune responses since there is a stage of immune response, cell mineral immunity and humoral immunity. If the cell mineral immunity is prolonged, it can lead to tissue damage, it can lead to pneumonia, it can lead to worsening of cell. But what we need to do is to reduce the cell mineral immunity, enhance the onset of full immunity as early as possible so the virus gets cleared and the damage is minimized. This is a very important concept of infection and immunity. Okay. So what is important again here is reduce oxidative stress because virus mainly causes cell damage through oxidative stress. And these are some of the important areas which we need to do, concentrate on, especially in COVID-19. So what can be used here? We have nitricria, saline rinsing, or nasal irrigation to improve mucosal immunity, pranayama to improve lung functions and bring out relaxation response, asanas to improve lung capacity, tidal volume, force respiratory vital capacity, relaxation to reduce stress, diet and good nutrition to have moderate immune response, ginger, tulsi, turmeric, cinnamon, etc., which are anti-inflammatory properties. So all these can also play a very important role as home remedies population. This may be very, very beneficial, especially in those with mild asymptomatic, mild or those with moderate disease as well. So we know what is the physiology of yoga today. It can bring both neuroendocrine balance, it can bring immune modulation, it can also bring about better flexibility and stability. It can also modulate the cardiac autonomic function as well in terms of heart rate variability. Now we we'll look for what you can use, what kind of yoga to be used in uh, COVID-19 patients. So we know very clearly that yoga is a mindfulness practice. It improves lung function, moderates hypersensitive reactions, reduces stress and anxiety. It is not level to evidence in case of severe seasonal flu, asthma, and COPD. It reduces upper respiratory tract symptoms and is very good for doing this. And these are all present in a COVID-19 infection, and these are some of the modules which can be used. Very short ones, some important asanas, any two of those asanas can be chosen. Breathing exercises are very, very important, and especially yogic breathing. Kapalabhati is very, very important, especially 40 to 80 strokes per minute, not too much. Pranayama, Nadi Shodhana, Brahmani Pranayama is important. And Shashanka Asana breathing, Makhara Asana breathing, these are also similar to that of proning, and these are also very, very important in COVID 19. So we'll come to the study now the effect of integrated yoga program on stress, mood states sleep quality, symptom severity, and quality of life, and clinical outcomes in COVID-19 positive patients undergoing conventional treatment. Multicentric randomized control trial is still on, ongoing, but we have finished the phase one data of a pilot study from Rajiv Gandhi Super Speciality Hospital. So these are the participating centers you see in um, uh, Delhi. The first of the uh, objectives was to evaluate the efficacy of integrated yoga program in reducing severity of ARI. This is the primary outcome measure, psychological distress, anxiety, stress, and mood changes in COVID-19 positive patients undergoing treatment. Evaluate the bivariate relationship between relaxation and response was measured using heart rate variability and outcome variables such as mood states, quality of life, psychological distress, sleep quality, and severity of ARI. Okay. So this is a sample size of study population. We needed to have 86 COVID-19 positive patients undergoing conventional treatment in each arm, the pilot cohort study, which is started with it. With. And for multicentric study, we increased the power of the study and we required 151 COVID-19 positive patients undergoing treatment in each arm. This study is still underway. Okay. So this is a parallel to a randomized control trial and uh, done by using opaque envelope with group assignments. One second. So this is the selection criteria. Um, this is the COVID-19 positive cases diagnosed using RT-PCR in any authorized COVID-19 testing facility. Those with mild clinical presentation, national learning warning score news around two, mild zero to four, severe five to six, presenting with or without flu, symptoms, age 80 to 16, 18 to 60 years, high school education, written consent to participate, and should have had a smartphone or a mobile. Okay, smartphone, mobile device with iOS, Android, or iOS operating system because we are, we have to give them yoga modules for them to practice, as well as we wanted to use that in our dosing monitoring as well. Okay, exclusion criteria was severe infection, unable to take oral medication, 
immunocompromised platin clear clearance less than 30 mL ml per minute alt sdot sgpt greater than 3 to 5 times the normal upper limit of the normal uncontrolled diabetes hypertension existing heart disease heart failure any cancer autoimmune disease any neuro, neuro stroke or neurodegenerative diseases because as you know even this no compromised patients do get covid related infections clinical conditions that reduce survival to less than 6 months pregnancy lactating mothers lactating mothers those with uh, sensitive of septicemia multi organ dysfunction etc and score less than 24 points on a post minimal state examination okay control patients receive standard care especially covid 19 care center experimental group received add on yoga interventions in the covid 19 facility uh, along with the conventional uh, treatment escort care hospital so these are the modules we are supposed to practice twice a day we had instructors going into the covid wards giving the yoga intervention morning as well as in the evening and this was the 25 minute yoga module done for all these patients in the covid wards okay this is the primary outcome was using the wrs wisconsin upper respiratory symptom survey a 24 item version diluted area under the curve for the reduction or resolution of symptoms and the second uh, endpoints clinical endpoints for time to discharge recovery icu admissions and deaths will be considered events but we do not take up discharge as a criteria because in most of the hospitals because of the hospital overload increased patient overload patients were discharged if they did not have severe symptoms so that was not taken as an endpoint in the study okay these are other questions which were used positive stress scale positive negative effect schedule hamilton rating scale for anxiety Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh sleep quality index and mindful, uh, mindful awareness and attention scale. Okay, so we used a non contact sensor called Dozy to measure heart rate variability, to measure sleep, to measure pulse oximetry using a pulse oximeter. And uh, this was the kind of a dashboard which used to come for each patient. We used to monitor the patient's uh, sleep. So we used to look at recovery level after sleep. On the left side, you can see the recovery after sleep. What's happening? Is he recovering? Is he having a good Relaxation response is having a good sleep. Quality of sleep was recorded using this. We also looked at time to go to sleep. The yellow line indicates that patient was awake for 11 minutes. Took long time for him to go to sleep, and uh, it tells you number of awakenings during sleep, the duration of REM sleep, duration of deep sleep, and the total quality of sleep as well. Okay, so this was done on baseline day seven and day 14. So 10 minutes of recording is a pipe test. Okay, this is how you can see here a patient. Lying down, recording the heart rate variability using the dosage sensor under the mattress, and uh, this is happening here for the patient. And these are the yoga classes happening here. So you can see the dosage recording. You can see the yoga classes happening here for these patients. So this is done by the yoga therapist who is going to the wards and teach this for the patients. This is the dosage sensor which is being used for recording of this one. And this is the kind of sleep score you get for each patient, duration of sleep. And the quality of sleep, which you can get. And this is the mobile app which we had to develop the yoga model, which was used for patients to practice in case they would not practice with the instructor. Okay. So we also had them to rate the look at the session feedback of each session, what was happening. The quality of the intervention was also uh, mapped here. It, 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 it used to tell us if the stress came down by how much points, heart rate fell by how many points, respiration rate, how much, how many points it came down by. So each session is to be able to monitor this one as well. So what we saw here was overall patients with COVID-19 day zero and day six assessments. We saw a change in we did not see much change in the respiratory rate and the heart rate. It was breath rate which was 20 initially. Tachy apnea was there. It was came down to 19 plus or minus 4.59. It's a trying yoga group plus or minus 3.1 in the control group. And you can see with respect to the heart rate, not much change here in the heart rate in patients. But what we saw was interesting was the changes in the, uh, especially the low LHL which are frequency with the measure of stress response. So what we saw here was if LHHF is more is towards two, it indicates better amount of relaxation. What we saw here is a better increase in the yoga group. The blue one is the yoga group increase in the LHHF uh, uh, frequency. Uh, Yoga group compared to that of controls, indicating improved sympathovagal balance. We also looked at SGN and RMSSD, which are measures of uh, sympathetic parasympathetic activity here, especially SGN. And we saw that improvement in SGN scores in the yoga group, indicating a better relaxation response compared to controls. The control group, in fact, the SGN levels came down 
lower parasympathetic activity was there, increased sympathetic outflow was there in the control group. And the same thing you can see here with RMSSD is also a measure of parasympathetic response. We saw an improvement in the uh, parasympathetic outflow as well as in the yoga group compared to control. So this was significant. Very important observation we saw here was on oxygen saturation. You see the mean in the yoga group, mean oxygen SpO2 was on 95.58 and post it was 97.1. Okay. Uh, control group was 97 and came down to 96. So what we saw here was in this patients who did yoga, only 4.2% in the yoga group required oxygenation, oxygen supplementation during the stay in the hospital, whereas 14.7% required oxygen uh, supplementation uh, following desaturation during the stay in the hospital, indicating a 10-point difference in the uh, change in SpO2, and this is also very significant. Okay. Uh, we also did another single arm study where we looked at one week uh, pre-post interventions before even doing this cohort study, saw a decrease in stress, decrease in symptoms in these patients. We also did a sleep latency, and we also saw improved sleep in these uh, uh, patients compared to controls. And um, this uh, we also saw the reduction in anxiety, reduction in symptoms in heart rate variability, improvement in heart rate variability and LFHF ratio. And uh, this we also did uh, this small study where subset we are trying to analyze SPO2 change following different yogic techniques. Uh, when we saw was Yogic breathing one is to one had an improvement in SpO2 levels. Okay, we saw session kasana breathing had an improvement in SpO2 levels. Chair breathing, leaning forwards and doing it also had an improvement in SpO2 levels. And Sulubha Matsyasana as well. And this study is still ongoing. We are looking at this aspect as well. And uh, uh, we also looked at this is the conclusion of the study. And this is the kind of dashboard you get using Dozy here. And this is what you see for each patient, what time they went to bed. Okay. So what time they went to bed? Sorry, what time they went to bed, and um, uh, time they went to bed, and what time they got up, and what is the recovery of sleep? What is the total sleep score based on these parameters? Vital sleep routine, sleep quality, restfulness, and this tells you how much time it took to to be aware, how much time they took to go to sleep. What is the number of episodes of interference in their sleep? So this also tells you number of awakenings during the sleep time. Okay, it tells you how much of deep sleep, how much of light sleep, how much of RMs and non RMs they have as well. And during the whole sleep, it tells you the recovery period. It tells you about your stress levels, it tells about your LFHF, RMSSD, et cetera, during the sleep. This is what it is. These are some of the trials which are going on in, in uh, uh, CCRYN. And uh, we also did another study which we are also doing is uh, with Dozy is on looking at breath rate variability. Now, you can see here when you start marking up the SpO2 levels of these patients during sleep. Also know that in uh, patients with COVID-19, they also have apnea episodes because of low oxygen, oxygen saturation, apnea, hyperapnea apnea episodes. And we did 116 sleep recordings of COVID. Uh, any, any sleep recordings of COVID were compared with 116 sleep recordings of normal controls. Uh, and what we saw here is in COVID-19 patient, the breath rate variability is completely erratic. Okay, so it is highly variable. And whereas you see in normal person, the breath rate variability is almost normal and breathing is almost coherent. Okay. And we also now finding out cutoff goal scores for and confidence intervals for patients which can deteriorate based on the pressure variability as a indicator. And this study is ongoing. So thank you with, uh, for the attention. And this is a small preliminary uh, window into what CCRN is doing in respect to COVID-19 uh, disease. And we expect to get more publications now. We already started to work on the manuscripts and publications. And probably we'll have a good number of publications on COVID-19 in the months to come. Thank you so much for the patient hearing. Thank you, sir. You are just a long way in inspiring us to strive hard and achievements. Thank you so much, sir. I'll be happy to take any questions anybody has. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions from the participants? Hello, sir. Yes. As, as, as we are seeing that COVID-19 virus is a patented virus and its patent number is available on the internet. 
do you think it is a man made calamity uh there is lot of theories about the wuhan lab leak and uh, there are also binding signatures to that effect especially in the spike protein domain so in the treatment of the virus and the finding that this a uh, virus the amino acids in the virus are rearranged to make it more virulent so we don't know still the investigation is yet to be over so let us wait for it but sir patent number is available and the names the inventors are also there in the google if you if you google there are you so two things find. here one is identifying a strain of the virus and second one is artificially synthesizing the virus so once you know the sequence genomic sequence of any virus you can artificially synthesize that particular genomic sequence in the lab as well now sir one thing is a, a vaccine takes usually 7 to 8 years to develop as the patent and the sequencing is known to us the vaccination process was quite easy for us do you think so yes yes no doubt so, so the now the technology is the technology has grown uh, to a very great extent and there are different ways of producing vaccines now with all of recombinant technology and uh, gene therapy etc coming into the fore and uh, it is easy to is just uh, about one or two years you, you saw here you saw for yourself it's in a matter of one one to two years you already have more than about 12 to 20 or 12 to 20 vaccines down the pipeline so sir if a vaccine has a efficiency rate of 73% so naturally it means that out of 100 people 73 people will be okay and 27 per, uh, people will have some adverse effect of the vaccine so how yes. can adverse effect be it is not adverse effect it be 73% efficacy means 73% of them produce antibodies by using the vaccine 27% do not develop those antibodies in good concentration since the vaccine fails to provide it will confer passive immunity in this population it is not about adverse events uh thank you for your questions uh, sri ajit gupta are you uh, you are from which background i am an mca and we psychology at this home master okay. in psychology okay okay thank you thank you and there is one uh, question on the chat box uh, are there any studies going on in a covid icu care support can we give passive yoga for them so here uh, there are a lot of challenges in icu because patients are on ventilators okay so there are two aspects of this those who are on intubated who are intubated and who are on invasive ventilation and there's intubation done tracheostomy done no room for yoga to play except for some relaxation techniques you want to give them give them audio ask them to hear audio that's it but those who are on non invasive ventilation where tracheostomy is not done they are on a bipap machine these people can do makarasana breathing if it is possible or shashankasana breathing if it is possible but again we need to see if the bipap machine has to be removed they have to be on oxygen for doing that okay only if they are in that kind of a state can they do that otherwise that's also not possible so we have been doing it in icu especially names uh, nci Uh, patients who are on oxygen therapy, especially on those who are on ventilator, also, we, who are uh, on ventilator, we replace them with oxygen and start with giving them shashankasana breathing exercises as well as makarasana breathing as well. And a lot of work is going on in ICU as well by physiotherapists. uh because of the pneumonia because of pleural effusion and because of thick mucus secretions uh they use a vibrator massage they use a vibrator and they use vibrator on the chest and the back to dislodge the secretions and mucus thick mucus secretions from your lung and uh, these are very very helpful so in fact what we can do is giving steam to these patients approach do the vibrator massage on the on the lungs especially and our people who are yoga people who are going there to icu are doing this okay and the discharge secretions from the uh, respiratory tract and it will helps it gives them a lot of relief and oxygen saturation immediately improves in these patients thank you sir thank you so much thank you a new way of learning different approaches and methodologies to strengthen professional development now let us begin with our sessions to introduce our first speaker i request dr sujada dinesh 
natural therapeutics to come online. Good morning. I am honored to introduce Dr. Nandi Krishnamurti Manjuna, who is a pro vice chancellor, Swami Vivekananda Yoga Nusandana University, that is Yasriyasa deemed to be university in Bangalore. He is Director of Research, Research Development and International Affairs of Yasriyasa University. He is a proud alumni of SM College of Naturopathy and Yogic Sciences. Pursued his PhD from Yasriyasa and later in 2018, he was awarded with Doctor of Science in the field of yoga for his unique contributions towards yoga. He served as an administrative faculty in Yasvasa and outside. To mention few, he is Vice President of Asian Yoga Therapy Association, Singapore, Board of Directors, Indo-US Health Initiatives, Boston, USA, Board of Director in the Joint Venture of Yasvasa with the New York, London, etc. He is initiative for healthcare, academic and research establishment and collaborations in India and abroad. He authored more than 70 research articles which are published in index journals, which are in our, you know, fair reviewed journals and also authored chapters in many of the scientific books. He is a well-known orator and had given many of the keynote addresses and was invited as an invited speaker in many of the conferences in USA, Italy, Sri Lanka, South Korea, China, etc. He is a member of the Association of Psychophysiological Research Medicine, Wisconsin, USA. He is a member of the Association of Physiologists and Pharmacologists of India, Indian Science Congress Association, Indian Association of Biomedical Scientists, Third World Academy of Sciences, Italy, Indian Naturopathy and Yoga Graduates Medical Association, etc. I know that this introduction is very less for him and he is much more than mentioned. With this small introduction, I request Dr. Manjunath N.K. to take over. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sujata. Uh, in fact, it was uh, quite an elaborate introduction what you have given. Uh, probably just a word would have been sufficient. Uh, Dr. Manjunath, uh, who is coming from S SDM College of Naturopathy and Yogic Sciences, I am the very proud alumni of SDM College. And uh, greetings to Dr. Prashant Shetty, who is uh, uh, the leading force behind uh, SDM College on one side and uh, Yoga and Naturopathy on the other side. Uh, thanks to my dear friend, uh, Dr. Shiva Prasad Shetty, and of course, for the wonderful introduction uh, to Dr. Sujata and uh, my dear friends. <clears throat> it's a uh, wonderful theme what has been picked for uh, today and tomorrow's uh, discussions are uh, talking about immunity. Of course, uh, there are many experts who are going to come and talk about immunity. Uh, how you can use various interventions like yoga, naturopathy, uh, etc. And how you can bring in lifestyle modification and uh, its impact at a cellular level will be discussed. Uh, today for uh, uh, the <coughs> discussion purpose, I have uh, picked two topics. I'll be just sharing my slides for you. Hope my slides are visible to you all. Yes, sir, it's visible. Thank you, thank you very much.
Okay, I mean, I, when I was asked to talk, uh, then I was thinking, uh, uh, what should be uh, the topic which can really uh, contribute something? Then I thought uh, the simplest uh, idea would be to talk about how yoga can improve the power within. Okay, so if, uh, if others can be muted, I think it will be nice. Uh, so be there. Thank you. So we have uh, lots of uh, earlier uh, evidence on one side and uh, amazing traditional knowledge on the other side to suggest that yoga in particular and yoga and naturopathy together uh, have uh, something very strong uh, to support the human body to actually fight any such uh, <clears throat> external agent which is going to affect us. So empowering the power within is uh, something what we generally talk about uh, for yoga and naturopathy, but uh, you can pick lots and lots of clues from uh, the understanding of uh, yoga in particular. So uh, for today's uh, discussion, I have two parts. One is uh, first I'm going to just uh, touch upon uh, uh, the general uh, concept of uh, immunity and how yoga is beneficial. Dr. Raghavendra Rao has already detailed a lot. I'm going to skip some of that and uh, its uh, uh, role and importance during this COVID-19 pandemic. And second part will be on autoimmunity, where I'll be bringing a concept from yogic uh, uh, text called Vipareya, which has been really uh, uh, thought provoking for us to think how we can use these uh, ideas for further uh, expansion. Today, we are all very much aware that uh, uh, for the first time, we started realizing that uh, we have to be dependent on something called a breath. Okay, so particularly when people had difficulties in managing their breathing and they start uh, seeing that their oxygen saturations are going down, then people started realizing that even air has less oxygen. Actually, the issue was not in the air, the issue was within. So that's when we realize that every breath is a gift to us. So finally, how well we manage, how well we utilize that breath is uh, left to us. So during uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, breathing and in particular, how you can regulate your breathing and how you can bring various components of it uh, has played an extraordinary role. So uh, this uh, need not be worried now because the numbers have been changing uh, dynamically and uh, India, the second wave has really affected very strongly to India and USA is still leading uh, on this whole journey. But what I am interested is to say these are three mechanisms. One is uh, uh, Dr. Raghavendra might have spoken about uh, these. One is about the cytokine storm, another is uh, uh, pneumonia, another is hypercoagulability. So what uh, we look at from yoga and naturopathy is, is there a mechanism through which we can prevent these three happening? So if these three can be prevented, then uh, we can do lots of good to an asymptomatic patient becoming symptomatic, symptomatic uh, becoming uh, uh, severe without uh, acute respiratory distress, and then uh, uh, the severe patient becoming uh, um, leading to acute resp respiratory distress. So uh, these mechanisms, uh, though appear very, uh, very detailed, we have lots and lots of evidence to suggest that yoga and uh, naturopathy and many other Indian systems of medicines have their impact at a cellular level to bring in a change and to prevent these uh, processes happening. So there are so many people who were uh, uh, just asymptomatic, never turned symptomatic, and they were positive, turned negative, and uh, it's only a selected number of 
number of individuals who have turned symptomatic and they have become worse and, they have, and we have lost many of the known people today so the main reason what i would see here is uh, that healing power within that immunity within an individual which has to actually surface and fight is not doing its job and we are responsible for it to suppress it i am going to share what are those factors so what uh, in fact right in the beginning uh, in uh, uh, 2020 uh, we have developed lots of these uh, uh, modules uh, where we wanted to really work at three levels one is healthy individuals uh, where suspected cases are under quarantine and uh, covid positive patients uh, where you have around four different categories asymptomatic individuals without uh, uh, severe acute respiratory infection individuals with sari and of course the post covid rehabilitation and uh, another area which is very important is medical professionals and frontline workers and uh, we had developed uh, very uh, scientifically evaluated clinical protocols for uh, using in these individuals if you really want to use these why what is the rationale for them so one of the uh, important thing is like in healthy individuals uh, covid has induced lots of uh, fear and anxiety so the main purpose is actually to reduce that anxiety and to increase their physical activity work from home has become a, a new norm today and uh, even uh, i spend in front of a computer for a little more than uh, 8 to 10 hours uh, just giving talks or doing some work so sedentary lifestyle has become part of our life uh, and hence what yoga adds is that required physical activity and also to improve your respiratory endurance if your respiratory endurance is better then you can prevent those steps what i was talking about from asymptomatic to symptomatic to see uh, mild to moderate to severe and also uh, all that what you do whether you want or not is going to improve your immunity so we have uh, lots of things to actually <clears throat> look upon based on their age like a different age groups and uh, of course also with comorbidities individuals with any other issues health problems just a second so uh, in the second category as i said the objectives are little different so here apart from improving the lung functions and impu uh, immunity so when somebody is covid positive what we need to do is reduce their inflammatory response so that's what is going to cause a lot of issues and reduce their fear and anxiety and along with that uh, help them to uh, prevent progressing to pneumonia and uh, uh, what is needed in my view is very deep relaxation to body and mind we actually fail in taking people to that level because we don't bother about the dosage required to take an individual to that level so this is very crucial when you actually introduce this when you look at uh, mild to i mean moderate to severe patients with uh, particularly those without uh, severe acute respiratory infection the main uh, uh, objective will be to prevent cytokine storm and to improve immunity and improve blood oxygenation uh, this is where uh, people get into uh, oxygen lines and then if they are not able to uh, hold on to their oxygen saturation they have to move to uh, uh, ventilatory mechanisms so uh, along with that we also intend to uh, do lots of other things including reducing the viral load so do you think that only medis medications can reduce the viral load absolutely uh, it's not the only answer medications have direct impact on the virus certainly but uh, along with that when you create a host environment uh, whether the host environment is cooperating for the covid uh, virus to survive or uh, it is making its uh, uh, indigenous uh, body mechanism to be stronger so that's where uh, the inherent mechanisms of improving an individual's immunity plays a, a big role and uh, in the last case like uh, people with uh, severe acute respiratory infection uh, what uh, even i was listening to dr raghavendra he also mentioned that uh, you cannot do much when people uh, are on invasive methods of uh, ventilation so but still uh, 
uh, what we are doing at present, uh, which I'm going to share with you, is uh, working with Narayana uh, hospitals, where uh, <clears throat> uh, we, are we are trying to give uh, some sort of yoga intervention to um, the mild to moderate as well as uh, severe cases, where we do play uh, sort of a meditative uh, practice and the instructions, guided relaxation, when people are just lying down. And uh, probably it has an impact rather than listening to those beeps of uh, intensive care units, it is good for them to have uh, these kind of uh, uh, some pleasant uh, uh, noise around rather than uh, uh, having the anxiety that I'm going to become worse. So, uh, of course, there is very less you can do with their breathing and other things. Only relaxation is what you can uh, help uh, giving to them. Uh, we had some uh, uh, experience of working with uh, uh, respiratory illness, particularly uh, if you look at uh, non-infectious conditions and infectious conditions, uh, we had a wonderful result seen in uh, pulmonary tuberculosis patients where apart from improving the lung functions, it also showed reduced bacterial load and uh, it improved their uh, quality of life. And uh, the healing process in these individuals, those it was a very high infection level uh, in many people, it uh, was quite quicker compared to the control group. Uh, <clears throat> apart from this, uh, there are lots of studies looking at how yoga can benefit chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in particular where you have gamut of other conditions which all fall under that. And uh, what sh was shown here is uh, yoga has a capability of improving uh, the blood oxygen saturation levels. And also, uh, naturally, it improves lung functions and uh, the clinical outcomes were definitely better compared to the control groups. We had huge, uh, um, so many studies on bronchial asthma. Uh, it has demonstrated very clearly that yoga can improve various indices of uh, better health in uh, patients suffering from bronchial asthma. Our first ever publication in British Medical Journal was on bronchial asthma. And we have seen how when people do it regularly, when people do it uh, irregularly, and people do yoga for some time and stop, are the effects going to remain? So such questions were answered in uh, some of these studies. Apart from these, uh, when you look at infection, yoga has also demonstrated uh, beneficial effects in conditions like HIV positive patients as well as in uh, cancer patients. So we had a, a study where uh, it was demonstrated that yoga can actually reduce DNA damage and it can improve DNA repair mechanism in HIV positive patients. And uh, it also demonstrated uh, an improved quality of life in uh, the same uh, group of individuals. When you look at uh, cancer, there are several studies. We have one of the biggest collaborative research work with MD Anderson Cancer Center in uh, Houston, connected with University of Texas. Uh, there, uh, we have done a, a six year long study, which was funded by NIH with a huge grant of around $4.5 million. Why people have interest in studying yoga and, and understanding its underlying mechanisms is very clear. That the effects what we talk at a very uh, gross level can be demonstrated at a very subtle or rather at a cellular level. So there are lots of in, uh, uh, inputs suggesting that it reduces pro-inflammatory cytokines. So these are the clues what you can derive to use yoga in COVID management as well, because cytokine storm is one uh, thing which is really crucial um, in COVID management. And also it reduces range of stress biomarkers. Uh, you talk about cortisol to many other things yoga has demonstrated in cancer patients. And also it increases uh, NK cell activity and BDNF, all are very crucial and important to actually facilitate healing and actually to uh, uh, slow down the uh, growth of uh, cancer in an individual. So uh, apart from this, uh, yoga has also been tried and given to uh, healthcare workers. As I said, there are four different categories on which we had 
design protocols and these are scientific evidence for why we should use yoga for uh, 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 for the beneficial uh, effects uh, during uh, this covid management so in nurses yoga has been used and demonstrated that it can help in actually uh, reduce their uh, uh, stress and coping abilities and also uh, people work in uh, intensive care units for a longer time so this kind of relaxation along with physical activity can help them to recover and to uh, rejuvenate much quickly compared to the control groups so all this suggests you that yoga has a very strong role to play when you really want to uh, use it in either uh, various infectious conditions or uh, non communicable diseases okay so in both the cases yoga has got uh, something amazing to offer so many people are going to talk about these mechanisms but remember uh, this is one very well worked out mechanism uh, with respect to stress response system and uh, at every stage you have evidence to demonstrate that yoga can bring in that kind of a change so standard we always called psycho neuro immunology pathway or the hpa axis hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis uh this is a well established pathways uh, which uh, uh, we don't need to discuss much but there are lots of newer understandings in uh, using yoga in the management of various infectious conditions so uh, in summary uh, for uh, this first part uh, probably yoga brings in a multi dimensional approach what we are trying to do is uh, we work at a physical mental emotional and psychosocial levels so certainly at a physical level we intend to uh, improve uh, both systemic as well as local immunity so systemic i am talking about you have the your immune uh, system a uh, local i mean how at every organ uh, level uh, the immune function has to be optimized so that's what we are going to do and cardio respiratory endurance and uh, essential fitness at uh, mental level certainly uh lots of psychological upsurges mood swings along with anxiety and fear complexes have to be removed yoga works on that emotional it reduces definitely that fear and uh, it balances your mood and uh, psychosocial it harmonizes and improves social interactions and uh, our responsibilities everybody is talking about uh, the uh, basic norms to be followed during covid but still we at times we take it lightly and we do things our own way so probably that responsibility of being a, a wonderful citizen is what uh, yoga teaches us uh, just to give uh, some highlight as part of this uh, we had done lots of studies and just i'm quoting uh, one or uh, two or three uh, this is one uh, international survey we had done across a national survey on health perceptions adopted lifestyle related behavior during covid-19 pandemic and uh, happy to share with all of you that this uh, survey i mean what we have done in four nations has been uh, published we have recently uh, published this article in uh, uh, journal of uh, international medical research which is uh, very uh, getting a very high popularity very quickly because of the standards what it maintains and uh, we had representatives from uh, various uh, uh, nations for this survey and uh, the whole idea why we thought that there is a need was uh, actually to understand the impact of social isolation or social distancing uh, on various aspects during this uh, covid-19 pandemic and also to understand long term implementation or modify the lifestyle behaviors of individuals so whether uh, increased adoption of unhealthy nutrition has become a part of this pandemic whether substance use and sedentary behavior has increased etc and also to get real time data on the public response on uh, the lifestyle behavior and coping strategies in individuals so we have uh, done this survey uh, between april to june of 2020 and uh, we have disseminated through google forms and institutional websites and all other social media 
uh, sampling was 100% probabilistic. Uh, there is no, there was no chance of doing it on a random way. And uh, we had residents, I mean, respondents uh, from uh, China, Japan, Italy, and India, and all of them were above 80 years, and uh, we included both the genders. When we did this survey, the peak uh, incidence was uh, in some of these major countries. What you can see, Japan, South Korea, China, India, Italy, and of course, United States of America in uh, 2020, what I'm talking about. So uh, hence we picked these samples. We also have uh, some representation from United States as well as many other countries, but we had a inclusion criteria because of which we are not added uh, US here. So we had a very well developed checklist uh, which looked at uh, personal details, lifestyle related perceptions and perception related, the uh, basic uh, perception related question, questions including uh, health status, sleep quality, coping abilities, energy status, coping flexibility, and their interaction with family and fear of the pandemic. So uh, we had standard mechanisms of analyzing this, and it was very interesting. The uh, demographic data suggests that uh, there's a good representation from all the four countries, number-wise. And uh, we had, uh, uh, you can see here, gender difference is certainly there like uh, uh, the female, uh, what you can see here in Japan, in Italy, uh, as well as in India uh, and China were uh, predominantly high. And on average, uh, we had 75.2% of uh, respondents coming from uh, women category. So we also had majority of them uh, telling that they all work. So it's amazing to see, particularly in Japan, the age group, what you can see is 53.49 compared to 29, 29 and 36, I mean 48 in other countries. 53 and 48 of Japan and Italy, uh, most of them said they are all working. So probably that's what keeps them very active cognitively. So that's what is needed for us uh, to understand how probably it can have an impact. The highlights of this survey, uh, suggest that uh, Japan demonstrated a poorest response to self-rated health measures of an individual. So it is around uh, 40 to 43 percent of individuals only responded that they have uh, that awareness. And Italy had the moderate uh, response when it comes to health, uh, <coughs> uh, self-rated health measures. Fear response was worst uh, for Italians, and uh, it was also demonstrated that family cohesion was uh, definitely uh, better in uh, India, and next uh, is, of course, Japan, Italy, and uh, China. So what it shows, around 50% or close to 50% of the people, or 40, 45% of people said that they have a family connection and they go back to the family whenever there is uh, sort of an issue like COVID when they are under distress. So this is something wonderful what uh, we could understand. So uh, this was followed by um, another major study what we have taken up, which was a sponsored, uh, I mean funded study from Department of Science and Technology, which uh, was to see can yoga as an adjuvant therapy uh, facilitate the management of mild to moderate COVID patients which was a non-randomized clinical trial. So we have uh, taken around 140 subjects of both genders above 18 years and uh, below 65 years. Uh, this study uh, is coming to its conclusion now and we have measured uh, various indices of uh, uh, COVID, including inflammatory markers, IL-2 and IL-6, along with C-reactive protein and range of uh, 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 measures are uh, biomarkers uh, from the blood. So we have also looked at uh, various other profiles, including lipid, renal, and liver. And a lot we have looked at range of psychological measures, including quality of life in these individuals. This major study has been done in collaboration with Narayana Health, as I mentioned it to you. Uh, I should say one allopathy hospital, which is uh, cooperating for a yoga and a naturopathy based lifestyle study 
um, has to be uh, uh, definitely appreciated because many times we have approached so many other medical institutions there are uh, uh, institutions showing a lot of interest, but when it comes to implementation, you find it difficult. So Narayana Health is one such where we have uh, done, and now uh, we have started a randomized control trial, and we are also uh, uh, doing it in uh, some severe patients with yoga-based relaxation. That will be something very novel nobody has done so far. We have also done another project, which was an institution funded project, yoga for the quarantine patients and frontline workers. Uh, we have looked at various uh, measures here. This is for quarantine patients. And uh, we looked at uh, state anxiety, state mindfulness, attention awareness scale, and of course, visual and log. And for the health workers, we have 100 people recruited. And we have looked at various indices, including fear, depression, anxiety, repetitive uh, uh, negative thinking. Uh, this study is being done in collaboration with the uh, uh, MGM uh, Medical College in Indore. Once again, an amazing cooperation for uh, doing this. And uh, we also have an extended arm of this study, which is being done with patients who are at home, home quarantine. So this uh, also suggested something very important. We had another very interesting study, uh, which we have uh, done in the process of publication is uh, uh, working on a yogic ventilatory technique. So it's a very simple, I mean, the uh, name sounds very uh, attractive, fancy, uh, but it is a very simple deep dap diaphragmatic breathing uh, with chanting the syllable A, Akara. So now people have made uh, it uh, very, uh, common that one way to increase your oxygen saturation is to do prone breathing I mean in the sense makarasana breathing kind of it so but people find it very uh, uh, distressing at times when their breathing is uh, uh, respiratory when they have respiratory distress so what we have done is we have made people lie down in shavasana as they do or uh, partial uh, reclining in a reclining uh, uh, way and we make them do deep uh, diaphragmatic breathing, like in our sectional breathing, what you give, abdominal breathing. And uh, then when they exhale, deep exhalation, we ask them to chant Akara. So this has a dual effect. One is making your abdominal breathing very strong. And then you not only inhale deeply, but also exhaling while exhaling, you have lots of other benefits which uh, can influence your autonomic nervous system. So this suggested that the uh, oxygen saturation levels can go up very significantly. So we have done it in uh, uh, normal volunteers and elderly people, and uh, it has increased by four units for sure in every individual. And it has also reduced heart rate and respiration, suggesting that it has very deep relaxing effect. So this is something very interesting what we have done during that time. So it suggests that uh, we have lots which we can contribute uh, to the COVID uh, related immunity. The second part is uh, something what uh, actually has been um, coined by our founder, Dr. H.R. Nagendra. Uh, so he calls Viparyaya, which is one of the uh, Chitta Vrittis. So, Viparyaya is the root cause of inflammation and autoimmunity. So, uh, all of you as yoga students, you might have studied uh, uh, Patanjali Yoga Sutras and uh, you know the Chitta Vrittis. And we just brush and move forward when it comes to Viparyaya. So, we know Pramana Viparyaya Vikal Panidra Smrutayaha. Uh, but when we talk, we stress a lot on how do we regulate, how do we modify our mental uh, uh, modifications or chitta vrittis. But let us see uh, what role chitta viparyaya has got uh, when we talk about immunity. So you are all very familiar with these two terminologies, inflammation and autoimmunity. There are many other words associated with these. When you talk of inflammation, there are several words comes to your mind. At the same time, when you talk of autoimmunity, once again, several things come to your mind. So these are, uh, if you simply want to remember, I mean, this is just an image I have taken from Google. 
So uh, easy way to remember the cardinal signs of inflammation is uh, heat, redness, swelling, pain, and loss of functioning. So uh, we know the reasons why uh, we feel in a part or a place or in a uh, uh, area where there is inflammation, you have uh, heat, redness, swelling, pain, and uh, loss of uh, functioning. So basically, uh, our interest is to look at these two uh, major uh, divisions. One is an acute inflammation, another is a chronic inflammation. So even if you talk of uh, COVID, uh, what is very important is uh, really to manage the inflammatory responses. Acute inflammation, as we talk in naturopathy, is uh, truly uh, something which is protective in nature. Whereas chronic inflammation is the problem for us. Whether acute stress, what you call it as a new stress is good for you, distress or distress is what is going to create trouble, same way acute and chronic inflammations also can influence us. So what we aim to do through yoga is actually <clears throat> make your acute inflammatory responses uh, actually function better with least impact, okay? And at the same time, how do we reverse chronic inflammation? Okay, chronic inflammation is what leads to range of chronic diseases, what you can see here, ranging, uh, ranging from cardiovascular to uh, fibromyalgia. So immunity in particular and inflammatory, immune inflammatory homeostasis is something which has been looked upon for quite some time. So if you look at the 2011 Nobel Prize in uh, Physiology or Medicine is given to the, the three wonderful scientists, uh, two from USA, one from France, working on immune uh, inflammatory homeostasis. So uh, people have started talking about homeostasis uh, because in yoga, what we talk is samatvam. In uh, particularly in the naturopathy, what we talk is re-establishing that homeostasis and uh, that's the concept what has been looked upon and they have won uh, <clears throat> a Nobel Prize for it and I am going to share some more facts like that. So uh, this is an amazing book those who are interested can pick a digital copy of it. So leaving well with autoimmune disease. Uh, we always uh, surrender and we give up when we hear that I have an autoimmune disease. And when a patient comes and tells you, then we try doing lots of things externally, okay? So how do I actually look at various aspects which can actually reverse it, is what this book talks about. And they also talk about what your doctor doesn't tell you uh, that uh, you need to know. Uh, so they talk about such simple things, like uh, you don't need to uh, wait uh, for that time, when some of the biochemical markers suggest that you have autoimmune disease. Simple thing like, are you suffering from exhaustion, weight gain, joint pain, depression or anxiety, memory loss, uh, numbness, etc. These all indicate that there is something happening in your body where uh, you are not responding. Okay, these are all indicators in a way where some sort of body's resistance to what you are doing is demonstrated. Uh, I'm not going to details of these, but I'm uh, flashing them for your, for your uh, information. So what exactly we look at is around 60 to 80% of chronic inflammatory diseases with genetic predisposition and environmental modulation are autoimmune diseases. So the prevalence is very high in US and uh, it is uh, <clears throat> actually greater for females than males. That doesn't mean that all uh, men feel happy about it. This uh, graph is changing for your kind information. So men are also getting uh, uh, more uh, severe issues with respect to autoimmunity. What exactly happens when there is autoimmunity? So it is, these are all your own body cells, okay? So if you simply want to understand, suddenly one fine day, uh, your own uh, friends and uh, family members, when you come back in the evening, they start telling that, uh, oh, come on, uh, he is an intruder. 
okay so we don't know who this person is let us destroy him so then the whatever the expression the poor cell is making here he is really true in uh, many cases on a daily basis what happens in our body so uh, but whatever you try to convince like uh, i'm one of you please uh, don't get uh, misguided uh, trust me kind of it and uh, your body cells won't uh, never realize it so that's where the puristic uh, understanding of yoga which has to come in so these disorders uh, uh, are classified mainly under three categories hypersensitivity immunodeficiency and autoimmunity by uh, per se so it is too much of an activity too little an activity and misdirected activity is what we are talking about these are some diseases i won't go into the details but this is you should know as doctors that uh, there are such conditions and which antigen or antibody complex is responsible for it and what is the consequence of it and how do i identify in a simple way so this is what is the information what you need to actually uh, understand this process so as i was talking either it is uh, antigen river or antigen antibody complex which uh, results into made va various conditions like this so uh, either this can be organ specific or this can be very systemic so once again you have the types uh, one two and three and once again they are classified based on the uh, complex from which they come and also the uh, hypersensitivity which they represent and uh, uh, once again there are many attempts made to manage uh, the risk factors sometimes what we use themselves can be a subsequent risk factor for you to become worse with autoimmunity that's why whenever an individual is diagnosed with autoimmune disorder first thing what generally people say is don't directly start medication because that can suppress your normal immune functioning and uh, that's where uh, the, the <clears throat> clarity which we need to have because the minute we suppress uh, inflammation that leads to worst autoimmunity and uh, that's what uh, uh, we have to be uh, very much cognizant about in uh, handling these kind of things uh, this is just some impressions for you which i am not going to the details so these are all various conditions and in, including today a lot of discussion is on for insulin resistant diabetes to be one of the custodian and uh, uh, to be uh, uh, one condition under the custody of autoimmune diseases so uh, because of a range of uh, complexes which are spoken so let me bring uh, some uh, traditional understanding what i was uh, telling in the beginning about paper yeah, yeah. so all of you have uh, uh, referred to this uh, shloka uh, i am 100% sure about it the viparyayo mithya gnanam atadrupa pratishtam it says that viparyaya illusion is a false knowledge so how this is uh, false knowledge is created it is formed of a thing as other than what it is so it is uh, let us say uh, it is a pole but uh, we look at it uh, uh, look at at a look at a pole uh, like uh, many other things other than a pole so you look at a uh, snake and uh, uh, you cannot be uh, getting confused but when you look at a rope there are always when it is in a shady place you always feel that there probably there is a uh, rope there i mean there is a snake there so uh, there is lots of commonalities which people uh, talk about between viparyaya and vikalpa whereas this is the cognitive process uh, viparyaya is all about hence viparyaya is that stronger uh, force which can confuse not mentally but also physically an individual so viparya also means wrong cognition an illusion inverted or uh, <clears throat> perseverative thinking and the change or an absence or non existence of something which i am simply thinking that it is existing and also uh, complete destruction or uh, uh, trace passing a given area so there are lots of uh, uh, details given to this what we <clears throat> Co correlate 
along with uh, viparyaya or what viparyaya uh, has been uh, uh, influenced further or the factors influencing viparyaya can be uh, the well known things like avidya smita ragadvesha vinivesha on one side which are kleshas and uh, you have chitta vikshepas like vyadistyana samshaya pramada alasya avirate bhranti darshana alabdha bhumi katva and anavasti tatvani so uh, this is in a grosser way contributing factors avidya smita ragadvesha vinivesha and the symptoms what you see because of its influence what is happening in the body so this is the true confusion what is being created in the body so we always related to the mental confusion and we say that okay yoga and all these concepts of viparya are to do with your thinking and your mind honestly speaking what it is suggesting is uh, what you see at a grosser level you can see at the subtle level so primarily when you really want to understand how this whole process takes place you definitely need to go to this gita model bhagavad gita model which talks about dhyayato vishikan pumsa sangaste shupajayate sangat sanjayate kamaha kamat krodho bijayate krodho bhavati sammoha sammoha smriti vibrama smriti bramsha buddhi nasha buddhi nasha pranishyati it's so classical so uh, once again don't think that it is happening at the mental level viparyaya is something what uh, has been depicted at a cellular level same thing happens okay so you have these kind of confusions happening so many times it's all the desire part of it okay so body wants to do more and more and there is damage when you really want to do more and more when you want to stretch your uh, uh, systems and tissues and cells what are they are capable of then at a beyond one level it starts uh, identifying what is normal and uh, common as abnormal and then body starts resisting and you put more stress and you suppress it and then once again try to take it forward it's going to affect you more and more so that's the whole idea behind viparyaya what has been spoken uh, well this is uh, something what we have put together which is published also which talks about what contributes to this okay at the body level and at the mind level so what we call it as an ashubha karma so be it a walk be it sharirika be it manasika speech physical and mind can influence your dhidriti smriti so this is the cognitive processes and when they are affected or influenced one side on because of ashubha karma on the other side because of kleshas influencing the body like uh, kaya vacha manasa and indriya all these four things can get affected so both these can affect your dhidriti smriti and then starts your major issue viparyaya in ayurveda they also uh, relate it to pragna parada and the what mistakes on a daily basis we do and we suppress leading to lots of issues so this leads to sarva dosha prakopa is what is being defined as and this can also be related to your gunas the pancha mahabhutas and the tri doshas and finally what is important is to understand so there is obsession and uh, there is a movement of dosha in a wrong way leading to a disease uh, this classical example of how viparyaya can actually impact an individual's understanding at a cellular level is being explored we are doing lots of studies now uh, really to understand at a cellular level looking at various <coughs> um, uh, genetic pathways looking at various other uh, uh, ways of understanding this but all of you have definitely looked at panchakosha model because this is where you we do viparya we related to manomaya kosha certainly it the impact will be on uh, on your annamaya kosha so there are two major perceptual issues one is identifying friends as enemies which is autoimmunity second one is considering enemies as friends which is what happens in chronic inflammatory conditions including cancer so body 
when it is totally confused with this uh, uh, influence of either an ex uh, long term uh, inflammatory responses, then body starts creating this autoimmune response. So then whatever you tell that uh, it's all normal, don't worry, don't uh, harm your own body cells, it will never, uh, it will never uh, uh, understand. There is cognitive viparyaya. And second thing is considering enemies as friends, cancer cells, you know, whenever there is cancerous growth, there is a, a body response strongly to regress it. Many times when it goes beyond a level, then body starts accepting. Then it starts allowing, okay, you are a friend. Why you are struggling in one place? Come, I will give you place in many other places. That's when metastasis occurs. So we truly need to bring in these concepts. And when we teach yoga to patients, you have to believe in it that, yes, I can take it to such deep level whereby I can bring in not notional correction, but at a cellular correction. So that's what is very important because uh, another uh, um, uh, amazing contribution, a Nobel Prize uh, given to uh, medicine in 2018 to uh, two scientists, one from Japan, another from US, uh, where they have looked at accelerator and breaks uh, of uh, cancer care, which is based on immunology. So this is where uh, the concepts of uh, either somewhere like Viparyaya and uh, the concepts like what we talk in uh, yoga and naturopathy are being explored more and more today. This is not 2018-2020. Uh, 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 what we talk in naturopathy was being spoken hundreds of years back. And uh, you, you will be very happy to uh, see this another uh, great man uh, uh, who won another Nobel Prize has that the goal is to find chemical substances that have special affinities for pathogenic organisms and that uh, like a magic bullet goes straight to their targets and they work. What we talk in yoga and naturopathy, uh, though the expression here is using an external chemical substance, but what we believe is empowering the body, empower the power within you to generate or to uh, develop and to secrete such uh, substances which can go and attack directly the target uh, place and target uh, organ and to heal it. So it is not to create more uh, imbalance, but it is to create uh, balance. That's what we are looking at it. So finally, I would like to end by saying that we are certainly in a paradigm shift. So all of you being uh, yoga and naturopathy uh, students, practitioners, etc., be 100% confident uh, that world is looking at you, world is moving towards you. So we are moving from disease-centric approach to personalized medicine approach. We are also uh, <clears throat> moving from um, being dependent on medications to empowering them through meditation and various other relaxation responses. So we used to believe that go to a very good doctor, he is going to take care. It is intervention is necessary to guide you. But what we talk in naturopathy, like nature is the healer, is the final uh, final uh, gesture what we all need to agree on. And finally, uh, everything people are trying to bring in through artificial intelligence, but forgetting that there is something in, within us called conscious intelligence. And what yoga, what naturopathy empowers you to develop is that conscious intelligence. I'm sure uh, if we stick on to our roots, if we believe in our approaches, if we strongly practice and try to bring an evidence-based approach to whatever we are doing, uh, we will be the future of medicine. So with this, I thank all my dear friends and Dr. Prashant Shetty for giving me an opportunity to share a few thoughts with all of you. And I'm sure uh, it will uh, create some kind of a thought process in you to take it forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.
now the session is open for discussion so if you have any queries please come you have to unmute and speak questions from the participants There are some in the chat in the chat box. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, Manjana, sir, we have a question in the chat box. Um, if a COVID patient has pain in chest while deep breathing and expression of respiratory muscle, which uh, if a hello, sir. Yeah, yeah, please. Go on. Yeah, there is a question in the chat box. If a COVID patient has pain in chest while deep breathing and expansion of respiratory muscle, which breathing techniques are proven effective among such patients? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, what you need to make them do is uh, the breathing along with their hand movements. Okay, so what we do in uh, hands in and out breathing and hand stretch breathing. Because initially, uh, we need to really make their uh, <clears throat> the chest muscles relax okay so for which you need to give some mechanical stretch to these uh, uh, intercostal muscles so that can be done very well along with breathing through your uh, hands in and out breathing and hand stretch breathing in particular even though you are uh, uh, on the bed or whatever you are doing if you cannot sit and you have any issues also you can do it and then you need to give certainly the sectional breathing to them See, you have to actually assess pain and uh, if they have, uh, uh, they can identify themselves at what level they can uh, uh, say that it causes pain for them. So I inhale and reach a level, now it pains them. Okay, so then you need to identify and work on that level and then gradually increase. Uh, though it is little, uh, it can cause some uh, discomfort, you gradually increase, making them do understanding where exactly it is causing pain to them. So sectional breathing on one side and uh, this, and gradually certainly introduce kumbhaka. Kumbhaka has been found to be very, very, very beneficial in symptomatic COVID patients. I have uh, so many uh, uh, reports from uh, several people across the world suggesting when they had even a bit of a severe uh, COVID to drain the secretions, Kumbhaka has helped them a lot. But once again, you should not do any foolishness in holding the breath for too long. Uh, what you need to do is very systematic progression, like you are inhaling for around uh, three uh, seconds, exhaling for around uh, three seconds, and hold the breath for one to two seconds, and then you can slowly increase. So these are the three I would advise. Thank you, sir. Any other questions from the participants? So there is uh, one more uh, question in the chat box. It's about the cytokine storm. And uh, it says, uh, now the researchers are planning to use anti-inflammatory therapies, especially for the cytokines. So as of our field, what we have to do to control five to seven days of cytokine storm in COVID-19 patients? Yeah, certainly yeah. we then, uh, don't have a uh, proven, <coughs> proven uh, therapy from either from uh, yoga, naturopathy kind of it, for sure that I cannot tell that you just do this, your cytokine storm can be prevented. We know that we can contribute for this prevention, but we don't know for sure. That's why the modern medical approach is being followed. Uh, honestly speaking, nobody knows. Today, so many patients at home quarantine, they are recovering much faster than people who are put in a hospital. Whether these medicines, what they are using for preventing cytokine storm. Uh, uh, as for the philosophy of medication is concerned, it should help them. But it all depends on your body. So that's why I was telling what is good to prevent a cytokine storm is empower your body. 
Okay, so use yoga, use lots of naturopathic methods, external uh, methods, have wonderful, nutritious diet, and uh, of course, keep your mind calm and uh, quiet. So that is going to help you. And we have uh, tested in a little more than around 3,000 uh, people who have turned positive. We have done uh, home quarantine and we have given them only this and they were not on any medication. None of them have progressed to any uh, severe acute respiratory illness. So this is just an expression. Honestly, I won't uh, uh, give you a direct answer because I don't have any scientific evidence to suggest that you do this cytokine storm can be prevented. Sorry. Uh, this is Sri Lekha. I have a doubt. So um, COVID patients are usually given uh, steroids, a lot of steroids when they're admitted in the hospital. So that which in, it indirectly impacts on your uh, kidney, liver and heart. So what can we as naturopaths or yoga uh, majors can do to you know, help this condition, sir? Yeah, number one, basically it is always uh, important to understand, uh, including Alopas, the WHO2 uh, All in Institute of Medical Sciences director, uh, everybody made it very clear when to use uh, steroids. Steroids, when they are used in a wrong time, can cause enormous amount of damage. You said it very right that uh, it can cause lots of bring in lots of complication. In COVID patients, in particular, if it is not used in a right way, you can do more harm. So when patients are put actually from day one on steroids, many of them might have probably got affected because of the medication rather than COVID itself. What we can do is certainly, even if a patient is on steroid, even if a patient is being is given lots of medication, if you make them do uh, make them uh, do yoga, make them uh, give uh, some of the naturopathy based intervention, it can actually reduce the side effects probably. Okay, I don't have any study to quote, but I know for sure that we are working on several conditions, including uh, cancer. You can look at one of our publication in uh, cancer, which suggests that yoga can reduce the side effects of chemo and radiation in breast cancer patients. So that gives us a clue that even when patients are on steroids, you can reduce the side effects and we can actually prevent them uh, getting or taking uh, these steroids uh, if we can handle them right from the beginning. So be confident and uh, keep monitoring whenever you know that uh, some things are beyond your limit. Don't hesitate to refer them to a hospital where further care can be taken. Thank you, sir. So there is a message in the chat box from the student side. The students are very thankful to benefit with such an informative presentation from you. Thank you. I mean, it's my pleasure and to organize this. And in particular, uh, uh, all uh, the students uh, who have uh, such an uh, inquisitive mind. Okay, so that's what I love uh, uh, talking to. So when Dr. Shiva Prasad uh, approached me, uh, I said, uh, for sure, I'll be there because I love spending time with students, though we don't get much time to do that. So thanks for this opportunity. And uh, I'm happy if uh, some message has reached you. And please read your uh, classical text strongly. So this one, Viparya, uh, yeah, if we can do research, probably you can get Nobel Prize. So we are doing lots of work on uh, such a con concept. So pick these concepts strongly from uh, your uh, different topics and correlate them with your uh, uh, other uh, uh, conditions when you really use them. So once again, thank you very much. It was my pleasure being. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Prashant Shetty, Dr. Shiva Prasad, uh, Dr. Sujata, and uh, all of you who have been uh, organizing this so well. So, sir, we have uh, two, three questions more from the... Hello, sir. Yeah, if you have time, yes, 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 of course. 
So any contraindication of yoga intervention in uh, acute symptomatic patients? Yeah, you should not, uh, you should not uh, be uh, uh, hyper excited to give all yoga practices to them. So many times we feel that uh, you give them a lot of yoga, then very quickly you can help them. So you will make a mistake. When acute uh, symptomatic patients are there, so one thing what is needed is uh, they have fever, they have respiratory uh, uh, distress or whatever it is. So bring more of naturopathy, okay, to relieve uh, or to help them with their fever and to make their body cooperate for doing yoga. So when you have high fever, I don't advocate them to do any physical yoga. Okay, so it is not indicated for them. You can do lots of relaxation techniques during that time. And once you start feeling better under acute condition, you can add physical components of yoga. Otherwise, you are going to create more strain to them. That's the only contraindication, only limitation, I would say. Sir, if the patient is uh, post-COVID and saturation level is not normal, can we teach yoga with oxygen? Definitely. Don't worry at all. I mean, if uh, they are on oxygen line, don't even, don't hesitate. Uh, but monitor their oxygen uh, saturation levels and what is it and at what level you can take the risk of removing it for a few minutes and make them do pranayama, whatever it is. You have the, uh, you should have that knowledge. Uh, when you can do that. If the oxygen levels, if they are not able to uh, maintain with even uh, one liter of oxygen, uh, then you have to, uh, I mean, uh, two or three liters of oxygen, you have to think. If somebody can manage with one liter of oxygen and uh, if the doctor advises, you can always uh, take the risk of uh, definitely training them with uh, pranayama and yoga, not an issue at all. And so the last question, does uh, dynamic yoga practice is contraindicated after COVID recovery? No, you should do. Are you giving the uh, jogging? You are giving a lot of forward and backward bending, dynamic, dynamic Surya Namaskar, etc. So avoid for some time. Don't give too much of a dynamic practices after their COVID recovery. Start with a very slow and steady manner. Give them a start with the uh, breathing all breathing practices including uh, like uh, you do tiger stretch breathing you do uh, leg raising breathing you do uh, the sitting shashankasana breathing kind of thing you introduce postures along with breathing in the beginning and then gradually you can add up and don't do give any dynamic practices immediately uh, after their uh, covid recovery Thank you so much, sir. Please accept our thanks for a great presentation and very informative speech. Thank you so much. Thank you and uh, namaste. Thank you, sir. With your permission, I will be exiting. Uh, if there are any further uh, questions or anything, all your uh, senior faculty members are connected. You can share with them and you can be in touch. We will definitely be happy to support you. So since I have another uh, presentation, I'll be moving out, exiting. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Sir. We'll be starting the next session within five minutes. Please be online.
We are happy that uh, the Yoga Day has come again on 21st June. The Indian spiritual and philosophy was treated as outdated and also was treated as a conventional method of uh, personal practice. But then slowly, about six years back, when our Prime Minister, Honorable Modi Ji, President is asked, and uh, he popularized the yoga to the, introduce this to the UNO and other worlds. Today, yoga has become a household matter. I wish to inform you that uh, the yoga day is not one day, but it's a day to start, day to begin. It's a day to sow the seed. The seed will grow and it will become a beautiful plant with flower and uh, fruits only when it is practiced. So it's not for a decorative and uh, on the uh, pot, but it is a practical approach to good health, good life, and happy living. Uh, today, uh, the Yoga Day has given a new call that because of the other uh, circumstances in the world, we want to call yoga begins at home. Yoga should be practiced at home by everybody, irrespective of their age. Only yoga is prescribed for uh, from childhood to the old age. There is no age bar for anyone to practice it because to keep fitness of body and mind, uh, it is very important. So I would request all of you to adopt this philosophy of yoga uh, with uh, good practices of uh, hygienic food, hygienic uh, habits, hygienic practices, and also see that the whole family come together to practice yoga in the mornings with physical exercise, in the whole day with the mental stability and mental approach. I wish that uh, the yoga will inspire us for the centuries to come, but uh, we are only by passing uh, in this period. But today, most important is to face the viruses that we have. Viruses is not only the what is coronavirus, but also so many other Ill, Ill viruses that is approaching the human mind and body and making us weak. So let us come together, let us unite and let us see that Yoga Day is celebrated with a practical approach and each one of us will have long life, good health and also good happy living. May Manjunatha Swami bless you all. My dear fellow Indians, So for our next session, Dr. Chaya, are you there online? Hello. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yes, yes. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Uh, for our next session, we have with us Dr. Chaya, HOD of Consultant Microbiology Department and Infection Control Officer in Narayana Multi Specialty Hospital, Mysore. Dr. Chaya completed her MBBS from JSS Medical College and MD Microbiology from JIPMA, Pondicherry with gold medals. She has published several publications in national and international journals, presented papers at European Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infection Disease Conference in Austria, and participated in infection prevention and control courses conducted by Queen's University, Canada. Dr. Chaya has clinical teaching and research experience in various institutions and also working as DNB coordinator, head of research activity and member of transplant committee in Narana Multi-Specialty Hospital. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Chaya for the session on a topic today, infectious disease. Over to you, Dr. Chaya. Um, Hello. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Dukna, for the introduction. Uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee for uh, selecting me for the speech today on the occasion of International Yoga Day. Thank you. Okay. 
Yes. Hello. One is the PPT yes, visible yes. now? Yes, yes. Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, good morning to one and all. So uh, let me speak about this infectious diseases where I'll be giving an overview about the infectious diseases. It's a chain of uh, reaction as well as the causative agent and a brief about the preventive aspect as well as the treatment aspect of infectious diseases. So just to start with the definition of infectious diseases, these infectious diseases are disorders caused by organisms such as bacteria, viruses, fungi, or parasites. We all know that many organisms live in as well as inside our body, which are normally harmless and even sometimes helpful. But under certain conditions, these organisms may cause disease in the individual. So how do we define infection as? So an infection is the invasion of the organism uh, by a disease-causing agent, its multiplication inside the body, and the reaction of host tissues to the infectious agent and toxins they produce. So just to go about the history of infectious diseases, it's been seen that epidemics of infectious diseases have been documented throughout history. And in the ancient Greece and Egypt have in fact documented epidemics of smallpox, tuberculosis, leprosy, and even dysphagia. And we all know that two men uh, are even credited today with the discovery of microorganisms using primitive microscopes. That is Robert Hooke, who described the fooding structures of molds in 1655, and Anthony Van Leeuwen Hooke, who is credited with the discovery of bacteria in 1676. So, just to know about the classification of infectious diseases, these infectious diseases have been classified based on the duration, its location, as well as timing. So, based on the duration, it can be classified as acute, chronic, and latent infection. So, acute in the sense, the one which develops early and ran its course very quickly. Whereas a chronic infection develops more slowly and is usually less severe, but it may persist for a long, indefinite period of time. A latent infection, it's an infection which is characterized by a period of no symptoms between outbreaks of illness. The patient will be completely normal in between symptoms. So that is called as latent infection. And this latent infection is usually seen in viral uh, illnesses. Then based on location, they can be classified as local and systemic infection. A local infection is confined to a specific area of the body. Say, for example, infection of the brain, which we call it as meningitis. Then infection of the liver, which is called as hepatitis. And the second is systemic infection. So systemic infection is nothing but a generalized illness that infects most of the body with pathogens that is widely distributed in tissues. So this happens whenever any bacteria, fungi or viruses enters the blood and from there it gets seeding into the different areas of the body. So based on the timing, we can uh, divide the infection as primary and secondary infection. So primary infection is the infection which is seen in a previously healthy person. So there won't be any infection prior to the present infection. So that is called as primary infection. Whereas secondary infection is an infection that occurs in a person uh, weakened by a primary infection, where his immune system is weakened, so they are susceptible to one more infection. Say, for example, if there's a patient with tuberculosis, they are highly susceptible to get other fungal infections with candida, or even they can get secondary bacterial infections with Klebsiella E. coli. So this is nothing but secondary infection. Coming to the causative agents of infection, these are the five most important causes of infection. That is bacteria, fungi, viruses, protozoa, helminths, and to some extent prions. So this is these are the diseases which are uh, caused by uh, bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, and helminths. And the most common disease which we see caused by bacteria are tuberculosis, pneumonia, gonorrhea, tetanus. And among viruses, the most common ones are hepatitis, HIV, herpes simplex, measles, polio, and among, and among fungi, the infections which are seen commonly are candidiasis, then ringworm infection, then cryptococcosis, uh, histoplasmosis. 
Then um, among protozoa, the common infections which are seen are amoebiasis, giardiasis, pneumocystis carini, cryptosporidiosis, and few helminthic infections such as ascariasis, then hookworm. Excuse me, I'm unable to move to the next slide. Uh. We will be doing that uh, sharing of slides we'll do from our side. Okay, fine. fine. Thank you. Yes, yes. please hold on. Next, next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. So moving on to the chain of infection. So these are the different components of chain of infection, which plays a role in causing infection in a human being. So these are infectious agent, reservoir, a portal of exit, mode of transmission, portal of entry, and the susceptible host. So for any infection to occur in an individual, it should pass through these uh, reagents. So I would like to discuss all the components of chain of reaction with respect to COVID-19. As we all know that uh, we are dealing with pandemic since one year, and I can just uh, explain this with keeping COVID-19 as an example. Next slide. Yeah, infectious agent. So what are these infectious agents? So these are organisms that are capable of producing infection or infectious disease. As you already explained, these are bacteria, could be viruses, fungi, parasites, and protozoa. So just to give an example, to start with COVID-19 disease, the infectious agent for COVID-19 disease is SARS-CoV-2, that is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus Beta Virus. It, is, it belongs to Coronaviridae family. So this is the causative agent for COVID-19 disease. The second part would be the reservoir. So now the agent is ready and it needs some habitat to live or multiply and to get transferred to another host. So how do we define this reservoir as? The reservoir of an infectious agent is the habitat in which the agent normally lives, grows and multiplies. Reservoirs include humans, which are the most common reservoirs, followed by animals and even sometimes inanimate objects like soil, water and other uh, contaminated surfaces like tabletops, doorknobs, especially in hospital areas and contaminated instruments and even other surfaces. Yeah, with respect to COVID-19, it has been identified that the most likely ecological reservoir for SARS-CoV-2 are bats. But it has been believed that the virus jumped the species barrier to humans from another intermediate animal host. And this intermediate animal host has not yet been still identified. So they are saying it could be a domestic food animal, a wild animal, or even a domesticated wild animal. Okay, now the, we have identified the infectious agent, and now we have seen where it resides, which is called as a reservoir. And now we need to have some way for these organisms to come out of these reservoir could be from humans, animals, or other inanimate surfaces. So this is what is called as portal of exit. So a portal of exit is the site from where microorganisms leave the host to enter another host and cause disease or infection. So these are the different specimens uh, through which the organisms will be excreted out of the reservoir or a host. So that is urine, 
it could be feces, it could be saliva, respiratory tract, maybe a sputum or nasal secretions, skin, blood, and mucus discharge. So these are the different specimens through which organism will be excreted out of the reservoir. Okay, the next is mode of transmission. So now the infectious agent is there. We have identified the reservoir and it has a known a portal of exits from these reservoir. Then how these organisms are transmitted from one host to another host or from reservoir to uh, host. So that is called as mode of transmission. So this is a way in which organisms can be transmitted from reservoir to another host or reservoir where it can live. So these are the five important modes of transmission of infection. The first and foremost is through contact, which may be a direct or an indirect contact. So contact is nothing but a direct contact is nothing but touching. So either it could be a handshake or even uh, hand. Yeah, the most common mode is a handshake. Then indirect contact is through contaminated surfaces. Then the second mode of transmission is droplet. So droplet is nothing but these are the secretions which are brought out when we sneeze or cough or talk. So organism directly enters droplet infection. And the third most common is airborne infection. So in airborne infection, the viral particles or bacterial particles are expelled out through the respiratory secretions, either during coughing, sneezing or talking. And these uh, particles tangled in the air as a droplet nuclei and remain in the air for some time. So when we inhale these droplet nuclei or uh, these droplet nuclei are inhaled to form infection in an So this is called as airborne. So droplet infection is a direct transmission of organisms one person to another through coughing, sneezing, whereas airborne is inhalation of droplet nuclei which is present in the air. So that is the difference between droplet and airborne infection. The fourth mode of transmission is through vectors. So the most common vectors involved in transmission of infections are mosquitoes, ticks, and mites. So the common diseases you all would be knowing it is dengue, malaria, and rickets cell diseases. And what are the other common vehicles? So common vehicles, nothing but contaminated water and food, which causes food poisoning. And even contaminated medical devices can cause infection in hospitals, which are called as nosocomial infections. So the, among these five modes of transmission, the commonest mode of transmission is contact. Yeah, this is just to represent different modes of infectious disease transmission, where we see a direct contact, an indirect contact through the contaminated surfaces, then droplets, the direct transmission of organisms from one person to another through coughing, sneezing, then airborne, after coughing, sneezing, it gets entangled in the air as droplet nuclei, and then there's a fecal oral route where through contaminated water and food infection is transmitted and animal vectors such as mosquitoes and even abiotic environmental surfaces like wind and water. Yeah, with respect to COVID-19, if I have to say, uh, no reservoir to human transmission is not yet being identified as we had already said that there could be some intermediate host from bats to humans that has uh, taken this virus so it has not still been identified. So, but from human to human transmission are mainly occurring by two ways. That is by aerosol, then respiratory droplets, and the least common method is the fecal oral route. So this aerosol, where the viral particle is less than five micrometer diameters, it can directly infect an uninfected individual when a patient coughs or a sneezes. Then respiratory droplets are nothing but it has a viral particle of more than five micrometer diameter and this will be a droplet which may be entangled in the air as a droplet nuclei and which is further inhaled by an uninfected individual to later become infected and these droplet surface sorry uh, respiratory droplets can also fall on the surfaces as i already said then inanimate objects and can get contaminated and indirect contact of these surfaces will lead to infection in the uninfected individual and the least common method which has been explained for human to human transmission in covid-19 is through fecal oral route they say these viruses are excreted in the feces and the feces the droplet nuclei which is inhaled by an uninfected individual will lead to infection Yeah, so now the organism we have identified, so we have identified its reservoir and now it is exited from the uh, reservoir and now it is uh, going to get transmitted by different modes of transmission. So now how does it enter to the other host? So this is what we call it as portal of entry. A portal of entry is the site through which microorganisms 
enter the susceptible host and cause disease or infection. So these are the different ways by which an organism can enter into the other host. The first and foremost method is inhalation, that is through respiratory route. The second is absorption via the mucous membrane or eyes, which may be the oral mucous membrane, nasal mucous membrane, or the conjunctival mucous membrane. And then ingestion, that is through the gastrointestinal tract by eating contaminated food or water. And the fourth method is inoculation as a result of puncture or trauma. And the fifth method is introduction of contaminated medical devices, which can usually happens in the hospital, as I already said, which they are called as nosocomial infections. Yeah, with respect to COVID-19, if we have to see the portal of entry, all of us know that it is mainly through respiratory route. So it can enter through the nasopharyngeal route or the oropharyngeal route. And that is how we take nasopharyngeal swabs and oropharyngeal swabs for diagnosis of COVID. Okay, so in the chain of reaction, we have identified the bacterial agent, the reservoir, and the portal of exit, mode of transmission, and it has now entered it is going to enter into the host. So the last, the final link in the chain of reaction is a susceptible host. We usually don't write it as a host. It is susceptible host. That means the host who are at risk of infection. It is not that if a bacteria or a virus enters into 100 individuals, not all 100 individuals will develop infection. So someone who are susceptible to infection only develop clinical symptoms. So this susceptibility of a host depends upon the following factors. Like, for example, a genetic makeup of the uh, individual. Say, for example, a person with a disease called as a sickle cell anemia is actually protected from a particular type of malaria because of some genetic makeup where that type of malaria will not infect these individuals. The second reason is like specific immunity. So what is the specific immunity? It refers to a protective antibodies that are directed against a specific agent. So if there is infection with a virus, a specific antiviral antibodies will be formed and these antibodies will completely protect the individual without uh, he or she becoming any, he or she becoming um, any symptoms. And the third factor would be like non-specific factors. That is the skin, mucous membrane, gastric acidity, cilia, which is there in the respiratory tract, a cough reflex, and a non-specific immune response also play an important role in inhibiting these uh, infectious agents. And there are certain factors which increases the susceptibility to infection. Say, for example, a malnourished child and uh, alcoholism or a patient having immunodeficiency diseases are under high risk of getting infection. Yeah, this is what I was talking about. So we do have some exposed to infectious agents do not develop symptoms. So because of these protective mechanisms, which is already existing in the body. So if defense mechanisms are intact an immune system is functioning normally, an individual can definitely fight against microorganisms and do not contract any disease. So what are these natural body defenses? So for example, mucous membranes say it could be a nasopharyngeal mucosa or oropharyngeal or conjunctival mucosa. So they usually trap organisms and prevents its entry into the body. The second is like cilia, cilia which is present, the hair-like structures which are present inside the nasal cavity, they expel pathogens out of the respiratory tract. Okay, and some activity like coughing and sneezing also pushes out the organisms out of the body without making it to enter into the respiratory tract. Then hydrochloric acid, which is present in the stomach, usually inhibits or kills the bacteria or viruses that enters the body through contaminated food or water. Then peers also contain some bactericidal chemicals which kill organisms as soon as it gets attached onto the conjunctiva. And important is inflammation. So this is a reaction of the body to any infectious agent. So during this time, uh, WPC count will increase and these white blood cells have the ability to destroy pathogens. The last is immune response, that is production of antibodies. So production of specific antibodies to a specific antigen will completely kill the organism and the individual may not come out with symptoms. Next slide, please. 
Yeah, this is all about the chain of infection. That is the way in which the organism enters into the human body. So now it has entered into the human body. So how does the infection occur and how do we classify these stages of infection? So these stages of infection are classified into five, which is called as the incubation period, prodromal period, period of illness, period of decline, and period of convalescence. So as we see in this graph, the highest number of viral load or a bacterial load or a fungal load will be there during the period of illness where the patient actually has symptoms. Yeah, these are the five stages of infection which will be explained again by keeping COVID-19 as an example. So the first stage is called as incubation stage. So this incubation stage means it is the time between the exposure to an infectious agent till the onset of symptoms. That is called as incubation period. So during this period, viral and bacterial particles uh, definitely replicate. They start to replicate. And the duration, the exact time frame of the incubation stage varies depending on the infection and depending on the infective agent also. So even within bacteria, the incubation period for Staphylococcus aureus infection is totally different from pneumococcal. Okay, if we just take COVID-19 as an example, the incubation period for COVID-19 is from 3 to 14 days and mean incubation period is 5.1 days. And it has been seen by many studies that 97% of individuals who are exposed to COVID-19 develop symptoms within 11 days of infection. Yeah, the next would be the prodromal stage. So this prodromal stage, uh, it refers to the period that is after incubation and before the characteristic symptoms of infection. So it lasts only for a few days and people can even transmit infectious agents during this prodromal stage. So what happens during this stage is that the infectious agent, it continues to replicate. It will trigger the body's immune response and patient will have a mild, which is non-specific symptoms. So these symptoms may be like a low-grade fever or a fatigue. Many diseases may not uh, undergo this prodromal phase. They can directly go from incubation period to the illness phase. Yeah, the third stage is called as the illness stage. That is where the patient actually have the characteristic symptoms of the disease. So the third stage of infection is illness or a clinical disease. So this stage includes the time when a person shows apparent symptoms of an infectious disease. So here also the symptoms of infection vary depending on the type of the infectious agent. So in general, almost all bacterial, viral, protozoal, fungal infections will experience these generalized symptoms. That is fever, headache, then myalgia, and swollen lymph nodes as a reaction to inflammatory reaction to the infectious agent. Yeah, with respect to COVID-19, if I have to say, the most common symptoms are fever, dry cough, and tiredness. So when a patient is coming with a history of fever, definitely he will be positive by RT-PCR or by HRCT. So the less common symptoms are like body pain, sore throat, even diarrhea, and conjunctivitis, headache, and loss of taste and smell, which has been uh, very much characteristic of COVID-19. And the last is rash on skin and even sometimes discoloration of fingers and toes. And these features are seen during the second wave of COVID-19, which was not there during the first wave of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. The fourth phase is called as the decline phase. So it is self-explanatory. As the name suggests, during the decline stage, the immune system will have a successful defense against the pathogens and the number of infectious particles will definitely decrease. So even uh, symptoms also will gradually improve. But there is a caution note here. A patient can develop secondary infections during this stage if the primary infection is weakened their immune system. As I already explained about the classification of infectious diseases where we can have a primary and a secondary infection. So during this stage of decline, patient can have secondary infection if his immune system is weakened. So, and one more caution is here that during this stage, the virus can still transmit to other people. Even though the patient is relieved from symptoms, he still have the ability to transmit infection to others. The last stage is called as the convalescent stage. So this is the final stage of infection. During this stage, symptoms will completely resolve and a person can go back to his normal functions. 
But there is here also a one caution note, which is there during the convalescence phase. That is, patient can have permanent damage even after the infection resolves. So some infectious agents are known to cause permanent damage even when the infection is completely resolved. Yeah, this is about the different stages of infection. So now the patient is infected with uh, all the different uh, uh, components of chain of reaction, uh, chain of reaction which we had seen. Sorry, chain of infection. And now, how do we diagnose a patient who has come with symptoms of infection? So here I have just uh, given an overview about the laboratory diagnosis of infection in microbiology laboratory. So the first and foremost is by microscopic examination of clinical specimens. So these are the different ways we diagnose infection by having a wet mount or a gram stain, AFB stain, GEMSA, KOH and India depending on the uh, infectious agent. Second is isolation of organism by culture and biochemical reactions. So this may be either in the form of a manual method or automated uh, methods. And the third method is by serological identification of antigen or antibodies. So here, if we identify antigen and IgM antibody, it will definitely say that the patient is suffering from an acute infection. So if we're able to detect IgG antibodies, it says that the patient would have had infection in the past. And the last is the molecular biology techniques and the most common among this molecular biology technique is polymerase chain reaction. Yes, with respect to COVID-19, so I would like to discuss about the different uh, tests which are available to diagnose infection. So there are three basic types of tests for COVID-19 detection. So the first and foremost and the gold standard is reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, which is a molecular method where it detects the viral nucleic acid. The second is viral antigen detection by rapid antigen tests. And third is detection of antibodies to the virus. So this nucleic acid and antigen detection tests are mainly used to assess acute infection, whereas antibody tests will provide an evidence of prior infection with the SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, this is about the other diagnostic criteria for COVID-19. So they do diagnose COVID-19 based on these five criteria. The first is clinical features. The second is a screening or a laboratory test, which includes a white blood cell count, CRP, D-dimer, and ESR, and then chest X-ray as well as CT scanning, then molecular examination, as I already explained, it is RT-PCR, and then immunoassays for uh, detection of antibodies. Yeah. I would want to say that uh, really this uh, COVID-19 pandemic has revolutionized uh, molecular labs in India. So to start with in March 2020, we had only three RT-PCR labs which uh, uh, were available to detect COVID-19 virus to start with. And now the total operational laboratories were reporting to ICMR is around 2,621 labs. It is really a huge number. And government labs are around 1,266 and around private laboratories are 1,355. So this pandemic has enabled us to, I mean, to identify or to have a molecular labs in each and every hospital or other institutions. So uh, I would be happy to share the information that uh, we, Narayana Multispeciality Hospital also has been accredited by NAVL for RT-PCR testing of COVID on August 2020. And we have been conducting these uh, RT-PCR tests for uh, COVID-19. And this is our team with the lab. Yeah. So if we just see uh, what is the percentage of infectious diseases causes death? Yes, it does. So these infectious diseases are responsible for a quarter to a third of all deaths worldwide. It has been said that infectious diseases account for more than half of all deaths in children under the age of five. So of this top 10 causes of death, which has been compiled by WHO, five are mainly due to infectious diseases. And among these, the top single agent killers are HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis. And other known uh, killers are lower respiratory infections, that is pneumonia, and diarrheal diseases. Yeah, coming to the treatment, so now we have identified the organism through chain of infection and it has entered the host by different by going through different stages of infection and we have identified again the organism by laboratory diagnosis, then how do we treat? So I will be just giving an overview about the treatment of infectious diseases. So it is based on the infectious agent, medications are given. So it's like for an antibacterial medications are usually treated 
are usually used to treat bacterial infections like streptococcal infection or ear infections and urinary tract infection. Specific antiviral medications are available to treat viruses like HIV, hepatitis C and influenza. And antifungal medications are available to treat fungi like yeast infections and even toenail infection. Then antiparasitic medications are used to treat infections caused by parasites like malaria and tape or tapeworms. So I don't go into details of this. I've just uh, given a brief picture of what treatment modalities are used to uh, treat these infectious diseases. Yeah, with respect to COVID-19, uh, in India, we have been following this clinical management protocol for COVID-19 in adults, which is given by Government of India, Minister of Health and Family Welfare, and this keeps updating, and the latest latest update which was done is in, was on 24th 5, 2021. So, this clinical management protocol is being used across the uh, nation for the treatment of COVID-19 patients. Yes. And the last would be about prevention of infectious diseases. Uh, can we prevent these infectious diseases? Yes, definitely. So we are all aware that vaccines are definitely useful to prevent infections. And we all have been taking uh, vaccines according to the universal immunization schedule uh, from the government of India. We've been taking this from childhood. So these vaccines are mainly available to prevent all common infectious diseases like hepatitis, diphtheria, then influenza and herpes zoster. So these are nothing but uh, it could be a live or a killed vaccine which are given to individuals so that it induces an immune response in the host. So whenever I, they are exposed to any antigen or a particular bacteria or a virus, the body will be uh, defending these organisms without causing any infection. So these are nothing but vaccines. So you all know that uh, even COVID-19 vaccines are available in India and the most common ones are Covishield, Covaxin and uh, Sputnik, the other one which has recently entered and it's being uh, used in some parts of uh, India. So these are the specific uh, protection for infectious diseases. So what are the other ways by which we can prevent infection? The first and foremost would be hand hygiene, hand hygiene. So why we say hand hygiene? Because the most common mode of transmission of infection is by direct contact. So as we already uh, gone through this, so it is mainly by washing your hands with soap and water thoroughly and frequently will definitely reduce the rate of infection. Then third would be covering our nose and mouth when we sneeze or cough. So this mainly prevents the transmission of organisms through droplets. So third is disinfecting frequently the surfaces which are. Can you go to the previous slide, please? Previous slide. Yeah, thank you. Uh, disinfecting frequently touched surfaces in your home or a workplace. So this definitely reduces the chances of infection through indirect contact. Then avoiding contact with the sick people or sharing personal items with them. And even not drinking or swimming in contaminated water supplies will definitely reduce the chance of infection through ingestion mode of transmission. And even by not eating or drinking food or beverages prepared by people who are sick. So this also will definitely reduce the chance of infection. Yeah, with respect to COVID-19, you all must have seen the most common modes, prevention, uh, preventive aspects which have been implemented to prevent this COVID-19. The first and foremost is no handshake, as we know that it could definitely transmit uh, through direct contact. And we should wash our hands repeatedly as soon as we come in contact with any contaminated surfaces. Then using face mask will definitely reduce the droplet as well as airborne spread of COVID-19 virus. And then one should get self quarantined if they are turned out to be positive, either by a chest X-ray or by RT-PCR test. And then we should always keep a distance of one to two meters between two individuals so as to prevent the transmission of infection through aerosols. And we should also avoid crowded places so as to prevent the transmission through inhalation of droplet nuclei. And to conclude my talk, I would say that uh, this infectious disease definitely a threat for the following reasons. This is because new types of diseases are constantly evolving and imperiling the public health. So as we can see, COVID-19 itself, which is a new disease that is that was diagnosed in uh, March 2020 in India. So it has really hampered the public health. The second reason would be like outbreaks are caused by bioterrorism are a potential threat. So this is also possible because of these bacterial or the viral agents. 
And the third reason is some infectious disease agents mutate into forms that resist conventional antibiotic treatment. And this is also very clearly seen with the present COVID-19 pandemic, where COVID-19 has been attributed to have around 20,000 uh, mutations, of which only few are known to be uh, of uh, causing high morbidity and mortality. So because of these three reasons, definitely infectious disease remain a threat uh, to the public health. So I would like to end my talk with this uh, humorous note. Thank you for your attention. So the session is uh, open for discussion. Is there any question from the participants? Any question from the participants? Madam, uh, how we can uh, stop the in route of um, ringworm in our body and what health hygiene we, we should follow? Yes. These uh, ringworm infections are mainly caused by uh, fungi. And fungal infections are usually seen in areas where there is a moist environment. So we should uh, usually uh, keep our uh, areas dry. Usually after washing our hands or washing our feet, we have to keep it dry. So this is the most important precipitating. And I think we have seen like it is more commonly seen among those who are in contact with water for a longer time. So it is mainly we have to keep the area dry. Definitely stop the infection to getting the infection. There is one uh, question in the chat box. It is uh, saying yeah. COVID-19 virus mutates in frequent intervals. So is there any yes. use with our present vaccine? Yes. Yeah, we, as I already said that there are uh, different uh, mutation, mutations which has been studied now in COVID-19. And presently CDC as well as WHO has vaccines which are available across the globe are definitely active against these variants like Covishield, Covaxin, as well as Sputnik. So all three are definitely active against this COVID-19 virus and everybody can take. I think they have started the campaign for uh, age between 18 to 44 years now. So please don't hesitate. So do take these vaccines. Any more questions? So can we wind up? Is there any participant? Okay. So now, uh, thank you, madam, for your for accepting our invitation and for becoming part of it. Thank you so much. Thank you once again, the organizing committee. Thank you. So our participants will wind up for the afternoon break now. Afternoon session, you have to come log in at 1.50 p.m. See you all.
is consuming more data this log out and join by 150 okay to close the directory sessions are going to start
Dr. Virendra Hegedeji visited America. I went abroad to United States about 15 to 20 years back. Then I thought these people need uh, really support from naturopathy for uh, maintaining good health and also the immunity in them. So I thought of establishing a naturopathy hospital and a college. Here he spectated an event that would change the near future of naturopathy and yoga in India. He saw many Americans practice yoga and was spread diseases such as obesity, hypertension and diabetes. This left a deep-seated impression in his mind and gave him a thought-provoking idea of a strong nature cure setup in India. This idea was enhanced when Hegreji visited his relative at Zindal Nature Cure Hospital, Bangalore. And hence, his dreams soon manifested into a small, two-bedded OPD setup at the Temple City, Dharmasthala, on the 4th of June, 1986, under the guidance of Dr. Rudrapa, founder, CMO. Even though the setup was small, the footfall was immense, and so the number of beds in the hospital was increased to 15. The growing popularity of the system made the visionary realize the need for staunch physicians and decided to open a college of naturopathy and yoga which brought out doctors who mastered the skill of examining a human body like an allopath and treating with a cord to nature. And so the first college of naturopathy and yoga was started on the 24th of August, 1980. The founder principal Dr. B.T. Chidananda Murthy at Siddhavana. For the first eight years, the college was affiliated to the Mangalore University and later to Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, Bangalore. The only way to cure diseases completely is to return to nature. And so, a new hospital was set up amidst the silent, natural and peaceful surroundings on the banks of River Netravati in a place called Shantivana the forest of peace. As the system was growing in popularity, there was a need to expand the size of the college and hence a unique blue beauty was set up at Ujjiri. Indian system of living is Sukhi and Samriddhi Jivana. We want to live happily and long life. For that, naturopathy is one of the best systems. has no medicine but has a different living style which will give you healthy and uh, very no happy or no life. Shantivana started with a 75-bedded general ward. However, news about it spread like wildfire, not through advertisements, but only through the word of mouth. So in this, we treat the different kind of kinds of cases, mainly of chronic and the acute diseases. Chronic diseases being the diabetes, asthma, arthritis, back pain, skin diseases like psoriasis, cardiovascular diseases like hypertension and migraine headache and respiratory disorders and all types of joint disorders and many chronic diseases we gave the good answer. To keep up with the patient in hospital grew to include a special ward, deluxe ward, cottages, special cottages and deluxe cottages. In the year 2007, an OPD was set up in the college campus. Today, it treats around 40 to 50 patients a day. Good afternoon all. We'll be, we'll be starting the session within five minutes.
Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, can, I, can I just check, try once that uh, whether sharing happens correctly? Yeah, sure, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you just uh, move the uh, sharing rights? Hello, sir. Hello. Yeah. Yes, sir. Can you share your screen, sir, with your presentation? Yeah. yeah. I think I just. It's it's there. Yeah. yeah it's visible, sir. Oh, fine. Done. Okay. Yeah. Sir, two more minutes. It. Yeah. Yeah. Two more stop it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I just. I mean, I try to share. It should not happen. That it doesn't happen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sir. We'll be back. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll start our session. To introduce our next session and the speaker, we have Dr. Geeta, Dean Division of Nutrition and Physical Therapeutics with us. Over to you, ma'am. Good afternoon, respected. Good afternoon, everyone, respected principal, dignitaries, chief coordinator, members of faculty, PG and UG students, and all who gathered to this session. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Dr. Chandrasekhara, yes, to this session, who is going to talk for us about infectious disease and immunity. Professor Dr. Chandrasekhara Yes is from Arikalagodo, Karnataka. Presently, he is the medical director and consultant rheumatologist, Chandra Rheumatology and Immunology Center and Research. His academic qualifications are 
He has completed his MBBS in 1988 from Karnataka Medical College, Karnataka University. He has completed his MD in General Medicine from Mysore Medical College in 1992, DNB General Medicine National Board of Examination, New Delhi, and DM in General Medicine in 1996 at Sanjay Gandhi PG Institute of Medical Sciences, Lucknow. In his profession, he has progressed in multiple dimensions as an excellent clinician, eminent teacher, outstanding researcher, and also a technical guide. He has served in various institutions. Initially, he has worked at MS Ramaya Medical College for about nine years as professor and HOD. To extend his service, he joined Chandra Rheumatology and Immunology Center and Research Bangalore. He served there as a now uh, medical director and consultant rheumatologist. He has crowned a lot of awards for his uh, meticulous service. Few among them are Malagaredi Oration Award in 2000. Oration Award 2013, Sir C. V. Raman State Award for Young Scientists in Medical Sciences in 2015, IMA Pune Annual NIU Oration Award in 2019. He has been associated with many organizations as Vice President, Indian Rheumatology Association in 2019. President, Indian Rheumatology Association, Karnataka Chapter, General Secretary, Society of Inflammation Research from 2016, Executive Editor, Chandra Journals, Faculty and Program Coordinators, Post Graduation, Post MD Fellowship in Immunology and Rheumatology at CRICR, Board of Member as and advisor for drafting committee on immunotherapy guidelines icmr and also he is an advisory board member for growth Med pharmaceuticals india advisory board member johnson and johnson limited india and also he is an advisory consultant for clinician he is a key person in training and fellowship in immunology and rheumatology program crica he has organized many scientific CME programs. He has dynamically involved in guiding and sharing his knowledge to the medical graduates as well as to his patients. As a result, we can see his publications in various forms. He has published more than 100 articles in uh, quality-based quality national and international journals. He has presented more than 140 conferences with his research experiences. He is also uh, involved in newsletter and bulletins. He has published more than 15 books in rheumatology and also especially for patient guiding and as general book, he has published nine books. He has uh, three chapters in reference, various three reference books. Uh, submitted technical reports, and also he has various number of general and uh, general articles, published a lot of articles. So we are really fortunate to have you, sir. Dr. Chandrasekhar, yes, is a doctor with extraordinary proficiency. So we are honored to have you, sir, on behalf of SDM management faculty and all our PG and UG students, I welcome you to this session, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thanks for some kind words. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's a part of work that is going on. I mean, I don't think I deserve all the appreciation that's been put. I mean, uh, let me start my talk with sharing yes, my sir. slides. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I think slides are visible. Yes, sir. Visible, sir. Okay, I mean, I think in the, in the next in the next 40 to 45 minutes, I will uh, take a look. 
how immune system how immune system responds to especially with reference to the infectious disease i think basically i will be answering few of the critical questions which have arisen out of after looking through the news after we were personal experience in the family our experience we, we, what you could see even when covid got infected with few of your friends or few of your family members you would have noticed that each individual handles the virus infection differently some may just have no symptoms they do very well nothing nothing happens on the extreme end somebody almost reaches the near death or we also certainly lose them so so there is a very wide spectrum of response that you see for a single viral infection of a same strain so now there are several questions that we tell that probably one person was immunocompetent compared to the another individuals and adding to this confusion now we say that the death occurring in covid infection is more because of the overwhelming uncontrolled uh, storm what we otherwise call cytokine storm what it means to us if immune system over responds for the infective organisms what it happens is the death of the host so so should i call it as a strong immune response or should i call it as a immune competent response and where really the things go wrong while fighting an infections and also i think though it's not my uh, part of the speak i just will put touch on role of antimicrobials vaccines and supportive therapies when a host or when an individual fights infection just i think all of you might have heard from morning these are the terms that we often use we use a term pathogen it's an agent which causes disease and infective agents which comes which either to animal or humans we call them as pathogens immune system is the system which is designated in every animals including humans which is capable of identifying a foreign bodies and responds to them in a with an intention to protect the host and all of us have a system what is called as innate immune responses which acts immediately and we have a response called adaptive immune response which has developed after the vertebral species prior to that we don't have much of adaptive immune response we have predominantly innate immune response an adaptive immune response which is designed to remember the pathogen or the th or the things which has attacked them what we call as adaptive immune response so the invaders i think all of us know there are mainly four variants one is virus bacteria protozoa helminthes helminthes are multicellular organism protozoal or nucleated uh, cellular organism unicellular bacteria are non nucleated more or less close to a little more advanced than viruses viruses are particulate matter what shook the world is the viruses i think bacteria protozoa and helminthes somehow we have captured or we have got adequate way and methods to treat them even they are also threatening to supersede whatever the intervention that we are planning but what shook the entire world was a protein dna particulate matter what we call as viruses so what makes these organisms different and why do we have so much of problem in fighting with these pathogens why some why majority do away with it they come out of it without with having a little scratch or having little problems but while few of them succumb to the infection caused by any of these organisms so now to understand that i go step by step i'll try to introduce you to the broad spectrum of immune system and then i narrow down into how exactly we where exactly and how exactly an alteration in the immune response matters in developing a good good immunological response to an extreme end of worse immunological response as i said we have two broad spectrum one is a innate immune response and another is an adaptive immune response innate is universal it is there from a unicellular organism to a multicellular very highly evolved humans 
whereas adaptive immune systems are seen above the vertebrates only. So main component of the innate immune responses are the simple barrier defense like skin, mucous membrane, the secretions which are there on mucous membrane like saliva, tears, the uh, oily secretion on the skin, which traps the microorganisms and tries to remove them or clean them as soon as and as and when they occurs. They also have some proteins and protein secretions which are there, which also could kill these microorganisms. Then we have some of the cellular components, what we call as internal defense or cellular defenses, which are like phagocytic cells, natural killer cells. We have a lot of antimicrobial proteins like complements, uh, the uh, lot of enzymes and several of products which are secreted by both phagocytic cells and the white cells. And there are several inflammatory response, a response which comes with along whenever there is entry of these pathogens this innate immune inflammatory response is something what is called as innate immune response. And then comes the next step, what we call as adaptive immune response. This is unique to the higher animals. And here they identify a specific component or a specific areas within the pathogen. And it is unique in a sense that identification is unique to a given microorganism. What I mean is, if adaptive immune response to coronavirus or a COVID-19 of a specific strain, say Delta strain, it may not even cross react and respond to alpha strain, though they are by definition come under the same family. Whereas in an innate immune response, they have a broad range of recognitions. In a sense, they recognize gram-negative organism, gram-positive organism, uh, virus as a separate uh, a microorganism, they separate fung identify fungus as a separate organisms, but they don't go for a subclassification, even the subunits. Whereas adaptive immune response is more or less like a best well-defined barcodes. It can identify and figure out even a minor variations or a minute variations within the pathogen. So that being, it is a highly evolved adaptive response, which in which can very specifically identify and figure out the uh, organisms. So that's where we have two broad adaptive immune response. One is a humoral response, which is made with mediated by antibodies, and other is a cell-mediated response, which is mainly cell killing, otherwise cytotoxic cells, or varieties of other cells which are responsible in cell-mediated immune response. So we have innate, we have adaptive. Innate is a quick, immediate response, non-specific in its identification, but do identify, but it is non-specific. Adaptive is a very specific response, keeps the memory intact. The memory may remain for a couple of months to several years. So that being the case, what are the major cellular components we have with reference to non-specific immunological response? In, with reference to that, we have uh, most of these are derived from the bone marrow, we have neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocyte and macrophages, whereas B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes, which are a component of adaptive immune response, they also are derived from both bone marrow as well as thymus, but thymus finally gets its uh, primordial cells from the bone marrow, which migrates into thymus. In the thymus, they mature and subsequently get released into the uh, circulation. So we have most of the cell LR components are obtained and released from the bone marrow, the site of the origin is from the bone marrow, and subsequently they bifurcate into varieties of cells with different defined functions. So when any immune response occurs, a recognition or identification is essential. Otherwise, usually the immune system do not respond. As I said, Innate immune response. Initially, if you look back earlier, we used to say that innate immune response is non-specific. The response is guided by whatever it exists. We learned more and more about this innate immune response. We slowly realized that innate immune response also have some element of recognitions, what we call as pattern recognition molecules, wherein they are able to identify some of the specific proteins or the pattern which are present in the microorganisms which are represented by tall like receptors. We have NDP receptors and there are many other receptors which are expressed in these cells, 
uh, these identifies different proteins. Some of them are within the cells, some are outside on the cell surface. Based on where the microorganism they encounter, there are varieties of number. We have TLR from 1 to 13. Some of them are cellular. They identify viruses, which are intracellular, extracellular, identify the bacteria and other pathogens based on their products. Depending on their products, they trigger different pathways. See, it has been often said that the bacteria or external lying uh, organisms trigger TH2 or more of antibodies, whereas intracellular organisms, they trigger more of cell-mediated immunity. We say virus is interferon gamma-driven and more of cell-mediated immune response. This direction is created by these gate pathways. So they figure it out. This is a viral particle. The way it has to be responded is guided by the innate immune response to an adaptive immune response. So thus, innate immune response work as a very good guide at the gate. So it is going to identify, figure out in which direction the immune response should move or should drive. It has been shown in COVID and some of the people who are susceptible to have a cytokine storm or an abnormal immunological response for them to have a minor defect in their innate immune response. Instead of properly identifying and giving a good line of immune response, if they trigger a predominantly driven, TNF driven or predominantly the IL-6 driven responses, a sort of a blasting responses if they get, the usually the individual may go for cytokine response or a cytokine storm. So here, the gate, if it doesn't identify properly, doesn't get triggered properly, the response may get into a different pathway. Moving into a different pathway may result in a storm or may result in abnormal response. So that what it means is the first initial step of innate immune response is as equally important as of an adaptive immune response, what we talk of T cells and B cells. So how, how exactly the innate immune response produces inflammation? See, as soon as a, say, a splinter in, or any other pathogen in, enters, so it is identified by varieties of signal molecules, predominantly macrophages and mast cells. They secrete a lot of signaling molecules, including their cell receptors. This in turn initiate the migration of neutrophils and lymphocytes, which are otherwise in circulation. First to attract our neutrophils, they move out of the circulating blood and start entering into the tissues. Once it enters the tissue, they try to pick up as much of uh, bacteria and viruses are possible. They try to clear and digest it. If this happens within very minimum, very less amount of infections, usually the system may not have much of major problems. It may be a very minimal inflammation, slight small swelling for a short period. Gradually, the wound gets healed. The entire process from starting of the defense to cleaning up the, the mess which has happened to the healing process, usually the neutrophil and innate responses dates in the very beginning. If it is a very minor insult, the entire process. So in a possible inflammation, is the main occurs, it may spill over, then we call it as systemic inflammation, where the inflammation spread throughout the body. So this is where the individual starts developing fever as a systemic inflammatory response, which is triggered by pyrogens. Pyrogens are nothing but the cytokines, which are secreted by both neutrophil and macrophages, as well as from the other toxins which are produced by the bacteria. They trigger IL-6 and TNF-alpha which in turn moves into the temperature regulatory center in the brain, which activates and ups the temperature. Why the temperature should be increased when there is a systemic inflammation? I mean, this is one of the questions which always uh, answers. Why does body rises the temperature when the temperature, when it rises above a point is harmful? Why body should rise the temperature? I mean, to understand this, when we started working and when they started realizing that the temperature set point where the immune system works optimally is 2 degrees above the normal base temperature. 
the immune system works at its best at 39 to 40 degrees centigrade, whereas the rest of the systems are best managed at 37 to 38 degrees. Look at the beauty in which the nature has evolved the system. You don't want immune systems to be constantly active or functioning at an optimum level. We want the system to be triggered or activated only when there is an infection or only when there is a problem. So to achieve this, it has a two different layers. One work at optimum at a normal body temperature. The immune system activates its best when there is two degree up. When it is two degree up, the normal tissues reduces its functionalities, reduces it the necessities of the energies and et cetera, and moves most of its energy towards the inflammation or towards the immune responses. That's where the fever is a necessity. Body raises the temperature with an intention to increase the activation of immune system. With the increase in activation of immune system, the defense become better. So rise in temperature says that there is a systemic spillover of the immune response. It is trying to crowd around the entire immune system for it to function effectively. When the same response goes haywire and when the cytokine increases, when the response of the inflammatory is beyond a certain point where it starts damaging the organs, etc. That's where a life-threatening conditions, that's where we call as systemic inflammatory response syndrome or septic shock, wherein the entire inflammation has gone out of control. That's what we call a cytokine storm. That's where we lose quite a good or a significant proportion of patients with reference to either viral infection, bacterial infections, or any other infections. Quite often, the death occurs in the patients more than because of the bacterial invasion, because of the way the immune system over responds or hyper responds to the given scenarios or given situations. So now coming to the uh, adaptive immune response, we have two types of lymph uh, white cells, that is lymphocytes or white blood cells. The lymphocytes that matures in thymus are what we call as T cells, and the one which matures in bones, uh, bone marrow are called B cells. And the antigens, I think I explained you, are the substance that can elicit a response either in B or T cells. So exposure to pathogens is activates B or T cells through their receptors, what we call as B cell receptors and T cell receptors. So this small portion on the antigen, the protein, which the antigen receptor identify is what we call as epitope. So these are the terms just to be uh, understand the further. So we have two receptors which identify a set of proteins which are present on the pathogen or what we call as antigens. We have B cell receptors and T cell receptors. B cell receptors nothing but resembles immunoglobulins. It's a Y-shaped molecule with two identical heavy and light chains. The constant region of the chain doesn't have much changes. It, it just changed between G, A, M, and uh, E, and the one on the variable region have a different pattern. On that pattern, it identifies the antigen. Similarly, T cell also have a T cell receptors, which is made out of a beta chain with an alpha chain, and there is a variable region which has changes in which a configuration of which will be able to identify the antigens. So, engagement of B cells or a T cells with the specific antigen when presented with an antigen presenting cell, then only the response occurs. You remember adaptive immune response doesn't get triggered with an exception of few antigens unless it is presented by another cell, what we call as antigen presenting cells, which also should be presented along with a major histocompatibility complex, MHC, HLA, B, uh, what we call as HLA, uh, human glycocytic antigen in humans and MHC in rats and other animals. And when it is presented along with that, then only the B cell and T cells are able to recognize their antigen. So they can't recognize a free-lying antigen or a free-lying protein. So how do they differ? The B cells, the binding of B cells to antigen receptor to an antigen is an early step in B cell activations. These give rise to secrete to a soluble form of proteins, what are called as immunoglobulins. The secreted antibody, I said, they are similar to B cells. Only thing is that they are not stuck to 
the cell molecules. Whereas T cells are active only when they are associated with the T cells. These are antigen fragments that are bound to cell surface protein called MH molecule. It needs both the communication. When both communication occurs, that's the only time when the T cell gets triggered or activated. Yep. Hello. Yeah, see the, the, the major difference, as I was saying, the innate immune response has a limited pattern recognition. It multiplies and remains and maintains a proportion get activated and alters the number based on demands and there is something what is called as trained memory and it is not antigen specific memory. What we meant is if someone has a BCG vaccination, the cells are partially activated. If someone is excited or anxious, continuously anxious and stressed, most of the cells are in a hyperactive state and there are some changes or alteration which occurs within the cell surface and cell molecule configurations. They all remain as a trained immunity which can alter or change the way the things and cells can respond. That is what we call as trained memory. In a sense, the immune system is in a well active state to respond or when it is quiet, it would be quietened and the hyper activation, low activations and hyper responsiveness, low responsiveness may be altered by training memory, but only what it means is it is only a sort of attention or an activation that occurs at given point of time. When it comes to adaptive immune response, there is this is usually caused by lymphocytes and diverse receptors. Self tolerance and lack of reactivity against its own molecule is what is innate, innately seen in this. And B and T cells proliferates only after activation. They have an immunological memory which is antigen specific, which is protein specific or even species specific. So that's how adaptive and innate immune responses differ each other. So having now understood, when does immune response fails to protect the host? So what is the main functions of immune response? Now we know clearly it has to defend against microbes. It has to defend against the cancer cells. Let's let me take as a broad headings. There are a lot of other immune functions, but looking at the two major issues that we face, one are the infections, another is cancer cell within the human tissues. So now, when does it happen? One, if there is an immunodeficiency, if the body doesn't fight against the microbes, body doesn't surveillance about the cells which goes wrong or a cancer cells, then there is a possibility of the host getting engulfed by the microbes or the microorganisms, which in turn can result in the worsening of the infection or him getting susceptible to infection, infection killing him because of fast spreading of the infective organisms. The next comes the other problem is what is called as hypersensitivity reaction where immune response beyond the point where it has to respond. That's what I called as systemic spillage or systemic SIRS where is dysregulated inflammatory response when it occurs. That's a point where again immune response fails. Immune response fails even if it underacts, it fails to protect the host, rather in protect, in, instead of protection, it may kill the host, what is otherwise called as heightened response or hypersensitivity reactions. So just to make you understand how nicely, how fine it tries to control. See, we to control the immune response, we have something what is called as T regulatory cells. Suppose say the T regulatory cells are very high or they are increased in numbers, okay? Or they start, if I block the natural regulatory effector cells like TIN, TGF, beta, this in turn increases the pathogen expansion because when the T regulatory cells are functioning in more number, that is going to allow or increase the pathogen expansion because it is downplaying the immune response. If immune response is not adequate, the pathogen expands and when the pathogen expands, there is a lot of microbes induced pathology or injuries. The same on the other end of the spectrum, if the T regulatory cells are adequately functioning and not suppressing the immune system, 
and the immune system works overactive or hyperactive beyond any doubt it eliminates the virus or the bacteria but it itself can cause a collateral damage what we call as immunopathology see for example if the natural regulatory cell functions are too high and it doesn't allow the immune functions to function adequately that's what we call as immunodeficiency status in this particular status there is increased expansion of pathogens as a result of increased expansion of pathogen there is a microbes induced pathology on the other end of the spectrum if t regulatory cells functions are less as a consequence of which there could be increased or heightened inflammatory response but inflammatory response beyond any doubt can kill the pathogens but it itself can cause a collateral damage or collateral injuries that's so that's where the precise bombing where there is adequate immune response if it comes pathogens are eliminated and there will be no immune pathological process so what i hear meant is neither i want immune system to overact neither i want immune system to underact so immune system should act a balanced manner what we call as optimum immune response so there is we don't want either immune system to be strong i don't want either immune system to be weak it should be appropriate and proper we call it as homeostatic or a perfect balanced immune response is something what we expect if there is a perfect balanced immune response what really happens is the immune system can nicely fight the virus or bacteria which comes the the one which i showed in the very beginning eliminate the viruses or bacteria even without host knowing about the infection that's what happens in asymptomatic covid infection in that patients patient gets the infection infection settles down if you close if you pull the swab and show the swab shows there is a microorganism host is not aware that the individual is not aware that those there are microorganism because the immune system has effectively walled it off fights the bacteria or viruses which is stuck there clean the viruses without even raising a systemic signal of in immune inflammation so that is the inflammation is so precise so clean it swaps silently without even host getting disturbed on the contrast if the response is high you get throat irritation throat infection throat congestion and a little bit of fever so that's how a final response to any infection thus depends on type of organism virulence factors for example you might have heard the previous alpha strain was less pathogenic than compared to the newer version called delta strain or indian strain whatever we call it the delta strain is highly infectious it can develop into a pathogenic even at the less number of uh, virus loads so that is what we call as virulence factor of the organism organism is highly effective multiplies amplifies invades the host cell much quickly and faster that decides what is going to be the response in addition to that immune status of the host as well as other factors his lifestyle his other factors which i will discuss in detail also is going to i figure out what is the best final response so a response to an infection thus depends on the organism the factors of the invader and the host the factor of the person uh, sorry or the individual who gets infected so a perfect balance when it occurs no major issues occur either it tilts to this or tilts to the other side as i showed either the pathogen can cause more injuries or the immune response itself can cause more injuries so what are the host factors so i am now not going into the virulence factor because that's the not the area where i was uh, um, issue, uh, intended to discuss now let's discuss on the host factor which influences the immune response i mean this is something which is very interesting which is more important for us age gender and genetics of the individuals these are we always call it as non modifiable factor i can't change i can't change gender nor the genetic with which he is been born with so you have seen with the enough publication in literature men have a severe disease of covid compared to women because of the hormones and the way immune responses occurs some of the people with a different genetic factors some families you might have seen two three four members of the family having a severe disease 
and maybe partially because of the genetics. As the aging population, their immune senescence, the immune system goes for aging processes, and as a consequence of which they have a bad immunological responses. So the age, gender, and genetics influences the way immune response occurs. The other thing is environment pollutions. How does environment pollution act? Some of the environment pollutions can keep the immune response at an heightened or an altered immune response. There could be a X number or a more number of neutrophils, altered or impaired immune response of lymphocyte. It can variously influence the way different cells get infected or affected by these uh, environmental pollutions. As a result of which, the immune response could vary in certain of the specific individuals. Vaccination can also alter the way immune response occurs. Suppose if you get vaccinated, what exactly happens is both the innate immune responses as well as the adoptive immune responses get sensitized, learns about the virus and the viral particle, keep them in the memory. Once they are in the memory, as soon as they come in, they respond much quicker and much faster than what it would have been otherwise expected. If it is exposed for the first time, normally the system has to get adopted, get used to that, identify the virulence, identify varieties of factor, how it has to respond. If we vaccinate, usually you can train the immune system, you can train the immune response. So it's like you train your guards. If you train the guards, you know who are the likely enemies. Based on that, one can really handle them very well. So for example, just to say, see for example, the police forces are not being trained to handle the terrorists, whereas the black commandos are being trained to handle the terrorists and other highly aggressive uh, criminals. So how does it differ? For example, you take black commandos to handle a civilian uh, or a simple civilian negligence, which doesn't need a black kind of commandos kind of response, you may land up in more trouble. They, they may harm or even injure the person who is otherwise not necessarily to be handcuffed. Whereas the police would be better handling them. The, on the contrast, if it is a terrorist, police may be killed rather than a terrorist may be held on. So the training, the way you manage or manipulate the system is going to matter. This is achieved by vaccination and also by the previous infections, including the chronic infections. There are some infections like cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex, Epstein-Barr virus. There are around more than 10 to 15 virus. Once they enter in, they doesn't leave you. They stay with you till the end of the life. And these viruses do alter and keep irritating or keep altering the function of the immune cells. These alteration also in the way it influences the output. There are studies with reference to COVID infections, which is the recent news, which very clearly shows that a previous CMV exposure or a previous EBV exposure, they are likely to have a little bad or a little higher uh, COVID reactions or COVID responses. The people who are not exposed to them are likely to have a better, uh, milder immune responses. In addition to that, a good lifestyle, good practice of yoga, keeping mind calm, having no much of habits like smoking, etc., good physical activity and exercise. Our studies down 10, 15 years. How immune system optimum state. Neither under So these changes are going to alter how an immune system respond to given situation. So that's how there are varieties of both modifiable and non-modifiable factors. These first set cannot be modified. This is a, uh, what we can say, uh, administrative issues, pollution control and others. And these are something which they can handle at the individual's level, the lifestyle modification, vaccinations, preventing infections and other hygienic practices can certainly help and alter how a host respond to an infection. And that's how these modification can help in having a better immune responses. So there are a lot of things which is going on. As I have put it, I have tried to make it as simple as possible. I mean, 
still though I have presented as simple as possible, it looks still complex. It is still worse than what I have presented. Immune system is made out of so many cells, made out of so many proteins, so many regulatory processes are there, and so nicely evolved to manage the uh, environment challenges. And there are several of immune and inflammatory mediated. So we have a sort of what we it's call, uh, call it as when there is an infection, inf it activates innate response, moves to adaptive response. At its expansion, it first expands when there is a extraordinary pathogens and others. Slowly it goes for contraction, remembers for some time, and then slowly get inactivated. At each point, there is a threshold. Based on this threshold, the response may hyper-exaggerate. Hyper-exaggeration can cause troubles and lead into the immunopathology. And under-response also can cause immunopathology where the microorganisms can have it. So the, if there is a response which is in green track, you are at its best. Any red track expansions are going to be invariably pathogenic. So you need a well, perfectly balanced immune responses. So that being the case, there are some confusing terms. Immune boosters. I mean, I think it makes clear for you, if I boost the immune response to respond high or respond too much, you may end up in problem. So immune boosters is not a term which is commonly used by us. We don't have any methods, any mechanisms in which you can change or boost the immune response. You can optimize an immune response. We say immune regulation, or you can optimize an immune response not to overshoot, not to undershoots. And we use a lot of drugs, what we call as immunosuppressants, which brings down the immune response in autoimmune disease, in some of the hyperinflammatory syndromes. You might have seen with reference to COVID infections, varieties of interventions which are like immunosuppressants like JAK inhibitors, we have anti-IL-6, a good amount of steroids which are used basically to cut short this red line. This red line, if it is cut short and brought in into the within the perplex of the threshold, probably we should be able to get things in right place. So, so we, we need to keep this within the green line. That's where sometimes immunosuppressants are used. Vaccines are something which are likely to modify and train the immune response to respond. Desensitization is the process wherein if it is hyper responding, like in allergy, etc., one can try in desensitizing the immune system not to erratically respond to a given antigens and proteins. I think with this uh, brief note, I thank all the uh, audience as well as I thank the organizers for inviting me uh, as a uh, part of this uh, uh, big, big session on International Yoga uh, Day. Uh, thank you very much for patience here. Now we'll have an interactive session with the participants. Any questions? Any questions from the participants? Good afternoon, sir. I'm fourth year BNOS. My question is, uh, when a person is already affected with corona, already the antibodies will be produced. Uh, produced. So why he has to be vaccinated again? Yeah, that's a good, good question. I, I think I, I told you very clearly that we have now multiple strains which are coming. And the what exactly happens is in the natural infection, what has been observed is uh, there are proteins which are other than the spike proteins and the different proteins are often identified in the natural infections. So that being the case, the protection that he may get out of the natural infection may not be as superior as getting an antibody against the spike proteins. That's a one observation because of which we are asking or insisting to take a vaccine after three months. Why after three months? The three months give, time given is the naturally acquired infections. We usually have a two to three months of persistence of antibodies that could be adequately protecting since there is an adequate protection for two to three months. Even those may not be really required. So that's how earlier we said we should give it immediately, but the studies clearly showed that there is some element of persistence of antibody for two to three months. That's that's why the reason they said that it's best to take it for two to three months. Uh, the reason why we want to vaccinate is, is as I said, 
to prime the immune system in the perfect direction. So the problem is some of the viruses in the process of nature to survive. We, the nature has been gifted every microorganisms, including us, with one basic intent is to survive in the fight to survive. That's that's the evolution principle on which all of us work. And the viruses have learned the trick or technique of evading the immune system. They just try to doesn't get identified or recognized by the immune system. That's how they work. So to how they are evading is they are seeing to that the, when they, they naturally get infected, the antibody against some of the proteins which are very specific for the infections, they don't develop antibodies. So to circumvent that, there we are insisting that it's best to take a vaccine so that you get a better protection against the subsequent changes which occurs. Uh, sir, we have one more question for the uh, for you. That is there any relation between renin angiotensin mechanism in immune modulation or suppression? Yeah, uh, so, uh, actually, there is a definite role played by the entire immune uh, metabolic system as well as the entire hormone system with reference to immune responses. Uh, when there is a distress, as I said, the entire body tries to respond with a basic intention to protect the host. So this particular renin angiotensin mechanism is a, has plays a crucial role with reference to COVID infection, may not be there in every other infection. With reference to COVID infection, since some of the receptors they use are more related or more close to these renin angiotensin receptors, it plays a crucial role with reference to this viral infections. I mean, it may not have the same amount of role with reference to other infections. Sir, uh, thank you, sir. One more question that can foods taken for immune boosting cause problem of making immune system overactive? I think in the last slide, I made the point clear. We, we somehow don't uh, uh, agree with an immune boosting for a very simple reason. I mean, to make everyone to understand, I think most of us know about glucose. I will, I, so that it makes life easy for us to understand. Whatever the amount of glucose you take, under no circumstance, I want glucose to go above 180 or 160. Okay, so that's what I meant is, we need a metabolic cutoff point. Similarly, when we talk of immune boosting or immune, we, we never use that term basically because Immune system works to one set point. Beyond that point, we don't want it to work. Less than that, we don't want it to work. So the concept immune boosting doesn't, we, do, we don't utilize or we don't use those terms with reference to uh, immunology system. But there are some food substances can alter or change the inflammatory status of response. For example, high fat diet can trigger an inflammatory response. You use some of the uh, alkaloids. They can either suppress or can alter the inflammatory responses. See the inflammatory preparedness of the immune system, which we should not use a term called immune boosting because it's not immune boosting. You have kept the inflammation in a little higher point than what it is otherwise we would like it to be. When the inflammation is little higher, it could work on either way. Suppose if inflammation is higher, when the virus or a pathogen lands up in that particular site, there is already existing inflammation. White cells are sitting, WBCs are sitting, macrophage are sitting. They, they are non-specific, as I said. Anything which comes in its way, it gulps it in and clears it off. So if there is already an inflammation on the surface, it can kill it. But at the same time, we should remember, if there is a chronic inflammation, body tends to wants it to be reduced because inflammation causes a lot of injuries to the respective host and those areas. Persisting chronic inflammation can cause breach in the epithelium or breach in the endothelium depending on the organ. That itself could be a possible reason for infection to increase. So it's a double-edged weapon. So that, that being the case, we always should keep the inflammation at an optimum point. And as I said, immune boosting is not something which we really accept that terminology. The immune system should work in its optimum point. I neither wanted it low, nor I wanted it high. 
So that's why I mean, the, I'm not really sure how this concept of immune boosting is acceptable. I mean, I mean we, we really don't uh, agree with the term itself. I think I made my point very clear in my last. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. No other questions? Thank you, sir, on behalf of every participants uh, here today for taking your time and speaking with us. It was very insightful and inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>
the whole family come together to practice yoga in the mornings with physical exercise, in the whole day with the mental stability and mental approach. I wish that uh, the yoga will inspire us for the centuries to come, but uh, we are only by passing uh, in this period. But today, most important is to face the viruses that we have. Viruses is not only the what is coronavirus, but also so many other Ill, uh, Ill viruses that is approaching the human mind and body and making us weak. So let us come together, let us unite and let us see that Yoga Day is celebrated with a practical approach and each one of us will have long life, good health and also good happy living. May Manjunatha Swami bless you all. In the year of 1986 Continuing with this program, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Soji Apar Avinash, Principal of the School of Yoga and Naturopathic Medicine, Swami Vegananda Yoga and Sandana, Samstana, Bengaluru. Dr. Soji Apar was university top scorer of 2004 BNYS batch with highest scores in 10 individual subjects in RGHS examinations, recipient of three gold medals, and Dr. T. Virendra Hegde, Patavisha. Patavshega Award for Academic Excellence. He completed his PhD from SVSA and is in enriched with clinical and research experience. He is recognized guide for PhD at SVSA, Ames Rishikesh, supervising six PhD scholars. He has taken training in KWA clinic total, that is Neurology and Geriatric Care Specialty Integrative Medicine Center in Germany. He is member of Scientific Advisory Committee and Internal Ethics Committee, Jindal Nechakia Hospital, Bangalore, and has many publications in his credit. Today, he will be discussing on a topic, Immunity According to Yoga Philosophy. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, Mata. Thank you so much for that generous introduction. I hope I am audible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm just going to share my slides. Just give you one second. Are these slides visible? Not yet. Huh, yes. Now we can see. All right. Well, um, I uh, am very, very happy uh, that, you know, uh, my alma mater, uh, SDM Ujire, has called me back for uh, giving a talk on something that I'm passionate about. My pranams to uh, Manjanatha Swami of Dharmasthala, Dr. Virendra Hegdeji, and uh, the principal Shivanna sir, as well as Sujata Madam, Geeta Madam, all my teachers. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come back and talk uh, at Ujre, uh, at, at different uh, perspective. But somehow during my entire teaching career, uh, I get classes first hour in the afternoon which is uh, pretty heavy uh, because people finish their food and it is difficult to concentrate during that time. And funnily, I'm supposed to talk about philosophy today, which makes it all the more difficult. So let me try doing uh, my best to communicate um, what I would like to in context of the present day scenario. Um, Coronavirus has brought in uh, the, the concept of immunity, uh, the importance of immunity across 
uh, the the world, everybody started talking of doing X thing, Y thing, Z thing for improving immunity. And I was just listening to uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar just before my talk was over. I mean, uh, was about to begin, and he mentioned that you are not talking of immune immune boosting anywhere. You are rather talking of optimal immune response, and that is. That is exactly uh, what my theme of talk is also going to be about. Uh, but it's a difficult task given to me to connect, uh, you know, yoga philosophy with uh, the the entire understanding of uh, the science of immunity. Let me try uh, my best to communicate what I can. So I'm sure you are uh, listening to this for uh, quite some time by now. Uh, what is immunity? It is basically the ability of the body to resist pathogens. And these are disease causing agents like bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, also toxins. And uh, whether it is naturopathy, whether it is yoga, whether it is Ayurveda, all the Indian or the Eastern systems of medicine talks about toxins. And our philosophy says that the bacteria, the viruses, etc., are secondary. If uh, I may just remind, the first year uh, unity of disease and cure, we have learned about opacity, and that will also come as as I go along uh, in my presentation. The opacity essentially talks about the ability of the bacteria and viruses to invade human being only if there is a congenial environment within. And that environment in itself is pathological. Okay. And that is the basis with which, with, with which we will have to probably start. Okay. Um, but looking at immunity, uh, I, I understand that, you know, uh, from what I have learned and my teachers at Ujire have taught me is that you don't really have uh, separate anatomy, separate physiology, separate pathology. You, you don't really have separate blood physiology to uh, separate respiratory physiology to separate cardiovascular physiology. We learn them separately to understand them in simple terms, but basically they are so uh, intertwined, they are so much together they are so integrated and all these systems, all the physiological systems essentially are part of one large uh, mechanism, one large group of mechanisms within the body that is homeostasis to maintain the internal environment with respect to any internal or external change. If there is a change of temperature, we, we have our, you know, sweating happening. If there is a Cold, we shiver. Similarly, any invading organism is a threat, and you you create a response to ensure that you know you 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 maintain the internal uh, environment the way it is. Okay, I was also listening to uh, my uh, mentor, Dr. Manjunath, this morning, and he was mentioning about abhinivesha in context of immunity, right? Uh, essentially, homeostasis is very similar to abhinivesha. You don't really want your internal environment to change too much, not deviate too much from what it is. Okay, and a lot of immune mechanisms are to ensure that this internal state is maintained the way it should. Okay. Now, the fun part is that ever since uh, COVID came in picture last year, somewhere about February, we have started getting immune boosting things. Okay, it, it started with immune boosting herbs. Uh, we had emphasis on turmeric, we had emphasis on uh, the uh, homegrown herbs and spices, etc. But then uh, it has now translated into a very crazy uh, kind of uh, marketing that people are doing. There is a haldi ice cream available. There is a chaman prash ice cream available. There is an immunity boosting bread available. So the question is, can we really, uh, you know, use these ice creams or breads or whatever uh, these funny things are 
will by eating these things my immune system become strong probably not and that that is what i i would like to talk uh, as we go along so as we understand in i think first year uh, in the blood chapter we have learned about immune system second year microbiology we have learned about immune system again the basic fundamental understanding about immune system is that it is the army it's the defense system of the body now when we are talking of say indian army do you really think that today i i somehow i i am blessed with the siddhi by doing uh, you know yoga and i become the prime minister or president of india and i said tomorrow from you know the 3 5 crore uh, defense personnel that are there in india i want to make it 10 crore and i have to have it in one day is that possible perhaps not right by eating immune boosting stuffs if we are expecting our immune system to be boosted just like that it is exactly thinking of you know uh, having uh, rafal jets uh, the day i sign the contract next day they should be in india that's not possible okay it requires a lot of effort to be in defense system be it for the country be it inside the body okay if if we recollect the immunity we know that there is a lot of training that goes on within the bone marrow there is something called as you know um, you you look at various aspects and you look at whether there is self antigenicity that is produced they are phagocyte uh, you know uh, autolyzed and all those processes take care to ensure that your wbcs your immune cells your immunoglobulins are perfect in identifying what is really a threat and what is not right now the the factors that can affect these immune responses is the training and the training could be through the exposure of antigens the active exposure to antigens would be the infections the passive one we uh, will be through again passive is not through vaccines uh, vaccines is also an active uh, exposure but then it's not the real uh, infective agent but what is important is that we need training today why why uh, you know with covid everybody in the world is suffering why is it widespread because our bodies were never exposed to corona virus you know and because it is new the bodies are confused you have cytokine storms to you know the, the responses to covid uh, virus is varying so we need to understand that training is an essential part we are talking of herd immunity you know 50 60 70 percent of the population um, getting infected and through that the cases would come down and that is again because you are exposed to antigens you know how to deal with it it's exactly how you know police training or military training happens none of the people who are recruited in army are sent on border on day 1 they are trained in you know the physical capacity is there everything is built up they know how to run the guns they have specified tasks each of our wbcs have very specific tasks and that training is an essential part which will not happen overnight and that is one major problem with immune boosting okay the second thing is you can have an army okay big army but imagine there is no uh, guns uh, with the army there are no planes with the army will the army survive just because there is a huge number of people involved that is again not going to work and that's where the ammunition is important the food that you consume immunoglobulins are very very vital in your immune response the cytokines are very very vital in your immune response and each one of them depend on the amount of proteins that you take the amount of uh, chemicals that you take so if you are not taking right kind of food again your immune system is going to fail the third very important thing 
is recuperation. It's not just enough to learn to fight. You need to know how to rest. Okay, and that is where again uh, the the approach that we have in yoga and naturopathy is very very important. Whether it is rest, relaxation, stress management, sleep, all of that. So even if you are taking immune boosting stuffs and you are not sleeping well, it's not going to work. So it is very very vital for all of us to understand that. Immunity or immune response is not dependent on a single entity. There are multiple entities which come together to form a proper immune response, right? And we need to take care of all of them if we want to improve our immune system. Okay. Now, uh, from a very uh, targeted approach of plasma therapy, you know putting antibodies or giving specific uh, vaccines. Now, this is a very holistic, very integrated way of looking at immunity. We are trying to look at, you know, different factors, lifestyle factors. We're talking of mental stress. We're talking of sleep. We're talking of food. We're talking of exercise, along with the ability to fight infections. So all these things have to be put together if we want to have a good immune response. Now. Again, uh, a lot of times uh, this has been repeated, uh, even in the morning, uh, Dr. Manjunath was talking about it, that any kind of an imbalance, there is, has to be a fine balance between your uh, response of you know, immunity and controlling it, okay? If uh, the, the immune response is heightened, then there is a problem of autoimmune diseases. If the uh, response is diminished, we have cancer. Okay, with COVID, the problem is not just the infection, it is the hyperimmune response that we're talking about, the cytokine storm that we're talking about. So all of that basically contributes to an exaggerated immune response. So you, you don't really require um, a immune booster in already exaggerated immune response. You rather require an optimized immune response. Okay. So please understand that whether it is immunity or homeostasis or whatever happens in the body, everything has to be in balance. Okay. Your, your heart rate has to be between the range of 60 and 90. Anything more than that, tachycardia, there is a problem. Anything less than that, bradycardia, there is a problem. Your temperature has to be at a critical range of between 37 and 39 uh, degrees centigrade. Anything more than that, there is a problem. Anything less than that, there is a problem. Everything in the body is absolutely well-regulated, well-balanced. Okay, And that is where the philosophy of yoga, naturopathy, Ayurveda, acupuncture, everything talks of balance. The health depends on having balance. By definition, yoga is defined as samatva, a state of equanimity, a state of balance. You cannot be too exaggerated. You cannot be too diminished. You have to have a very uh, moderate state of your being. In naturopathy, we talk of the five great elements, and if there is an imbalance, any any of the elements going excess or diminished, it is going to create a problem. We talk of yin and yang, and it is again in a fine balance. There is a part of yin in yang and yang in yin. So there, there has to be this a beautiful balance when it comes to each of these philosophies. Uh, by the definition of swasthya in Ayurveda, it is defined as samadhatu, samadosha, samagnishcha. So everything has to be balanced, only then you are healthy. In that sense, how can we have a immune response that is just boosted up uh, without a provocation? That is not going to be healthy. And therefore, the approach of yoga, naturopathy, Ayurveda is going to be to have an optimal immune response. Uh, please, whenever we are talking about yoga, naturopathy, to common people, also uh, within ourselves, 
let us not start talking of yoga boosts immunity let us start talking about yoga optimizes immunity it brings a state of balance okay now what are the causes for imbalance in each one of them in terms of yoga again uh, connecting it with philosophy we have viparyaya which is mistaking something mistaken identity okay your own body cells are identified as foreign there is a immune response mounted on it avidya not knowing what is right and what is wrong okay okay so anitya shuchi dukhanatmasu nitya shuchi hi sukha khyate hai avidya so that is the definition of avidya so even when your immune system is confused whether uh, to really fight a cancer which it doesn't fight or not to fight a self uh, antigen in any autoimmune disease where it is fighting the confusion the avidya of the immune system is the basic problem and that comes from a beautiful shloka that i am going to quote later on from bhagavad gita um, in naturopathy um, i i was fortunate to teach pnc for at least 4 5 years and it had been my favorite subject for for a very long period of time and my approach to pnc was to understand how unity of disease can be connected with pathology and a lot of times when we talk of the primary cause of disease a lot of times people think of lowered vitality abnormal composition of blood and lymph and accumulation of morbid matter but the primary cause is not the uh, all these these are secondary causes of a health problem the primary cause according to henry lindler is violation of nature's laws nature has created us in a particular way to live and when we disobey that then we get in problem and that can be because we are ignorant about what those rules of nature are or we are indifferent about them we know but we don't care okay we indulge into activities how many smokers do not really know that smoking is bad for their health everybody knows that but they they indulge and then lack of self control so if you are looking at upas tree unfortunately again due to graphics the roots are taken off from the picture here the roots are these four ignorance indifference indulgence and lack of self control the soil is essentially violation of nature's laws and that soil is very very vital when it comes to not just immunity but any health problem and please understand when i'm talking of immunity i'm not just talking in context of covid today we have started realizing the importance of immunity because of covid but i understand that inflammation is the base for any health problem that i talk about acute inflammation is good it is required for me to survive chronic inflammation is bad and it is what creates a lot of problems all the chronic metabolic uh, disorders that we talk about be it obesity be it uh, hypertension diabetes to cancer inflammation is at the base which means immunity is at the base of all these problems and all of them are because we are somehow violating nature's laws essentially we all are duryodhanas i am sure uh, you know the character of duryodhana from mahabharata uh, he was the eldest of kauravas the 100 uh, sons uh, of uh, dhritarashtra and he was a very strong fellow he he there was nobody who could play the gada yuddha like him in the world but why did he got defeated because he was on the side of adharma he did not follow what is to be done okay and there is a very famous quote from mahabharata describing duryodhana he says i know what is right for me but i don't uh, do what is right i i know what is dharma but i don't do it i know what i am doing is wrong but i can't stop myself from doing it i understand that you know when draupadi was pulled in the darbar of kauravas and you know her clothes were torn off it was wrong was known by everybody but 
he could not control. Okay. Essentially, all of us have Duryodhanas in us. Okay. What I mean by that is, uh, I think, yeah, I, I, I have this picture. Uh, you are uh, going to a market, again, imaginary situation because of lockdown. But there are two shops. There is a, a fast food junction. And next to it, there is a junction of, you know, juices and fruits. I mean, our second, third standard, we have learned that uh, fruit, eating fruits, fresh vegetables, etc., is good for our health. And eating junk, something that is open, um, unhygienic, is bad for our health. But we choose 90% uh, of the times, or I would say 99% of the times, all of us are going to choose what is wrong for us. So essentially, we are all becoming Duryodhanas. In uh, yoga, a lot of times when, when I sit for consultation and I, I talk to patients, they ask me a simple question, sir, I've got XYZ problem. What yoga should I do? I say karma yoga. You know, karma yoga says that all of us have a choice of acting. Okay. We cannot stop action. That's the basic philosophy of karma. But the way you act in a particular situation can definitely define you who you are. In Bhagavad Gita, there is a shloka which says there are three choices that an individual has with respect to an activity. That is kartum, akartum, anyatha kartum. When you are when there is a task thrown at you, you can do it the way everybody else does it. You choose not to do it at all. Or you do it in a different way. People who do things differently become great. And if you really want your health to be extraordinary, if you want yourself to be known as an extraordinary person, we will have to become somebody who does things anyatha kartum and not just kartum or akartum. What I mean by that is going to yoga should not be mandated, but I need to do it for my own self. I, I remember as, as a yoga leader, I had a lot of problem uh, when I was in Ujjire because my friends were not coming to yoga, right? But do I not know that going to that yoga session in the morning is good for me and good for my health? It is known, but I don't do it. Okay, so all of us are Duryodhanas in some way or other, and that is what we need to change. Otherwise, we all will be decimated like Duryodhana and Kaurava in Mahabharata. What this pandemic is teaching us is better adapt a healthy lifestyle, better be close to nature, better stay in principle with the nature. And that will protect you. Otherwise, the kind of havoc that this pandemic is taking all over. Today, there is COVID-19. There was, there was SARS in 2010. There will be some other pandemic some other time. We cannot fight viruses, but we can ensure that I remain optimally healthy. Okay? To get rid of any kind of an, a problem that comes in. There is a beautiful uh, story from Chandogya Upanishad uh, that I would like to narrate uh, when I connect um, the whole uh, idea of imbalance and balance and uh, the health and disease. The, uh, one of the Upanishad basically means that Guru and Shishyas are staying together and there is a very detailed, elaborate conversation. And this fortunately was not the virtual uh, talk where I cannot see uh, any of my audience and know their reaction. Guru and Shisha used to have a very intricate relationship. And Gurus never, never did spoon feeding for their Shishas. They wanted them to experiment and learn. So one fine day, uh, one of the students asked his Guru, uh, Sir, where from the everything has originated? Okay, pardon me if you have known this particular story, but uh, for the want of others who probably may not know this story, I'm just repeating. 
and the guru said uh, i'm i will tell you from where uh, everything is originated but before that there is there is a banyan tree in front of you just go pluck one of the fruits and come so the student went plucked the banyan tree fruit came back so the teacher said okay open that fruit he opened the fruit you can see on on the picture on the left the fruits of banyan have very tiny small little seeds so now the teacher said you know open one of those seeds and the student opened the seed it was hollow it is empty and then he said you see from that hollow seed which has nothing the entire banyan tree has emerged so from nothing everything can originate but there has to be a suitable environment provided what is that suitable environment the seed has to fall on a fertile land there has to be enough water there has to be good amount of sunlight it has to be in good amount of um, you know air so all the elements that are required for nourishing the the plant has to be there without that imagine the the uh, seed falls on a concrete it is not going to grow so similarly this is the same story of our immunity right if our immune system is strong none of the viruses which are coming from outside are going to create a problem we can't stop the virus from coming in but we can definitely stop them from creating a problem inside so create an environment in you which is not congenial to growth of the viruses if you create an environment within you which is congenial for the growth of virus you're going to end up with problems okay so that is what we are talking about we also talk of what is called a psycho neuroimmunology and we know and i'm not going to go in details of uh, the the panchakosha model where we we have everything percolating from the manomaya kosha to annamaya kosha you have known it enough i am going to talk about what is the mechanism and this uh, particular chart that i have taken comes from a published study of one of my colleagues dr vijaya kaguri who is a phd from svyasa so what we know is whenever there is an imbalance in the mind it leads to an imbalance at the level of prana okay you cannot quantify prana you cannot quantify immunity all that you have is indirect means of measuring immunity you you have interleukins you've got d dimer you've got uh, the the cbc all of that are indirect means of assessing immunity but that does not mean that you you have a direct way of approaching or understanding what uh, the the immune system is all about and that draws a parallel to you know uh, the the prana where we talk of imbalance of prana we talk of how excessive prana creates a problem deficient prana creates a problem and there has to be optimization again if we are looking at the pancha pranas there is samana samana is to balance and that is exactly in the center of your body your abdomen okay so there has to be a balance of prana for us to be optimally healthy but the moment uh, that there is an imbalance in the prana the same gets reflected in your immune system as well okay so a balanced prana i'm sorry the the picture doesn't really show what i intended to say um just give me one second yeah so the balanced prana can be correlated to an optimal immunity all right whereas the excessive prana uh, sorry the excessive prana whenever there is an excessive prana there is a hyperimmune response and lowered level of prana are leading to an lowered immune response so where we should reach is a state of balanced prana okay where all all five 
panchapranas are optimally balanced how do you get there we will talk about that in last few slides the second model of why problems are created i i spoke of one problem using the chandogya upanishad model of nothing everything coming out of nothing the gita model again manjunath sir was mentioning about it dhyato vishayan pumsah sangaste shop jayate from being attracted to an entity how everything leads to one after another cascading events i'm sure uh, when when we talk of cascades you would remember uh, bk sir teaching you the cycles of biochemistry or probably you know the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway of uh, your coagulation similarly there is a absolutely clear cut cascading pathway of how you getting attached to something can lead to absolute destruction and this is very very important when it comes to stress management it is very very important when it comes to understanding that mind has to be worked upon if we are trying to control the immune response it is not just enough to have immune boosters or good food but you need to have your mind very very pure again going back to chandogya upanishad there are shlokas which tell us that the coarsest part of the food is removed out of the body as feces the subtler part becomes the nourishment to the different systems the subtlest part of food becomes your mind that is the kind of relationship that we have with food and mind and therefore we need to choose our food wisely we need to choose our exercise regime wisely and so on and so forth our problem today is that we are never in present we are either dwelling in the past or in future all the time but yoga if if you ask me to define yoga in very simple terms i would say it is to live in present okay and that living in present is nothing but being mindful this beautiful picture uh, i i just love this picture for uh, the very reason that it depicts uh, understanding what living in present is there is a man and his child gone to a place there are mountains and there is a sun rising even at that place there are meetings and you know the cars and buildings and graphs and everything going on in this man's head whereas the child is able to enjoy because they are non reactive it is not cascading so mindfulness being in present is going to be a very very important aspect of developing a good um, not just immune system but healthy environment within the body can we correlate the other concept of yoga triguna with immune system we have three gunas i'm sure you are you are aware of them sattva rajas and tamas tamas is referred to somebody who is drowsy who is tired who is sleepy etc rajas are the ones who are very active etc sattva are the ones who are balanced so again we are, what we are talking about is lower immune response is bad hyper immune response is bad a balanced immune response where it is required immune system has to act but it should not be acting unnecessarily and that is what uh, you know the satvik satvik mode of uh, being there is going to be important so we need to connect these philosophical concepts that we have with everyday lives otherwise you know a lot of times uh, we learn yoga for yoga therapy okay and we get limited to asana and pranayama prescription unfortunately we don't understand that there is a whole huge background with which uh, yoga therapy is all based upon and that should not be forgotten if you're looking at you know again uh, one of the references from uh hatha yoga pradipika i'm sure uh, people who are second year and above uh, know this particular shloka meda shleshma adhika purvam shata karmani prachakshate samacharyeta anyastu na chetarani doshanam samabhavatah meaning people who have an imbalance in the doshas 
should be practicing shat karma when there is a balance of the doshas this is what yoga philosophy is teaching us that when there is a balance of doshas you should not be overdoing the uh, shat kriyas and for that matter any yoga practices so please understand that doing yoga has to be also in moderation it cannot really be in terms of whether one hour of yoga is good enough for me to improve my immunity that's not how it works i was just listening to honorable hegde ji uh, in his message he said you know the physical practices of yoga is one part of it but the mental practices of yoga has to be carried throughout the day and that is very very important if we want to remain healthy if we want to be maintaining optimal health so the big question is what yoga should i do for optimizing my immunity one clear uh, statement that i am making is yoga is not immune boosting it is to optimize immunity okay but what yoga should i do right and the answer lies again in another beautiful verse i think i i uh, love this particular shloka from bhagavad gita which says yukta ahara viharasya yukta cheshtasya karmasu yukta swapna avabodhasya yogo bhavati dukkhah what it means is it is not just enough to do asana or pranayama but the entire lifestyle has to be moderate your ahara food vihara the activities cheshta the work karma okay swapna avabodhasya the sleep and wake pattern has to be balanced only then yoga can help you to come over the miseries today our problem is we think i do one hour of yoga there is uh, you know uh, why am i not healthy physically doing asanas pranayama will definitely help you but nothing would help you more than having the yogic attitude and that attitude is very very important when it comes to practicing yoga for being healthy to optimize immunity again the the message here is to have moderation moderation or optimization of immunity is what the entire theme of presentation today was and therefore i i always suggest my students that yoga should not be just limited to yoga therapy it is not what asanas and pranayamas are indicated and contraindicated but it has to be yogic lifestyle in every act every single day it has to be bhakti yoga approach it has to be karma yoga approach it has to be gnana yoga approach it has to be moderation there has to be a balance in every activity that we do we now know that if we sleep for 6 to 7 hours we will be healthy if we sleep less there is a problem if we sleep more there is a problem when we eat we have to eat optimally if we eat more there is you know over nourishment problems are there and if we don't eat uh, properly we starve so there has to be a balance so every activity that we undertake every single day has to be in moderation the second thing is there has to be a component of relaxation in everything that we do if we are stressed out we are not in the state of yoga we have to be mindful meaning we have to be in present we have to be aware of every activity that we take when we do that in everything that we are undertaking there will not be any problems whatsoever with that i think i would like to thank uh my alma mater um, prashant sir shivanna sir and the entire team uh for calling me to talk about yoga philosophy in context of immunity i am not very sure how well i have connected these two aspects but i have tried my best to connect the concepts from both sides i hope you like the presentation um if there are any questions we can take them now thank you so much webinar is open for interaction with participants any questions we have it in the chat box
I'll just read the question here. Yes, we sir. have a question yes. in the chat box. So one of my friends asked that can the virus just develop inside the body? I came to thinking, sir, is it possible due to the environment inside the body giving opportunity for the virus inside to mutate and become a new one causing dangerous disease? Well, yes. Well, yes. Uh, the, the understanding is very simple that if uh, I have an environment for you know, the mutations to happen within the body, then mutations will happen. Um, just yesterday, I was reading about a report of a HIV positive patient uh, who had the coronavirus infection for over six months and the virus mutated for about 30 times within her body. Okay, so if there is an environment for the virus to mutate, then it will. If my body is knowing how to optimally neutralize the threat, then there will not be a problem to uh, it. And that is why I said it is what we create within us that is going to be important. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, and uh, we deeply appreciate the wonderful presentation. Your many years of uh, research in depth, understanding of the subject was very evident in the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting. The divine dwelling of Lord Sri Manjunada Swami, where all the sacred duties are meticulously taken care by our beloved President, Pooja Dr. D. Virendra Hegdeji. Educational institutions of Dharmasthala are managed by the SDM Educational Society, Ujre, which runs the world's first naturopathy and yoga medical degree college in the country. The achievements of Nature Cure and Yoga Institutes founded by Dharmasthala, namely SDM College of Naturopathy and Yogic Sciences, Ujre, SDM Yoga and Nature Cure Hospital Shantivana in Dharmasthala, and Saukyavana near Manipal, SDM Yoga and Moral Education Project, Dharmasthala, are hard for any institute to achieve within their Silver Jubilee year. It was all possible for us due to the constant monitoring and guidance by our management, hard-working staffs and the extensive support by our state and central governments and their concerned bodies. With due thanks to them all, let us see in brief about the contribution of Dharmasthala to the field of nature cure and yoga. abroad to United States about 15 to 20 years back then I thought these people need uh, really support from naturopathy for uh, maintaining good health and also the immunity in them so I thought of establishing a naturopathy hospital and a college in Karnataka as a result a small outpatient clinic was started in Dharmasthala 
in 1986 june 4th within few months it had to be promoted to a hospital status and moved to an another building which could offer diet treatments and staying facility for two with the help of minimal staffs and one chief doctor it slowly progressed to 20 bed hospital and now on the banks of river netravati it is a fully equipped 300 bed hospital called shantivana and an additional 200 bed satellite hospital called saukyavana in parkala near manipal both the hospitals are occupied throughout the year the reason being the awareness created among the public about the natural methods of healing facilities available affordability and the attitude of courteous staffs of our institutions so in this we treat the different kind of kinds of cases mainly of chronic and the acute diseases chronic diseases being the diabetes asthma arthritis back pain skin diseases like psoriasis cardiovascular diseases like hypertension and migraine headache and respiratory disorders and all types of joint disorders and many chronic diseases we give the good answer so usually when patient comes to the hospital like any other hospital we do the clinical analysis by taking the history of the patient and with the required investigation laboratory diagnosis and sometimes we use the scan as well as the uh, x-ray also for the investigation because we follow two kinds of diagnostic methods one is our own naturopathy diagnostic methods that's called irish diagnosis and the facial diagnosis along with that we take the help of modern uh, medical diagnostic systems also so with the help of the clinical history clinical examination with the laboratory diagnosis and with the special investigations we come to the critical analysis of the patients and we come to the diagnosis so depending on the diagnosis or depending on the disease we will be introducing different kinds of therapies and uh, the minimum duration of the treatment is 10 days because this is being a drugless system and it is sort of a education and a prevention so they should undergo they should learn yoga all these things so that's why is the minimum duration is 10 days and up to 21 days we treat the patients and sometimes if the chronic patients when it is required we'll keep them for a one month also so that's why the treatment is a totally in patients and some of the cases like small problems like small acute problems we use the outpatient centers also just 2 years after starting the opd in dharmasthala hegde ji foresaw the need for nature cure and yoga doctors to heal this planet and so he inaugurated the country's first bachelor of naturopathy and yogic sciences degree college at siddhavana gurukula ujre it was affiliated to mangalore university for a short duration there were 15 students in the first batch of bnys who were in a very new curriculum never heard before from 15 students it has now got an intake capacity of 120 undergraduate students per year and 20 postgraduate students with a fully equipped college infrastructure and experienced staffs it is a five and a half years undergraduate program and three years of postgraduate program in either yoga md or naturopathy md and at present this college is affiliated with rajiv gandhi university of health sciences bangalore i had to convince the university that uh, this is a system which has all potential to be a five and a half years degree course they accepted it and now we have a five and a half years degree course in bachelor of naturopathy and yogic sciences i am also happy that uh, now we have also the post graduation education system and the uh, next system next uh, our uh, step will be for more research oriented study in the naturopathy subject the main teaching hospitals include our own 500 bedded shantivana and saukyavana and during internship postings are exclusively arranged in sdm general hospital ujre sdm ayurveda hospitals in udupi and hasan sdm mobile hospital jindal nature cure institute 
Bangalore, SUSA Yoga University, Bangalore, and SDM College of Medical Sciences and Hospital, Darwad, for the postgraduate students. Namaskar. I wish the Silver Jubilee Nature Cure Conference a grand success. Well, uh, I recall the 25 years back how the Naturopathy College took its birth. The great visionary, my brother, beloved Virendra Higdeji, took the challenge of uh, having a Naturopathy College. This was a great challenge. We didn't know in which direction we have to go. You see, it was a new uh, subject to the people, to the public, and to the students, and particularly to their parents. I have to give full credit to my uncle, S. Prabhakar, the then secretary of the HTM Education Society, who took it as a challenge and he made possible to have the Naturopathy College. Every hurdle, every step, because there was no lecturers, there was no professors, there were no students, but the first batch, I think we have about 15 students, and we started in a very small area. Now the principal of your college, Dr. Prashant Shetty, was the first year student of the college. They also, it was a new to the field, but they sincerely underwent all the problems, but they gave full support, they and their parents, uh, they gave full support to the system. That is where they have sacrificed so many uh, things in their life. Three, four years, they, all the students underwent some problems. Then we also got confidence and then we developed a beautiful campus to the students. Then we never thought that it will have 40, more than 30 students. But because of the stu old students, I have to now remember this, passed out old students. They were our ambassadors who could get the students across the country and across the world. They became our licensing people, they became our ambassadors, and they started, they said that there is naturopathy. And another thing I have to congratulate the boys or doctors who have passed out. You people made the naturopathy to grow to be this height because of your sincere practice of naturopathy. Generally, in other doctors, other uh, things, they deviate the uh, system. But our naturopathy students, they never deviated from the, the system. That is why it became very popular. So I have to congratulate the, all the doctors who have come here, who have passed out from our college and other colleges. But if, without you, this shouldn't have been a big uh, campus and big college. So now we have got PG and lot of hurdles we have undergone, uh, our S. Prabhakar has undergone, lot of pressure Puji Hegideji have taken over and the entire family of our uh, thing, they have taken all the strain, all the tension and the passed out principals, they have all taken the strain. Now, I have to congratulate the Prashant and his staff, his group, the PGs, the students, who are, are wonderful uh, people who have made this uh, Naturopathy College to be known in the world, world. So I congratulate and I thank you for giving this opportunity to wish you people. Best of luck, be happy. Mainly the
Okay, we'll start with the next session. Now we have with us Dr. Sopna K, who has completed VNYS and MD in Clinical Yoga 2017 from SDM College of Naturopathy and Yogi Sciences. She is a recipient of RGHS gold medal during 17th convocation for securing highest marks in VNYS and Sitaram Jindal Foundation gold medal for securing highest marks in MD. After completion of her course, Dr. Sapna K has worked as visiting consultant in Maharashtra and currently working in XCG Center Hospital, Bangalore. Her research topics are yoga on breast cancer patients, COVID patients, and on mucomycosis patients. Today, she is discussing on a topic, role of yoga therapy for immunity. Over to you, Dr. Sapna. Dr. Sapna, are you able to hear us?
सपने आगे थे हेलो सपना डॉक्टर सपना
सपना इज इट ऑडिबल सपना
हेलो स्टार्ट प्रेजेंटिंग सपना यस यू आर ऑडिबल
a peaceful world turned into um, a complete uh, standstill. So with this, there was when, when everybody was fighting, you know, there was job loss, there was economic uh, crisis, economic crisis, health crisis, all of this was happening. But there was another industry which was actually making profit out of it. So that's where the health and the wellness industry comes into picture. And you can see um, there was rise in dermatic powder. All of this was to boost your immunity. The basic agenda was immunity boosters, and there was a massive boom of immunity booster industry. You can see this particular survey which said 90% of Indian households bought immune boosting categories. It can be anything. Not have given an example of tummy touch, which I'm sure most of you would have had during this pandemic. Not just uh, seven percent. I think various other immunity boosters which uh, have been taking me. So uh, just on a lighter note, there has been uh, herbal sari as well to say the boost immunity. So um, which is um, I don't know to, uh, to how far it is true, but you can see this change in the scenario. The entire world is now behind immunity. Okay, so that's where the uh, immunity boosting industry came into picture. And you can see it comes in various forms, some supplements, beverages, everything. As I said earlier, there were sari that came that they can do immunity. Now we have reached a stage wherein even if there is a simple water bottle, adding a prefix as immunity booster has become a plasma. You can just take anything and everything and just prefix it with immunity booster. So that important has immunity turned out to be to a common man. All right, so now why I'm focusing on all of this, why am I saying well, about the immunity booster market is because yoga is one such um, ancient medicine which we are very lucky now to have learned. Uh, we have been practicing every day. Now, yoga is one very effective tool to naturally improve immunity. You may not uh, take anything external, you may not spend a lot of money. All you need is the will to do, and you can be, uh, you can actually improve your immunity naturally. Now, I'm going to uh, throw some light on the research evidences on what uh, immunity and uh, on what yoga can do on our immunity. If you see the research over here, this is the PubMed uh, website which says. From 1994 to 2021, you can see that there has been a steady rise. But there is this particular year of disruption, that is the 2020, which shows that there has been a massive study. There has been a lot of study on yoga and immunity. 26 is the number, but as of 2021, it has been the same as of March. So it will definitely increase in the coming year, coming months. I'm sure it will cross 26 uh, by the end of the year. You can see that everybody is looking for something which can improve their immunity and improve to the scientific world and people in general. That this particular thing will improve their immunity. Now, now I want to take you through certain uh, papers which will actually um, make you think twice. You know that yoga, which we have taken so much for granted, can actually do so much internally. But we, we are we are simply neglecting it. Now this particular study was done um, to assess the uh, first industry biomarkers in our saliva. So what uh, the study did is that they did 20 minutes of glucose breathing. Now this 20 minutes of glucose breathing is in the ratio of two to eight to four. That is two times inhalation and eight pounds is healthy minutes. That is glucose and four times Four counts was their exhalation. So this was the breathing in those two eight into four counts. You inhale for two counts, hold your breath for eight counts, and exhale for four counts. And we found that the levels of interleukin one beta, IL8, and hemophilic protein one is significantly reduced. Now these are uh, the interleukin and MCP1, these are uh, pro inflammatory factors. They, they support inflammation to happen in the body. Now, more the pro inflammatory cytokines in our blood, more is the oxidative stress. So, it has to be supplemented with the anti inflammatory. Otherwise, this itself leads to a lot of disease, and one such uh, disease which is caused is oxidative stress is cancer. Now, the other common question that, or other evident question that 
you will get is that how can this can you do create a support being able to create this reduce the poor information by market group level. They give a, a hypothesis saying when you do this particular thing, you reduce a mild form of hypercapnia state. So this will reduce inflammation through the modulation of nutrients mediated intuition signaling. So that's how you are, you are actually reducing the condition. And so in general, all of these is you can be ready. Now you can see that as I said, they practice for 20 minutes. You can see the changes here. Zero minute, you can see the intuition one beta uh, level and I eight levels and MCP one level here. This is after zero minutes, this is at zero minutes, that is at day nine. After 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and 20 minutes. They have assessed every 5 minutes. And you can see at the end of 20 minutes, you can see AC is the attention control group, YB is the yogic breathing group. And you can see the difference in the method you can level. Alright, so the 215 levels have reduced, all of the levels have reduced after just 20 minutes of yogic breathing. Now, another study which was done on rheumatoid arthritis. Now, rheumatoid arthritis is another condition wherein the uh, autoantibodies, the antibodies, the uh, immune system works against the body. Okay, so here they followed a yogic based lifestyle. So, they followed a particular lifestyle, which we all know that some people are using yogic lifestyle, classic lifestyle, we call it. They followed this eight weeks of uh, this particular lifestyle. And we found out that there was down regulation in the inflammatory markers. Now, one particular inflammatory marker that you can see here is IL-6. I'm sure it, it sounds very familiar to most of you. IL-6 is very easily associated with COVID-19. Now, the moment uh, patients are registered uh, with COVID-19, first test they ask is to IL-6. Right? So, by this, this is a simple specific practices and following the lifestyle. They're able to reduce the IL-6 level and other pro-inflammatory cytokines. And on the other hand, you are increasing the anti-inflammatory markers, the tumor growth factor beta. Okay. Now IL-6 is one uh, which is sort of dangerous sort of interleukin. It is a potent activator of the HP axis. Okay. So, so it is always better to keep IL-6 under control if you use a cytokine, a cytokine rush or storm in your body. So it's always better to keep IL-6 levels in uh, below the normal or in normal levels. You can do this by just following simple lifestyle intervention or simple yogic techniques. Okay. You can see the same, uh, uh, this, this is the data of the earlier study. You see the IL-6 level, the pre and post level, IL-17 level, you can see like how this is ready. On the other hand, there are these other um, important markers like VDNS, which is a neurotrophin, is essential for brain health, which is responsible for the plasticity, and there is VHEA, also the potent um, hormone, and beta endorphin. All of those levels will increase the practice of yoga. Now, uh, there are several studies which say that VDNS, which we published from Minhan, says that VDNS levels are important. This is very much helpful for cognition and for learning something new. Okay, so I'm uh, also in open university, VDNS and DHEA, VDNS dot com, all of this is very important role. It is really important your immunity. Now, coming to how yoga will help in transfer. Now, transfer, of course, all of you know, the moment the patient is diagnosed with cancer, it is not that he is in an immunocompromised state. A patient is said to be immunocompromised once he starts with the cancer treatment. So, a patient who is diagnosed with cancer, there is a lot of um, um, stigma associated with it, and it, it is the word cancer itself is a sort of devastation to the uh, patient. And this induces a lot of um, mental dysregulation. And they're not, they're not, there's a lot of mental strain, not just for the patient, but also for the caregiver. So, and after that, the entire treatment protocol takes about a year, and then the repeated scans. 
body is being subjected to so much of scans, so much of radiation, so much of chemotherapy, but its immunity plays a very important role. And yoga will definitely help. I will explain it in my upcoming uh, slides. Now, I want to show this particular study. This was the first study which was done in um, cancer, which shows that there are changes in cancer related cytokine production. Now, in this particular study, we took 49 breast cancer patients with 10 prostate cancer, and they were subjected to eight weeks of mild based risk reduction, which is a medication technique. And we found that there was a reduction in the iron, iron produced from gamma level, and also there was a decrease in iron test. So, why do you ask to inflammatory? It is always better to reduce pro inflammatory cytokines in a disease condition. If I am stressing more on pro inflammatory cytokines, it is higher the level will be with pro inflammatory, more is the disease progression. So, you can naturally, by just practicing yoga, you will be able to. Uh, monitor their levels, get their levels back to normal. And on the other hand, the IL-4 levels increased. So this was the first study which was done um, in the year 2003, and this was published in Psychosomatic Medicine. It was one of the first studies which showed that there are changes in the cytokine levels as well. Next, this was done on breast cancer survivors. The survivors are the ones who have finished their entire treatment protocol from chemo radiation, from uh, chemotherapy to radiation to uh, immune therapy or hormone therapy, and then their scans have shown negative. So they are called as survivors. So they showed that uh, the inflammatory signal is also ready. One uh, very important one is nuclear factor for beating. So now this, this plays a very important role in inflammation. So it's, uh, of course this is very important, but activation of this particular uh, cytokine it leads to a lot of inflammatory disease. Okay, so it, it, so this particular paper shows that you can reduce the NS kappa beta level in the body of these patients. Next, uh, this is a review paper which is published in 2000. 17. Now, they said that stress, that is, that is when the concept of stress came up, uh, that stress can actually cause cancer. Now, this was not proven by this particular paper, but this is a review, but they suggested that out of review, it would be the same of the paper, it concluded saying that stress has extensive physiological effects. Now, it causes a lot of effects, like in the T-Roma shortening. The shorter the T-Roma length, Lesser is the lifespan, and the most prone to disease, and increased inflammatory cytokines, and it is associated all of this associated with increased cancer risk and oral cancer related outcomes because they promote education, they promote anti-inflammatory, and I created the program center with a very similar color of apostrophe. So, all of this is enhanced, and in cancer. Um, more than the treatment part. One treatment part is one thing for the patient. So what that's more important for patients is that they do not get a recurrence of that particular video. So that's one thing that they really um, worry a lot about. Because once the patient is diagnosed, they, they, uh, they undergo surgery and so that they undergo chemotherapy, they undergo radiation, and depending upon how aggressive the tumor is or the, depending upon how the because of our body is responding to the treatment, they decide whether the patient has to undergo hormone therapy or Now, after undergoing this, you know, uh, cumbersome entire treatment, and after undergoing repeated scan, you know, it, imagine if the patient is told that there is a recurrence of this cancer again. It's going to be devastating for the patient because they have to undergo the treatment regime again. Okay, so, all of this uh, is because of stress. The more relaxed the patient is, better is the treatment outcome, better is your chance of not getting the recurrence, and better is your uh, response to chemotherapy and radiation. Now, psychological stress. Now, psychosocial factors play a very important role. Now, why why is the point so this slide is because uh, now during the pandemic. Is isolated, I ask them socially. So there is high uh, 
many people have told that there is increase in depression cases, there is uh, increase in anxiety cases. So all of this it is like feeding uh, inflammatory changes in our body. So all of these inflammatory changes induces um, changes in our genes, like oncogenes. So all of these pro oncogenes get activated and they are at high risk of cancer. So as you can see here, chronic ailments like life even stress or severe life even depression, social isolation, death of a lot of all of these things, they are all considered risk factors because they all fall under the umbrella of psychological stress, psychosocial factor stress. This was a meta analysis that was done and we found that this, this, this is the uh, just to understand it. Uh, in a better way, that psychosocial stress, it stimulates HP axis, which all of us know that stress will stimulate the HP axis and there is sympathetic stimulation. After that, again, we know that the um, catecholamines are released and high levels of catecholamines. If the body does not come back to the normal, if the body does not cope up with the stress, if the body is always in that stressful state, there are high levels of chemical amines in our blood. With high levels of success are immunity. Now, the suppression of immunity itself leads to oxidative stress. Now, uncontrolled oxidative stress damages uh, the entire cells in our body. This is the cell is affected because of oxidative stress. Now, it affects DNA, it affects RNA, protein, lipids. All of these are very important for a normal cell functioning. And as I said, if this is if there is a little bit of variation in the reading or the RNA or the coding sequence, there is accumulation or activation of the gene, or there may be mutation in the normal gene. So there is predisposition for cancer. They are at high risk of it. So it's very important that we keep this level, the total body control, the capital nine levels under control. And we can definitely do it by yoga practice. We can inhibit this particular part pathway from getting activated. <clears throat> I'm sure all of you know that uh, for practice with yoga, you can do uh, activate the and you can do relax sugar. So it's very much important, especially now that uh, I work with cancer hospitals, that very simple practice. So it is very important that you start and start eating in the correct way. So 
the class of local negligence, we can be as simple as negligence, which, which we again, which we neglect a lot, but we need to try to belong to the craving. Where the law is the location, they're able to stretch better, they're able to understand the body better because of these losing exercises. That's a simple one to neck, shoulder, hip, knee, and ankle. You can see the difference. Next comes the asana, of course. Clinically, now for cancer patients, because I, um, I teach them bedside, that is, I go to your ward, go to your um, but if you are where the patient is admitted, I keep them then. Not everybody can perform asana, especially in this phase that we are in. Not everybody can do asana in an inpatient setup or not um, um, not in the open setup as well. But they can do in a rehabilitative state or a rehabilitation state. Now, I want to uh, explain a little bit on this that there are three things that you have to know. First one is uh, preventive oncology, where is Zoka will definitely help to prevent it. As I said, this particular diagram that you can see, that you can control your stress levels. So in that way, you can prevent them from, especially patients who are at high risk, who are exposed to high amount of stress. So in those patients, you can work at preventive aspects. So Zoka will definitely work there. Then comes the integrative oncology, where is to integrate with Conventional treatment. So, the chemo, radiation, so long as that as an add on, yoga will definitely work. Then comes the rehabilitation. Once the patient finishes their entire treatment, it's important for them to come back to their normal life, for which rehabilitation of these patients to normal be. So, there's a lot of stigma, there is a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety that they are, you know, their normal health of the story. How will they, you know, they all of this keeps running in your mind. It's important for them to be rehabilitated in the correct way. So, after that, if we're doing it, let's start, you know, and standing series of asana, like you can do in Kanta Kati Chakra, Kati Chakra. Now, all of this plays a very important role, and patient can comfortably perform. You can modify it according to patient's needs, but these asana will clear. Next comes breast training. National action could be initially. This, this is the first thing that has to be uh, spoken of to be how also are going to be doctors and are also um, have been exposed to patients. So whenever you meet uh, any patient or whenever anybody comes asking for you to do yoga, one simple thing you can ask them is to just Observe your breath. Now, 90% or 95% of people will say that one of your most is active and the other one is not. So, in such patients, it's very important that you train them as to how to have to breathe. Majority of patients think how breathing is the normal breathing or breathing through nose and exhaling through mouth is normal breathing, which is not. So, shallow breathing. Majority of them also do shallow breathing. So, you can train them in breathing, then you can teach them breathing exercises, simple practices along with movement and breath. And then regulate the breath by practicing pranayama. Next you can teach them is meditation. So only when you follow all of this will the patient be able to enter into meditation and actually understand them is the benefit of meditation. But now it has become uh, in such a way that directly somebody comes asking to you, walking, coming in such a way that they directly ask I want to learn meditation. Because there has been so much of um, uh, exposure to the day in here. You know, meditation has become a fan of work. It's a good thing to do that it's a good thing to do that it is not good to do. But we know that it does not happen over me. That you need to follow a particular to enter into a meditative state. That you can also counsel the patient. Now, stress is one thing, you know, this particular paper has also said that stress isn't there, you know, it affects three important systems. Okay? So never forget this that it is your nervous system, immune system, and the endocrine system. So all these three are interregulated. That means so they are all, um, what you say, they are intermingled, they are, there is no separate system. You cannot replace the endocrine system with the breast tissue. The 
you, you cannot do that. So they have specific functions. So all of these three systems have to work in unison. But stress affects all these three systems majorly. Okay? The nervous system is also affected. The immune system is affected by the cytokine level and hormone level because of stress. Ultimately, stress which is there, it sticks to something called as food. Okay. okay, am I audible? Is my voice clear? Yeah, clear, Dr. So. Okay. Now, uh, this will summarize the entire benefit of uh, what yoga does in cancer. But before that, we need to understand what is cancer uh, treatment related toxicity. Now, as I said earlier, once the patient is diagnosed with cancer, depending upon the stage of the patient, the patient could be diagnosed with stage 3 or stage 4. And depending upon the stage and depending upon the organ that is involved, that there are certain tumors uh, like you know, ovarian tumors or uterine tumors, they are very aggressive, they are very stigmatized and susceptible. They are aggressive tumors, so treatment, cancer treatment will also be aggressive for that Now, I'm either starting the surgery, where in surgical dissection of the tumor is done. After the uh, dissection of the tumor, they are subjected to chemotherapy. I'm sure all of you are familiar uh, with the word chemotherapy. It depends. The cycle is also different. They are, um, they can be three cycles, six cycles, or twelve cycles. It depends upon the um, tumor and the organ that is involved and the stage. So chemotherapy and followed by radiation. Radiation, as you know, not every patient will be um, given radiation. If the patient responds very well. If the patient responds very well to the chemotherapy, that is the chemo, the chemo drugs, then the patient might not be taken to radiation. But if the patient is not responding very well to chemotherapy, then radiation will be given, followed which, again, there can be hormonal therapy, wherein they artificially induce hormones into your body, and then there can be immunotherapy. Now, this overview, is how the cancer treatment goes on. But what we do not understand is that every stage, patient gets some sort of side effects, some sort of toxicity in his body. Now, post-surgery, of course, there is um, a lot of body image issues. They, um, they, they, they undergo a lot of uh, pain and trauma after surgery. Next time is the chemotherapy. The chemotherapy is very devastating for patients because they start norm they start uh, losing their normal function. Such so as there is continuous fatigue, they, 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 that um, sight of food or a very um be vomiting. Severe tiredness because of muscle breakdown, and then again, there is a sleep issue. The immune system is affected because of chemotherapy. Once the patient finishes the entire cycle of chemotherapy, now every single cycle is after 20 days, after we finish the chemo, then we are subjected to radiation, which is again very traumatic to the patient because um, it, um, it not only kills cancer cells, but it also destroys normal cells. So it is very traumatic. There is severe bone pain which is unbearable, and they start losing all the keratin tissues, nails, nails, skin, everything from you know, early aging setting. Then comes hormone and then the therapy. So, with every stage, the toxicity levels keep on increasing. Okay? So, this As you can see here, these are some of the common symptoms. And uh, this particular study was done at uh, HCD Hospital here. And uh, they, in general, these are some of the commonest symptoms which every chemotherapy patient undergoes. 
They experience fatigue, this is chemotherapy induced nausea, vomiting. We uh, experience constipation, head and neck symptoms are there, gentle stress, and quality of life reduces. There's myofascial pain, and then there is. So, all of these are super common symptoms which every chemotherapy patient um, complains of. So you can see the practice in which has been proven. This is the modern children care of the hospital, and patient has um, has uh, responded very well. It has also been published in Indian Journal of Palliative Care in 2017. So here you can see that doing exercises, upper extremity and lower extremity breathing exercises, that hand and shoulder stretch breathing exercises, as you said, Arthakati Chakrasana. Padahasana, Arda Sikrasana, Pikunasana, Istana Padasana, Pahmi Mukrasana, Ketu Vandasana, Sutanasana, Arda Shalabhasana. You can see there are some practices which is not supposed to be done by these patients. If you can understand this particular task, you'll be able to manage the symptoms better. Okay. You can see Shashan Kartina with Makara breathing, a yogic breathing, which is clavicular, thoracic, and abdominal breathing. Relaxation techniques are also given. No pranayama, like simple, you should be done. And Puru Anadolu, Sandra Anadolu, and Puri Pranayama. And also special techniques, this depends upon the patient's interest. Not everybody will be in a position to perform. You can see the one which has been picked correct are, one, are the practices which can be given for particular symptoms. And one which has been marked wrong should not be given in these patients because they have not shown the drug. So um, I think this particular slide will, will summarize everything. Going back to my uh, previous slide, so the cancer related toxicities are very high at every stage. So yoga, simple daily exercises, and meditation and asana will affect the procrastinating nucleus, thereby it reduces sleep. We know that. Uh, by practice of yoga, by practice of relaxation techniques, QRT, DRT, yoga, nidra, it induces sleep, it increases the melatonin levels and it increases sleep. So, thereby the circadian function. Sleep is one thing which improves our immunity a lot. So, it increases sleep and thereby you have a good sleep time. Then there is it, it, yoga which is there, it affects the HP axis, which is which causes the stress response. The function, the physical functions are also affected. We focus more on the breathing and um, the respiratory, the cardio respiratory, the cardio pulmonary functions are improved. And the muscles, you know, we, we ask the patients, we ask uh, the patients to breathe normally during every posture. We do not ask them to hold their breath. So there's continuous aerobic uh, exercise that is happening. There's something of oxygenation. There's two hours of oxygenation of the uh, body that happens. And then, in general, the immune function being decreased in pro-inflammatory cytokines and increase in anti-inflammatory function. So, in this way, overall in cancer patients, there is less sleep disruption, which improves their immunity. There is less of cancer-related fatigue. This is called as a term for this called as tachycardia. This is because of the muscle wasting that happens now. Chemotherapy. It affects, as you said, it, it destroys the normal muscle tissue. So that's why there is uh, muscle wasting and they experience severe fatigue. We call it cachexia. This is reduced because of the breathing techniques, so the simple pranic techniques, and this is the asthma. And there is decrease in cognitive impairment. As we said earlier, there are these PDMS levels increase, which is responsible for neuroplasticity and neuroplasticity, the improvement in response. There is decrease in psychological distress. After practice of yoga, you feel more positive, you are more optimistic. And instead of fibbing that, you know, why I got cancer, or, you know, um, what if I have uh, a recurrence, and all of these are, is, is like a negative loop, uh, which is destroyed or which is, it does not happen. You are always in a positive loop, you feel more positive, optimistic, there is hope. So all of this is you. And of course, there is decrease in musculoskeletal symptoms because there is aerobic substitution. That is, there is no oxygenation in the blood. There is the lactic acid gets flushed off from the muscle. There is decrease in musculoskeletal symptoms. So, uh, this summarizes the entire role of yoga as 
so how it helps in cancer and uh, but importantly in cancer but also is because of better immunity and these are some of the um, uh, pictures that i just wanted to share that uh, uh, that are that have been taught in uh, in a hospital here that we give bedside uh, individualized user session for patients with gentlemen here the uh, diagnosis of the sarcoma but later on uh, during the course of skin therapy test we uh, diagnosed the uh, cancer and then the patient here she was case of ovarian cancer. So all of these patients are actively given bedside yoga session, but majorly here clinically we give them more of relaxation and trauma. Okay. So uh, with this, uh, I think I'm securing uh, the session. If there's any doubt, uh, you can please go ahead. Okay, the webinar is open for discussion. So Dr. Sapna had uh, presented a very important topic due to the lag in uh, network. There was a delay in the beginning, but I hope all of you could connect with the topic and the concept very well. If any queries, you can put a message in the chat box. Any queries from the participants? We have some uh, network issue, I guess. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sapna, for the amazing presentation. And we'll be winding this session for the day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your uh, patient hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you. So tomorrow we will be meeting you on the same platform at 10.20 a.m. 10.20 a.m. tomorrow, the same platform. Our principal, Dr. Prashant Shetty, is online. Participants, please don't leave. Yes, sir. My respect is because it will be morning to evening, different speakers like Dr. Sapna, Dr. Apar, and all the others, including the Joint Secretary. Dr. Raghavendra, this paper spoke very well, so I'm very happy to thanks beyond behalf of the because few of our alumni and really admired by the speech by our Dr. Sapna and Dr. Appa because we have a full right on them, they belong to our college. So this is very well for morning training. I was not able to attend the webinar in between because I went to hospital. So or otherwise, everybody's opinion of the seminar and this type of webinars really will increase the knowledge of all the students. If they are attentive and committed to the 
science. Because our dream was only one, to have the proper knowledge about the disease, that's COVID, and what are the organisms which will cause the COVID, and how it can be treated. Treatment part is yoga only today. On the treatments and on the all these therapies and through the Ayush Chara recently. It's coming now also in different days, different specials speaking. So the aim because one side we have to prepare a concept paper. Concept paper is immunity and yoga and nature. So another side we have to have the good knowledge about the this is also that's the microbiological knowledge that we are doing it. So third important thing is to be practiced. This we have to put on the patient and we have to see that we are entering. So we have started in Bhattan Tarok, it's running very well. We have already treated about more than 300 patients by sending the all the first while the mobile. So this is running very well. This also is the good practice. And our vision is to spread to all over India. And within few years we want to spread it to all over the world. Through our and doctors and so this is required. It is good to our country and it should be spread to all over the world. That's our intention and our, our president, Dr. Virendra Des Motto also. Because he always says this natural place should be sold in the international market. How is it sold in the international market? This is the way to sold in the sell in the international market. So that we are doing it. And in the future, our Bangalore hospital is also coming up. So there also, our, all the alumni and all our people can work together and bring the system to the higher level. So with these few words, I congratulate our committee of webinar headed by Dr. Shabasa City and all the faculty members who have worked for the seminar, all the dean, dean and all the Students and parents who have attended. Because afternoon, some attendance was a bit less. Because morning it was more. Afternoon it has come to 280 or 250. Yeah. Persons only, students only attended this. We are closely observing this our activity. Don't worry. So I don't want to punish, announce any punishment or anything. It shows your commitment to the system. Because it's very difficult to arrange such webinars within overnight. Our hard work is there in every step. So your work is only to see, sit and see, and write down if it's required. So if you don't come for that, you are the local. We can't help it. So a day may come, you will be the speaker in very international platform. And Corona is the subject. You are the knowledge for this. Day is will come very soon now. That day you will remember what you are doing, your principal and your teachers. So that day you don't wait. Now only we attend properly. Acquire the knowledge related to that. Why I'm saying is many times it has happened to us also. Because in our time, few topics are not taught in the syllabus. Topic from discussion came to the international conferences. We will be in blue. So, such things should come to your level, your student. That's why we are doing all this. It's not that it's compulsory by the university. Don't think that it's compulsory by the management. It is our deficiencies that we have found in our life. This one, your caliber, or your cat. That's why we are taking all these good speakers from all the parts of the country and making this to happen. 
and this if you don't want to take it absorb it as your fault i don't want to say anything on but tetanus will be considered very seriously and this will be counted for the treatment of your career here that is so with the words so morning to any with this at least now i think 5:15 now now you can relax try and relax and and you go for a walk so that you be relaxing yourself because during the covid time your health is also important you should concentrate totally on health some people depression anxiety and all these things so should not happen and be healthy and eat properly relax enjoy attend the classes properly i will meet you soon okay thank you so much sir so we are winding up today tomorrow session will start by 10 to 3 am thank you thank you thank you sir thank you anything from the student side madam anything from the student side students uh, anybody talking now thank you Anybody interested in talking? Their experience about. Feedback. They can give their feedback. Right. Yes. Yes. If there is any feedback, they can. No feedback. You are happy with the topics? Hi, sir. Uh, Ranjini Rajeshwaran, about third third year this summer. My sir, sir, I felt it was a really uh, like mind opening. Words of our system, as well as the uh, our uh, situation now. So I came to know that there are many possible ways uh, through yoga as well as natural therapy that uh, we can handle the cases. That we can handle the mild cases as well as moderate cases. So that was the one thing which I got from to know from this one. It was really mind opening. Thank you for this session, sir. Really, it is really helping for us. any other question from anybody any suggestion guys us any suggestion or feedback from the participants so if there is no suggestion there are two hello if there is no suggestion or no feedback we can understand two two things one is they didn't understand anything second thing is they understood fully what 
They might have ventilated the stage. 